Chapter 1 What happened? Little Landon, Little Landon, are you okay? A panicked voice reached his ear. Chu Yi hears a soft voice and thinks. Whose voice is this? Didn't I die? Just then a sharp pain pierced through his head. Ah! Chu Yi yells out while trying to hold his head. He opens his eyes to see a stunning woman and a beautiful girl in front of him. The woman is the definition of a goddess. Although she looks extremely worn out. Her brown hair and elegant poise could make any person have a hard time breathing. Looking at the middle-aged woman more seriously it's clear that she has had a rough life. On the other hand the little girl is extremely beautiful, if she were on earth she would be classified as a beauty that can destroy a nation. From her black hair to her green eyes, everything about her screams Miss World. Observing her closely she looked to be no more than 15 years old. The woman and the girl were crying while shaking him vigorously. Chu Yi thought, am I not supposed to be a sick? Can you guys not shake me so hard? I'm afraid I'll really die from this. Chu Yi wouldn't have minded it any other day, but for now his body felt extremely weak. He couldn't take any more vigorous shakes. I'm fine, mom, Lucy. Don't cry, I feel better already. Little Landon you're all I have, if anything happened to you, I wouldn't know how to live anymore. Brother Landon please don't scare me like that, I thought you were dead dot 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 you have been resting for two days now. Just then his belly made a sound. G R H H H H H H H. The woman poked her head outside the carriage window and said, Please stop the carriage. Little Landon let me make something for you to eat. Brother Landon will help auntie so you can get your food fast. Dot dot you just sit here and rest. Okay, he replied. When Lucy and his mom left the carriage. He closed his eyes trying to digest the whole situation. He was a successful 26-year-old mechanical engineer on earth, he also knew some electrical engineering principles. He had just got a big raise at his job, and on his way back from work he had a car accident. Ah dot 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 just when I got a fat raise. Now he is in the body of Landon Barn a 15-old illegitimate prince of Arcadine. His mother Kim Mably, was a maid in the palace. When his brother, the third Prince James Barn was born, the king had too much to drink from celebrating. On his way back to his room he spotted his mother Kim and forced himself on her. Later on the king found out that she was pregnant. He told her to stop working in the castle and gave her a small room at the back of the castle because he didn't want her to bring shame to him. The king already had three wives who would always bully his mother when they saw her. Whenever his father saw him or his mother, he would look at him with disgust, and at his mum as if labelling her a gold digger, as if forgetting that he was the one who forced himself on Kim. As for Lucy, she is also the illegitimate daughter of Baron Gustav. Four months after her mother died, the Baron denounced her as his daughter. It was then that Lantern's mother took her in as a personal maid for land come. Kim always heard of how Lucy would beg for food on the streets for hours. She took pity on Lucy and wanted her close by so no one would abuse her or hurt her. She loved Lucy like a daughter. Lucy moved in at age 10 to Landon's home and has always been with him ever since. His father had six children including him, four boys and two girls. Eli Barn, the first prince age 19 from the first wife. Jeanette Barn, the first princess age 18 from the third wife. Connor Barn, although younger than Janet also age 18 was the second prince from the second wife. Carrie Barn, the second princess age 17 from the first wife. James Barn the third prince age 16 from the third wife. And then Thea's me, the illegitimate prince Landon Barn. They all bullied Landon excessively, treating him like a slave. Because of all the hate, Landon became very mature calm and introverted. A month ago when Landon turned 15, his father publicly declared that he was the owner of the fief Baymard. It was also announced that Baymard would no longer be considered part of the empire. It was public knowledge that Baymard was a barren land, where the people died from hunger and extreme cold. Although Baymard was the third largest city on the empire, 
people migrated out of the city due to hunger. Baymard is situated at the outskirts of the empire. At the front of Baymard is the empire and at the back is the endless sea. The king basically exiled him and his mother far away from his sights. Also the fact that Baymard is no longer part of the empire means, even if war breaks out there, the empire will not help the citizens. What a cunning old fool, now I am a land and barn, no longer Chu Yi. What I need is to develop the place. Chu Yi thought. Just as Landon was about to get up he heard a voice. Host selected. System analyzing. 20% complete. 35% complete. 71% complete. 100% complete. Landon was shocked. I never thought those system stories on earth were true. Chapter 2 Technological System The voice was coming from inside his head. It was a very emotionless mechanical voice. Ding. Do you wish to bind with system? Bind. Ding. Binding of technological system has been completed. Host must work hard in order to bring advanced technology and development into this world. An instant reply. Landon was stunned. He was excited inwardly. System why did you choose me? Landon blinked curiously while asking. When host was on earth, Host had an IQ of 260. Currently Host was the smartest dead person available from Earth, allowing the system to bind with Host. With the Host's high IQ level, it will be easy to access the knowledge the system will provide. The system has a minimum IQ requirement of 250. So I was the smartest dead person. Dot dot that makes sense. Dot 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 www dot dot wait. What? System. Are you sure? Answering to host, yes. There are smarter people back on earth, but they are all still alive. Due to host's fortunate death, host was the next best thing. Landon almost coughed out blood. Dot 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 fortunate for who? For you or for me? Dot. Anyway there's no need thinking about it anymore. What's done is done. System, how do I use you? System will give you a task based on the situation of your kingdom. If host is lacking the right raw materials for development, system will provide it as a reward. Once the task has been completed, host will be rewarded. Also host can buy basic equipments from system that will be helpful towards host's missions. Buy basic equipments? Yes. Host can buy these equipments with experience, technology and bonus points. Experience points are gotten when host used the knowledge from the system to better host's kingdom. Technology points are gotten when advanced technology is created. While bonus points are gotten when the host uses his own intellect to create new inventions or solve major issues. The system has unlimited levels. The higher you go. The harder it is to complete the levels. A screen popped up in front of Landon showing him his current information. Host name, Landon Barn. Age, 15. Status, Banished Prince of Arcadeen the New King of Baymard. Level, Beginner. Current Satoshian, Stupidly Weak. If the host were to stand out in the wind for a long time, the host bee will blown away poisoned with Nalat Wisp. Landon didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Was it my father? The king? Or my half-siblings? Damn. I just arrived and am already poisoned. No wonder I felt like dying when mom and Lucy shook me earlier. I almost thought those two were undercover bodybuilders. To think I was poisoned when leaving the kingdom. I was already banished. Dot 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 why couldn't they just let me be? T-C-H-H. Whoever you are, let this daddy not catch you. Dot dot he who eh? Suddenly, a box wrapped like a gift popped up on the screen startling him. System starter pack, knowledge on the introduction to farming host needs to develop his land before creating advanced tools to aid his people. As an additional bonus, system will cure host completely while giving host greater strength than the average person. Landon clicked on the package and immediately felt a wave of knowledge burst through his brain. At the same time he could feel his body getting stronger. Once he was done digesting the information, he looked at his wrist and was shocked. His hand which recently looked like a ghost's body started changing. As time passed his hand looked more and more human. Once he was done assessing his body, he looked at the mission tab. There were two main missions. He clicked the first one, mission, 
is your land really barren, use your knowledge on farming and fix the problem of food shortage, your empire must be strong enough to protect its future technology, for the empire to be strong, the people need to be strong, submission, use the system to map out territory for future purposes, reward, host will also get knowledge on gunpowder and cannon making, host will also receive 100 development points, deadline, no specific time frame needed, Landon thought it was reasonable, if people grew hungry in his territory, no one would want to work or fight to defend his kingdom, he needed food first before anything else, he clicked the second mission, mission, gather enough points to complete level 1, requirements, 2000 experience points and 10,000 technology points needed, deadline, no specific time frame needed, reward, level 2 unlocked, Landon shrugged, I would do it anyway so it really isn't a serious mission, besides I'll need so many points dot 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 it will take at least 5 missions or more before I level up, system, can you tell me about the current world, answering host, the current world is called Hurtfilia, comprising of 9 continents, the continent the host currently lives in is called Pino, Pino has 5 empires, Arcadina, Corona, Deiferous, Terik and Yodan. Each empire has at least 15 major cities and 30 minor cities. The host's current fief is called Baymard. It is the third largest city in Arcadina. System, tell me the situation with Baymard he asked curiously. Baymard occupies 6,000 square kilometers. The system has assessed that there are currently 1,582 individuals living there. Minor cities in the empire have at least 10,000 people living in them. Host's empire falls short as a major city. Host empire is currently not even able to reach the requirements for minor cities in the empire. Baymard has almost no food in the territory. The people mostly get their food from fishing, but it is never enough for the total population. The winters on Baymard are extremely cold resulting to multiple deaths. He was satisfied with his overall situation. At least now he had a plan and he knew what to do. He looked at the interior of the carriage more carefully. One could see that it was worn out and looked like a carriage commoners used, not that he minded anyway, but he was still shocked at how father could treat his child like this. The king didn't even want to spend money to send them off. What a stingy man, he thought while shaking his head. Just as he was about to get out and look for his mom, Lucy came in. She looked at him and was startled, while blinking several times. Brother Landon is looking like his old self again. She was genuinely happy. Brother Landon, you are looking better already. Would you like to eat inside the carriage or outside? She asked smiling. Ill eat outside. He stepped out of the carriage and followed Lucy. Chapter 3 Loyal Subordinates There were 10 groups of people sitting on the floor. Each had at least 30 people gathered around a pile of food. As he walked by, they knelt on one knee giving him a proper salute. Greetings your highness. You should all sit down and not bother yourselves with such formalities, he said while smiling. The men were relieved and sat back down. He continued to follow Lucy while shaking his head. When he saw his mother, he made way towards her and sat by her side. She looked at him more seriously, turning him from left to right and right to left. She then hugged him, and then put her hands on his head as if checking his temperature. At the same time Lucy held his wrist as if trying to feel his heart beat. She then turned his face left to right, and then right to left as if convincing herself that he is truly fine. Imaking for God's sake, you guys keep treating me like a child. Dot 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 what will my men think when they see me like this? Dot 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 so you know shaking me like this would make me dizzy? He thought. Little Landon, are you feeling any better? Although you look better when we get to Baymard we will look for a physician. Here eat more food. As his mom spoke, she took out a large plate and kept adding food on the plate. Landon's eyes nearly popped out. He looked around and noticed that his plate was the biggest in the group. Forget the group, it was the biggest plate he had ever seen in his life. How can someone use this plate to eat? Tell me the truth. Are you trying to kill me with a full belly? Brother Landon here takes some of my food. As Lucy spoke she also kept adding more and more food on the plate. His mother kept adding so much food to his plate. When she finally stopped, 
she held his spoon and scooped the food towards his mouth. Oh my god, now are trying to feed me to ooh 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 ooh. He couldn't help but exclaim inwardly. When Kim saw that he wasn't eating the food on the spoon, she thought it was probably because it was too hot. So she did what any mother would do, she blew the food on the spoon. You 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 dot dot you you you, here dot 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 little Landon it's cold now quickly eat up. Landon was speechless. He quickly looked at the group of men in his group. It was clear that they were trying not to laugh. In fact one of the men's eyes were turning funny mixture between red and violent. He looked at them as if saying help me, but they shrugged their shoulders and continued eating while holding in their laughters. Is this what it feels like to have a mother? Dot. It feels very nice dot 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 fine, it'll allow you to feed me now dot dot but this is the last time dot 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 after all, I'm considered as a sick man, so it's not that strange dot dot right? Dot. He couldn't help thinking, in his previous life he was an orphan, who never had parental love. But in this life, although he has a bastard father, his mom is an angel. He's also surrounded by people who genuinely care for him. Looking at Lucy, he suddenly felt his heart skip a beat. She was the most beautiful girl he had ever seen and coupled with the fact that she spent her time taking care of the old Landon, always standing up from him when he was bullied. She was loyal, caring and somewhat strong. He secretly vowed that he would take care of her and protect her from now on. Although he was touched by his mother and Lucy, he couldn't help thinking, do I look like a baby pig to you women? Three grown men could eat what's on my plate and there would still be leftovers. Isn't this too much? Even though he thought that, looking at Lucy and his mother's encouraging faces, he decided to eat everything. I guess this is the day I die from overeating. When Landon and his mother had left the capital, they were given just 330 nights. Most barons and dukes had at least 3,000 knights under their care. When his brothers were all 15, they were given prosperous cities to rule with no less than 10,000 knights under their wings. Even his sisters were given more knights than he did. Although his sisters were given mansions in the capital and not cities to rule, they were given six 3,000 knights under their rule and command. The knights that followed him were either deemed by the empire as having the worst talent for knighthood lacked the proper training or were seen as a nuisance to the king. All and all, these knights were actually good people who were just bullied by people in the empire. But among these men, there were five outstanding knights. Lucius was a knight commander having one of the highest honors in the empire. It came as a shock to a lot of people when he resigned, stating that he would follow Landon to Baymard. Of course not to him. He knew better than anyone based on his memories. Lucius had taken care of him as a father ever since he could remember. It's clear that Lucius has feelings for his mom, but she's too dense to see it. He couldn't help thinking, do I need to set them up together? Dot dot after all mom deserves happiness too. While he was thinking he continued to eat and look around. He looked at the three men sitting by Lucius. They were Josh. Mark and Gary. They were all loyal disciples of Lucius who followed him everywhere, of course they also treated Landon as a brother. They all worked hard and attained the position of knight captain. Lastly he looked over to Thray Parsi who is his personal knight and bodyguard. Thray is extremely loyal to Landon that you would think it's an addiction. He always stays close to Landon, protecting him at all times. They usually play together and crack jokes here and there. In Thray's heart, Landon is his brother. Although Thray is only 19, he is extremely strong and attained the position of Knight Lieutenant. In the Empire, Knights were ranked after assessing their achievements and strengths. A Knight's rank starts from the least rewarding position, Esquire to a Page, then Lieutenant, Captain, Major, Commander, Master Commander and finally a Provost. After they all had their full, they continued to journey towards their new home, Baymard. Chapter 4 Baymard As they neared closer towards the city, Landon couldn't help but gasp. The city was almost as big as the capital. Although it's said that the lands are barren, only an idiot would truly give it up. Probably my father had only heard of the crises going on here and never stepped in the city to check it out. Dot 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 truly a fool, Landon thought. Baymard was surrounded by extremely high city walls 
which looked to be about 16 meters high. There was only one outer gate post for entry and exit in Baymard. It looked exactly like a medieval city in the movies. As they drove through the city, people looked at them curiously. He could almost hear whispers. Is that the new lord and his family? Do you think they would help us? I heard that the new lord isn't favored in the empire. Really? AI dot 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 dot. Do you think we're finished then? As they drove by, Landon started accessing the situation in this new kingdom. These people were extremely poor and didn't have the money to afford anything right now. They get their food mainly from fishing and occasional hunting. If he had to run the kingdom, he needed money dot 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 a lot of it. Luckily his mother and the old Landon were smart. His mother started saving all her coins, since he was born. While he, Landon started saving at age 7. Royal princes start having their monthly allowances at age 7 because that's when they start their knighthood. Training is a page. When they were in the capital, the wives of the king had a monthly allowance of 500 gold coins while his mother would only take 200 gold coins. Once his mother found out she was pregnant, she knew it was only a matter of time before they kicked her out. So she saved all her money, never spending more than what she needed. As for Landon, when he started training as a page in the royal family, he received 50 gold coin per month if he were a commoner it would be 700 copper coins, while his brothers had received 300 gold coins per month. He gave all his money to his mother to save. They didn't need much in life, since they eat and lived at the back of the palace, never needing any anything else. They were able to save quite a few gold coins. Dot, but all of that is about to change. Before, they had only themselves. But now, they have an entire kingdom to feed and wages to pay for their knights and servants which is fair, before all these people took their salaries from the empire. Now, Landon would have to step up. He quickly calculated that their savings should be able to take care of everyone for at least six months. Based on the currency 100 copper coins gives one silver coin. Similarly, 100 silver coins give one gold coin. The average salary pays up to 250 copper coins, while a knight's salary pays 700 copper coins minimum depending on their ranks. He also took into account that he may need to build new equipments and buildings. He quickly remembered the starter pack he received. Once he waited for food to grow, he would have to fish the kingdom. When they arrived at the only castle in the city, maids rushed out to greet them. Good day your highness and highnesses they said while curtsying. Be at ease. I am your new lord, Landon Barn. This is my mother Kim, my friend Lucy my loyal retainers and my staff dot 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 now, let's see our new home shall we, he said with a smile on his face, once they were introduced and shown the entire castle, Landon all their staff gathered and waited for further instructions dot looking at the group of people, most were in their early twenties, while some were in their late teens and a few in their early teens. How many people work in the castle? He asked. A girl in her early twenties stepped forward and spoke, answering my lord, thirty. There are twelve gardeners, four stable boys and three cooks and eleven maids. Good. Nathan, Daniela, please step forward he said. My lord, they said while stepping forward, both have been loyal to his mother for many years, Nathan is a 47 year butler while Daniela is a middle aged woman, they are actually married and their only child is actually Gary, Nathan you are to train the boys, while Daniela will train the girls, you all will be paid at the end of the month. Your salary will be 350 copper coins, use it to take care of your families. If you all have any difficulties, please inform any of us present. After all, we are all family. As the servants heard this, they were stunned and then very excited. One should know that, there was no money around to even buy food. Their families had had a very hard life here. They all knew that the average salary is 250 copper coins but his highness offered 100 more copper coins. What did this mean? Dot. His highness is so kind and compassionate. We must serve him loyally, they all thought. Once he dismissed all the servants he decided to discuss with his retainers. You all have served my household loyally for years. This is our new home, our new life. The empire has sent us away for good. As he said that he looked at his retainers. 
They were all angry. They then continued. They might have thought that they'll have the last laugh. They might even think we would all die without their help. They think we are weak, defenseless and a nuisance to the empire. But I don't believe so. We will turn this place into heaven and deny them access to it. As he spoke, the knights were getting very excited. Their blood were boiling. Most of them were told they were useless all their lives. They are called trash and looked down on many times in the capital. Even Lucy and his mom couldn't help it, as they blood boiled. Are you all with me, Joch? They replied. I said are you all with me? Good, because I need super knights who would train efficiently, so I will only pay the salary for a super knight. All pages will get 1000 copper coins, squires will get 2000 coins. Lieutenants get 3,500, captains get 6,000, majors get 9,000, commanders get 12,000, master commanders get 15,000 and finally provosts get 18,000 copper coins a month. Everyone was shocked. The amount was definitely too high for the various professions. This is a new era, a new time, a new home and dot 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 a new king, long live the king, long live the king, chapter 5 responsibilities he knew he would change the way the night strained, but he had to start gradually, in this era, they didn't have any form rigorous training like the ones established on earth, in fact, when he turned 18 he had served his country for two years before settling before he worked as a mechanical engineer, he knew more than anyone else, the importance of all those military routines, since the system would eventually reward him with all knowledge on cannons and gunpowder making, it's safe to assume that he would be making his very own machine guns soon, hence, he needed to train the men's reflexes and physical conditions so they could efficiently work guns or any other military equipments, although he didn't have any guns presently, it didn't mean he would neglect the benefits from that kind of training. Those routines helped soldiers build confidence in themselves, their subordinates and their companions. It also helped the soldiers improve their leadership skills, develop a sense of belonging, pride, compassion towards others and of course extremely strong body. What he needed, were soldiers who were loyal to him the people and the kingdom, and not men who did things for merit or money. He scanned the soldiers seriously, ensuring that he met almost everyone with his eyes. He gave off the aura of a well-accomplished soldier. Tomorrow morning before the dawn of day, all knights will assemble at the inner castle for training. This training sessions will involve new routines as well as your normal sword practices. All those who arrive late will have no breakfast and lunch for the rest of the day. More than three absences without a good reason will result in no food for a day and intense punishment. Now. Do you understand? All the knights immediately yelled back. Yes my king. Excellent. Now divide yourselves into three groups. In can be in any order but each group must contain at a hundred men. Once he finished speaking, he walked towards his mother and Lucy. Mom, we will need enough food to feed all the knights, our workers and ourselves. How much much do we have? he asked. His mom thought for a while and answered, we brought three wagons filled with wheat, one wagon filled with beans, one wagon filled with bees, one wagon filled barely, Ryan dotes, and finally a wagon filled with various seeds needed for farming. That's good. Dot 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 mum. Lucy dot 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 tomorrow morning. Could you all make sure that the kitchen makes enough food for all the nights? I need all the food delivered to the inner courtyard at daybreak every morning, he asked softly. After all, she was his mother, not some soldier in the army, and Lucy was someone he cared about deeply. Lucy looked at Landon's handsome face and blushed. Since when did Brother Landon look so cool and handsome? Dot. Lucy continued to blush as she observed Landon. On the other hand, Kim looked at her son's handsome face, she smiled and thought, when did my little baby grow up? He's so cute, acting all tough and manly. Pinching his checks gently she said, my little boy has grown up. Of course he'll do it. This our home now. Whatever you need me to do just say it. Brother Landon, do you even need to ask? He'll do anything you need me to do. Lucy said, immediately as she realized what she just said, 
Her blush intensified. Kim noticed and couldn't help giggling. Landon was confused so to why his mum kept giggling. Thanks mum. Thanks Lucy. Looking at them, he felt that he was truly blessed. Even though he felt like that, he couldn't help but sigh inwardly. Woman, why can't you take me seriously? Although I may look 15, I'm a full grown man for pit's sake. Can't you see that this is a serious military moment? You just said I've grown up. Yet, here you are, pinching my cheeks in public. Dot 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 Hugh, I give up. Luckily no one saw you do it or else this serious atmosphere would be a joke. Once he finished speaking to his mom, he looked around and saw all his soldiers split into three main groups, excluding Commander Lucius. He walked towards them with a serious look on his face. Since we have three knight captains in our kingdom, all knights will be grouped under these captains. All the knight captains will in turn answer to Commander Lucius. Captain Josh. Josh stepped out of the crowd and gave a salute. My king, he said still on bended knees. You will lead, train and take care of all men in the first group. As you wish my king. Josh moved towards Lucius, gave him a salute saying, Commander and walked towards the first group. When he arrived in front of them, they all shouted, Captain. Josh then stood in front of them and faced Landon. Landon then continued on with allocating the other teams to Mark and Gary, repeating the same scenarios. Once everyone looked satisfied with their various groups, they all faced Landon and yelled, My Lord. They felt like they truly belonged here as compared to when they were in the capital. No one had ever paid so much attention to them as Landon was doing. You all will take each other as family as each other's brother. Your will eat together, work together, grow strong together and build this kingdom together. No knight will ever be left behind. They were stunned and equally surprised. No one would be left behind? Dot dot this was the first time that they heard such a phrase. In this world the strong rules and the weak perished. That's just the way things were. But since most of them were considered as weak in empire, so they were heavily affected and touched by Landon's words. Fine now we will do an inspection on the land. Commander Lucius, what do you think? Landon asked while looking at Lucius. My king, it's an excellent idea. I propose that we all go for the inspection, so to know how to protect Baymard. Lucius answered immediately. I agree. After all, we need to have a clear understanding of the situation here. Based on the information we gather, we will be able to appropriately allocate duties and responsibilities to everyone. Dot 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 for now, let's go look at Baymard. Everyone needed. As he was about to move out with his men, Lucius stopped him with a smile on his face. Little Landon, does your cheeks still hurt? Chapter 6 Inspection Part 1 As they left the castle, Landon quickly checked on the system. System. How do I use you to map out the territory? Answering host. Host just needs to look at the map of the empire, stored in the system and highlight the territories that belong to host. Just like that? Landon asked almost not believing the system. Yes. So what happens when I want to expand my territories? If that were to happen host just needs to highlight more regions on the system map. Landon nodded as he listened to the system. This is also very useful as the system will inform host if any there any enemy attacks or unwanted guests in the host's territories. That's good then. Landon looked at the map and decided to draw a circle around Baymard. He made sure to add at least 20 meter difference between the city walls and the surroundings. Once he was done, a pop-up screen appeared. Would you like to view your selected territory on the monitor? He was excited. With a monitor could check every area in Baymard without being there in person. This is extremely useful for times when he might have to leave the territory for urgent matters. He clicked on yes, and viewed the city. Looking at the monitor, it resembled a regular flat screen TV. He could see people fishing on the sea coast, people farming inside the city, people going out to hunt, the city walls, the castle, and so on. He was satisfied with this mapping function in the system. Baymard was divided into three regions, the upper regions, the central regions and the lower regions. As he passed through the upper region of the city, he saw various estates. There were sixteen estates, that each had at least six stones mansions and ten small buildings on them. 
These mansions were extremely huge, having their own courtyards and servant quarters. Each estate was surrounded by a four-foot fence. A person standing next to the fence, could see the entire estate without stressing themselves. If it were back on earth, each of these mansions could be used to open a major university. They were big, but not as big as his castle. At least there are no nobles in the city to bother me. The city lord used to stay in Landon's castle, while these other estate belonged to the barons and dukes. Once they heard that Baymard will no longer be under the protection of Arcadina, they all fled to the capital. They didn't want to serve Landon, so they left. What a joke, serving a 15-year-old prince who has no power. In their eyes he was trash a prince with only 330 soldiers, they were always stronger than him physically and had a larger number of knights under their wings. In his world strength is everything. They knew that Landon had been exiled along with his family to Baymard. Staying, would only bring the wrath of the king onto them. Choosing to serve Landon would be stabbing the king in his back. Besides, they didn't want to lend any of their knights to aid in protecting Baymard. If a war broke out between Baymard and any neighboring cities, there would be no reinforcements coming in to help them. Coupled with the lack of food in the territory, it was not a risk they were willing to take. They knew that the king was indirectly saying I want Prince Landon out of Arcadina, and if anyone helps him, they would face the consequences. Once Landon and his men left the upper region, they arrived at the central part of Baymard. This region was where the villagers lived. As the group moved through the city, they greeted the villagers and aided any who needed any form of assistance. Landon kept observing his surroundings. Compared to the houses in the capital, these ones could easily be destroyed in harsh weather conditions. From his memories, the houses in the capital were all made from stone and wood making them sturdy and long-lasting. But the houses in Baymard were made of sticks, straw and mud. They all had frameworks made of timber. Their walls are made of a dried mixture of woven twigs and mud. And their roofs made of straw. This houses were typically called mud brick houses. No wonder it was reported that Baymard had the highest death rate in Arcadina. He thought, looking at the roads here, they were not as good as the ones in the upper region. There were patches of mud on the ground and a lot of potholes on the roads. On their way to the lower regions, they saw a group of men carrying bows and arrows helping to get some meat for their families, women carrying water and children running around and playing. Once they reached the lower levels, it was all vacation and farmlands. Landon could see over a 300 fields but only about five people on them. It was clear to see that even the people believed that their lands were barren. Looking west from the fields, Landon was surprised to see two giant estates. He then turned to the east from the fields and only one gigantic estate there. Landon's interest was piqued. He turned to the Lucius and the group. Why would nobles leave the upper region to build their estates here? Don't you find it very strange? Indeed my king. Lucius said and everyone else nodded. My king, maybe they found something valuable in this lower region and decided to stay here, said a shy knight. The knight had blonde hair and dark brown eyes. If he were on earth he would look like a pop artist. He had no muscles and looked incredibly weak, like a twig. Landon was not worried because once he started training them, they gain a lot of muscles. The knight's voice showed a hint of shyness and fear. It was clear that he lacked any confidence in himself. What's your name, age, rank and captain? Landon asked, Billy Vane, age 17, squire under Captain Mark. My king, Billy, that was an excellent suggestion. They might be things there that could help us better the kingdom. Excellent, Landon said while smiling. Inwardly Landon was shocked that Billy was 17 years old. He really looked like a 14-year-old boy. Billy was extremely excited to be complimented by the king. One had to know that when he spoke he was shaking like a leaf. Seeing his highness in high spirits, he felt more confident in himself. The other knights also nodded and thought that what Billy said made sense. After all, even the villagers didn't stay here. So why would nobles? It all seemed very sketchy and questionable. Let's go west first. I'm curious to know why they needed two estates there, compared to the east. Chapter 7 Inspection Part 2 The first estate they stepped into was located on a hill. As they stepped in, 
Landon was stunned by what he saw. It looked a pack of ferocious lions clawed their way out of the estate. The courtyard had several pieces of broken equipment on the floor. The left boot of a shoe was found floating in a pond at the center of the cow yard. A trail of grain could be seen from the courtyard trailing into the estate. Looking at the floor more closely, he spotted a woman's undergarment by the trail of grain a ripped painting in the flower beds and what looked like roasted fish. Were they so scared of my father's wrath that much that they had to throw away their meal? He thought. Landon and his men were all stupidly confused. Just what is going on? Nothing here adds up. They thought. In one of the courtyards, they saw large quantities of ash scattered all over the floor and traces of twigs and swords with blood stains on them could also be seen. They searched through every mansion on the estate and couldn't find anything valuable. Just as they were about to leave, Landon saw a cave at the back of the estate. Once they reached the entrance of the cave, the men put their hands on their sheath in preparation for any sudden danger. The entrance of the cave looked like it came straight out of the Lord of the Rings movie. Landon was just waiting for Samur and the White to pop up from thin air. The cave had molybdenum, trona and feldspar stones on the walls and ceilings. The people in this continent only knew the uses of molybdenite. Molybdenite was used to increase the corrosion resistance on swords armor and any silvery objects. This was the era of swords. Thousands of swords were forged daily in this world. His was for sure a rare treasure. On the other hand, people used trona and feldspar as decorative stones in the continent. In their eyes, these two were just regular stones. Completely worthless. But to Landon who came from Earth, they were priceless. Trona could be used in glass making, paper, detergents, textiles dot 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 the list is so long this was truly a huge win for them the cave was so big that land and thought they would easily get lost if they kept going forward so they decided to leave the second estate stood on another hill 700 meters away from the first walking in the estate was far cleaner than the first. It was truly stunning. Landon was in awe. They found bags of planting seeds and wheat in the kitchens, a ton of armor, swords and also a courtyard scattered with ash and blood stains. Moving towards the back of the estate, they found another cave entrance. Once they stepped into the cave, they saw a lot of iron ores. This was an iron ore mine. To think they had such things here. Everyone became excited again and kept wondering why no one in the empire knew of this mine. They looked around for a while before deciding to head to the other estate on the other side of the farms. The estate was a lot smaller compared to the other two out west. Searching the mansions, they still found, a lot of seeds, armor and swords, like the other two estates. They found a courtyard with a large quantity of ash on the floor and a cave at the back of the estate. This cave had a lot of mineral pigments and iron oxides on the walls and ceilings. Looking at the walls, Landon could see red ochre, yellow ochre, umber, saltpeter and limestones. In this world, people used these ores to make various pigments for paint. Only royalty, Potential women for selected for harems and wealthy people could have their portraits painted. Some peasants could live out their entire lives and never have their portraits taken. Everything about painting was expensive. If people in the empire knew that Landon had this, they would cough out blood heavily and wage a full-scale war against him. As the men all thought of the benefits of having paint, Landon had his own thoughts. System are the other mineral ores important? Answering host. Saltpeter is the main ingredient for making gunpowder. It can also be used in making, fireworks, rockets, food preservatives and can also be used as plant fertilizer. For the other ores, they can be used as pigments for cosmetics and future inventions. Limestone can be used as soil conditioner, aggregates in concrete animal fillers and so on. Host the possibilities are endless. Landon became excited after listening to the system. He looked at the cave and thought, oh my god, there's actually large quantities of saltpeter on the walls and ceilings. Looking at the white crystalline cones on the ceiling and the walls, he felt like Scrooge McDuck. He even started smiling stupidly. In truth, 
Zoltpeter Oars looked like frozen snow cones on the ceilings in winter. He was reminded of the Disney movie Frozen when he saw this. There was no way he would let it go. This people on the continent didn't know what the uses of these oars were. But thanks to the system and his previous life, he now knew the importance of these oars. Although he was happy now, he knew he had a long way to go. Especially when looking at the oars, he needed to find ways to extract the elements from the rock. On Earth, these ores would have been processed using very acidic compounds. There were no distillation columns, pipes or tanks here. This was very stressful to him. Even thinking about it, he couldn't help but knit his brows. Take cosmetics for example. Although he had the pigments for it, he needed to produce castor oil, glycerin, hydrolyzed cornstarch, water, sodium chloride oleal alcohol and so on. He needed at least 12 different ingredients here. He truly felt cheated. For every major invention, he just had one ingredient here. Dot dot but he needed to be grateful for what he had at least. He started thinking of how he could use the oars. Ah that's right, I saw a lot of slate stones around the territory. Now that I have enough raw materials. I can make a chalkboard dot 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 ha ha ha. He thought as they walked in deeper. When they exited the cave, Landon faced his men and asked, What do you all think about this situation? The reports don't say anything about these three mines that we found. From the looks at it, the barons and the city lord might have been the only ones who knew about it, Gary answered. That may not be entirely true since they needed workers for the mines. Do suppose they used the villagers? Josh asked. No dot dot no dot 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 they would be digging their graves if they did that. Remember, they went through a lot means to painstakingly hide the resources from the empire so that they could fill their pockets. Lucius said. Right. If they told anyone else, they would be dead men walking. As it stands right now, they won't be able to tell the king about the resources in Baymard any longer said Mark. Why? asked young knight. They've been here for many years, and in that time frame they never reported any resources they found in Baymard. Lying to the king is the same as taking the king for a fool. The penalty is death, Mark answered. All the other knights gasped. Also, if King Barn knew that he had bestowed a land of fortune to our King Landon, he would kill them for sure. Josh added, I'm guessing if he really knew, he wouldn't have given the land to King Landon, said another knight. Everyone nodded. Chapter 8 Inspection Part 3 They probably brought in their own workers, in fear that their secret would be found out. Dot 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 if the villagers knew of it, they would probably fight for some resources so they could sell and feed their families, said Thray. That may be the case. After all, since we've been in the lower region, we haven't seen any people walking around. Dot 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 since the people believe the land is barren, they don't come here anymore. And even if they did come, the mines are a great walking distance from their farmlands, said Lucius. Also, don't forget that the entrance and exit from Bamad is located in the central region, so no one really needs to be here, Gary added. Everyone agreed as well. My guess is that. They burnt all the workers when realized how serious their situation was, Landon said. That would explain all the bloodstains and ash we found in all three estates. After all, there's no guarantee that the workers would keep their secret forever. The only way to bury the secret was silencing the workers permanently, Thray added. They had to admit, the city lord and the barons put a lot of thought into their plans. They didn't think there would be a day when they would have to leave Baymard for good. They truly didn't see it coming. Since we are done, let's move to the sea coast. Landon said. The central region of Baymard was like the midpoint of a compass. Moving eastwards from the central region, one would reach the upper regions of Baymard. And in the west, you would reach the lower region. Likewise, to the north of the central regions was the entrance exit to Baymard. And in the south, the sea coastline entrance. Once they arrived the coastline, Landon and his men saw a lot of villagers fishing, while some were carrying baskets of fish on their heads. They spoke to the villagers, aided them and left to inspect the city walls and the forests by the entrance of Baymard. Once were outside Baymard, Landon looked at the walls carefully. He had to admit, the walls were pretty formidable. 
The walls were in perfect conditions. Moving into the surrounding forests, they heard a shrill shout and the sound of a sword hitting a inst something. Ah, ting dot dot ting. There was a little boy who looked not older than eight, trying to kill a giant wild boar. The boy had light bright eyes and deep red hair. Just as the wild boar was about to strike him down, the boy shut his eyes tightly as if accepting death. He waited and was surprised. He didn't feel any pain. Opening his eyes, he was stunned to see a group of knights and a dead wild boar on the ground. Thank you sirs, the boy said. What's your name? Landon asked smilingly. Once the boy saw Landon's genuine smile, he knew they were friendly. My name is Momo Lai dot 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 sir. Who are you? Momo asked curiously. I'm the new king and lord of Baymard. Landon. The boy was shocked and frightened. My king, sorry for not greeting you earlier. It's all right, besides I'm more worried about you. Mosley was shocked. His highness is worried about me? Dot. He thought, Mono, why were you here alone? Don't you know how dangerous it is? Landon asked. I live alone with my elder sister, my king. Our parents died when I was just four summers old. Sister told me they died because of the cold. Dot 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 dot. Sister recently got very sick. I know that for her to get better she needs a lot of meat, so I came to hunt. Landon and the men were sad on hearing this. Although they were some of the men were bullied in the capital. None of them had ever starved or seen someone die of cold. They vowed that they would work hard in order to protect the people. In fact Landon took pity on them too. In his previous life he often, so seeing Momo struggle, he felt he should assist him. From now on, your sister will be my adopted sister, you will be my adopted brother and I will call you little Momo. You and my new sister will move into the castle immediately. From now on, that will be your new home, Landon said. Momo couldn't believe it. Dot 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 this was the king. Although Momo was eight years old, he knew when people were kind or tried to help him. He could tell that Landon was a good person. Landon introduced Momo to Lucius and the other knights. Everyone started teasing Momo, making him blush. Little Momo, let's go take my sister my new sister home. They carried the boar and left the forest. Landon. Momo and the men stood outside a tiny house. They could hear tiny cough sounds coming from inside. Landon went in with Momo, Josh and Lucius. Sister, sister, I brought food for you. Momo yelled as he ran into the house. Landon and group waited in the living room area. When Momo stepped into the bedroom room, he saw a frail but extremely beautiful girl laying on a straw bed. She had fiery red hair, light brown eyes and a petite frame. Sister. The king is here to see you. Grace nearly fell out of the bed when she heard Momo. Momo, did you get into any trouble? Why would the king want to see me? Grace asked questionably. Momo then narrated the entire story to Grace. Then let me thank his highness then she said as she tried to stand up. Sister, he said that when you're ready he would come in. She nodded and Momo went out. A few seconds later, Momo, Landon, Lucius and Josh walked. Your highness she said as bowed her head. Looking at the tiny girl in front of him, Landon was sure she was nineteen years old. In truth she looked like a mini version of Urza Scarlet Titania from Fairy Tail. Please be at ease, you're my big sister after all. He said gently with a smile on his face. Grace was taken aback by his words, and after a while she relaxed. She found that what Momo said was true. He was ready a kind fellow. He was somewhat cute with his big white eyes. He looked like a cute bunny rabbit, she thought. My name is Landon. This is Commander Lucius and this is Captain Josh. May I know your name elder sister? As Josh looked at the girl in front of him, he almost forgot to breath. Although she looked sick, she was incredibly gorgeous. Her red hair and petite frame made her look like a fairy. The more he looked at her, the more he blushed. The same thing could be said for Grace. She had a hard time taking her eyes of Josh. She had never felt this way before. She blushed so hard that her already light red face turned deep red. Of course Lucius and Landon noticed all these and couldn't help chuckling inwardly. My name is Grace Lie. Grace, since I already take you as part of my family, I cannot bear to let you stay here with Momo on your own. For the safety of you two, 
please move into the palace with us, Landon asked, your highness, please call little Landon, Landon said smilingly, little Landon will go with you, Momo was so happy, that he jumped on the bed and gave his sister a big hug, Captain Josh, help sister Grace pack up here, Commander Lucius, little Momo and myself will pack up in the dining area, Josh was stunned, he turned and saw Lucius and Landon chuckling, he turned his head back to Grace, she keep looking towards the floor, but it was clear that she tried to hide her blush, she was so cute, dot Josh smiled and thought, these bastards, they even have the nerve to give me a thumbs up, dot 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 ha ha, Luckily she didn't see anything dot 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 it would have been so embarrassing. Chapter 9 New Routines Part 1 Once they got home, Landon told his mom and Lucy all that happened. They warmly welcomed Momo and Grace into their family. Little Momo and Grace were given rooms close to each other. They were also close to Lucy and Kim's rooms. Landon gave the job of training Momo as a night page to Josh. Momo was 8 now so it was the perfect time to train him, although seven years old was the appropriate age in the continent, he sat on his bed and tried to go to sleep, tomorrow was a busy day for him, he had to train with the men in the morning, and then head out to the farms to solve the barren land situation, as he laid on his bed, his eyes became heavy with fatigue and his mind drifted to sleep, the next day, Landon stood in the center of the inner courtyard facing over 300 men, he was impressed, if he were back on earth, it would be about 5a.m now, and yet all the men were up and ready, none of them came late, even Momo showed up early, he knew that for his plan to work, he needed to discipline them well, he looked at them coldly, giving off an aura of an old war veteran, line up in straight lines of ten, he started counting out loud, one dot 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 two dot 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 three dot 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 four dot 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 five dot 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 six dot 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 seven dot 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 fifty two, they all formed their teams under fifty two seconds waited for his next command, too slow, lines should be formed by the time I count to five, from today onwards, Anyone who isn't fast in lining up will run 10 laps around the courtyard before training begins, is that understood? Yes King Landon, during training, I will be your commander and not your king, when answering to me you will all say, sir, yes sir, say it, Landon yelled, sir, yes sir, they yelled back, there are four military disciplines to follow while training, these rules are to be followed only when you are in training, first, I am the law here, second, obey my orders, third, unconditionally obey my orders, fourth, when I am not around, obey commander Lucius orders, the men were taken aback by his opposing aura that sent chills down their spines, is that understood? exclamation mark, sir, yes sir, he did warm up exercises with them for 10 minutes and stopped, he watched and waited for them to catch their breaths, after one minute he yelled, line up behind your assigned night captains, they immediately got up and looked for the captains in a flash, no one wanted to be punished, they all lined up, behind, Josh, Mark and Gary, Momo lined up behind Josh since he was told that Josh would train him, in fact Lucius was impressed, he had always struggled when disciplining young knights, this was a real eye opener to him, after these exercises, you all should have realized how weak you are physically, you all lack stamina and strength, at this point, they all came to the conclusion that their king was a demon trainer, he had joined them in training earlier and yet, he stood there looking back at them as if this was a casual walk, they had to admit, their king was pretty strong, actually, when the system cured him previously, it also gave him extra strength when he took the system starter pack, staring at their tired faces without any hint of emotions, he continued, captains Josh, Mark and Gary, step forward, they stepped out and looked at Landon, you all will lead your teams in becoming stronger, you will face challenges together and ensure that no soldier falls behind, if anyone in your team fails, it would mean that you also failed, do you understand, sir, yes, sir, answered the three, they stepped back and stood in front of their respective teams, listen up, everybody squat down with your feet in a wide stance, hands clasped behind your back, although they were confused, 
they hurriedly did it. Even Lucius who was standing by the sides, decided to join in. He wanted to experience this new exercise. Holding this squatting position, jump to move forward. You are all to do this ten times around the courtyard. Little Momo will be required to do only four rounds. Hearing this, the soldiers thought that this exercise would be a breeze. Even little Momo and Lucius was doubting the effects of this kind of exercise. How could Landon not know what they were thinking of? Back on Earth, he thought the same thing too. The first time he saw how the three exercise was done, Landon walked to the very back of the lines besides Lucius and squatted down. Then he yelled coldly, Start. Once they started, everyone was was excited. They thought they would finish it fast and be done. After a while, they were breathing heavily and their throats were dry. Most of them were proud of their strength before, but now they couldn't help but look at their weak bodies. Even Lucius started to feel the burn, but he knew he couldn't stop. Gary felt like he was about to die. His heavy arms and tired legs started wobbling. Momo felt the burn in the legs and thighs. Does this mean him weak? He thought, from the back, seeing people feeling tired. Landon spoke out, if you give up so easily, are you real soldiers? Are you real men? Get up. This is an order. My command is law. When they heard him at the back, they all had one thought, demon trainer. As the training progressed, their thighs felt numb. Every time they wanted to quit, they would hear the devil's voice from behind. Those that give up will be face my wrath. If you want to see dot 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 he who e dot dot try me. As they looked at little Momo, they were truly envious of the fact that he had finished his rounds. Thray truly felt like his legs were going to R.I.P. off his circuits. As he thought of his best friend Landon, he wondered where he had learned this sort of demonic training from. Thray thought that Landon made the training up on the spot. In fact, no one suspected that Landon was different. He had always been a very weird child. He was always too quiet growing up a little introverted. When people would bully or insult him he would just watch. He never really cared about how they treated him. He never cried or showed any form of worry. So they all thought this was still him. Chapter 10 New Routines Part 2 As the exercise progressed, everybody gave it their all since no one wanted to do any of the devil's punishments. Once they were done they all dropped to the floor like flies. Everyone was dead tired. Their thighs felt sore and their hands felt heavy. Some were lying on the ground, while others were kneeling down trying to catch their breath. Some even tried to sleep for a minute, while the ones that were awake started looking at the main culprit who caused them to be in this state. In fact, they almost thought he wasn't human. He had been doing these exercises with them and yet he looked the same as he was before the exercise. Once everyone caught their breaths and became more relaxed, Landon spoke, line up. Once they heard the devil's call, they all jumped for their lives, lining behind their captains. Even those who were almost asleep woke up and acted like shinobis as they desperately tried to find the captains. In fact Landon was sure that after this day, most people would literally stick closer to their captains like glue. Landon chuckled secretly. The men followed him in training for the next 45 minutes. They did sit-ups, duck walks, leg stretching, front kicks, normal kicks, side kicks, back kicks and roundhouse kicks. All these exercises were new to them. When they were done he allowed them to rest for a bit. While they were resting, a maid came over and spoke to him in a very low whispery tone. You will all follow me in straight lines for breakfast. Your breakfast will be served every morning at this exact time. If you are absent for breakfast because you were of your duty or sickness, you need not worry. The staff will make sure to deliver your food whenever you are in Baymard. Dot now follow me. As they followed him into the dining area, they saw twelve maids, his mother, Lucy, Grace and twelve giant pots of food. On the side of the pots were a lot of plates and spoons. The dining hall looked exactly like the meal hall in Harry Potter, if not, bigger. You have an hour. As soon as they heard the Demon King, they quickly rushed up one by one to get their meals. With twelve pots stationed and twelve maids serving the food, within twenty minutes everyone had food on their plates. Water was then brought out and served to the men. Those who finished their food earlier, could go for a second round if they weren't satisfied. 
the only issue was that it had to be done within the time frame Landon had set for them. He brought little Momo with him and joined Lucius, Lucy, Grace and his mom for breakfast. Looking at the cute tired Momo, Lucy, Kim and Grace lightly pinched his cheeks. Little Momo, is it too stressful for you? You don't have to work that hard, auntie will take care of you. Kim said while smiling at him. That's right. When sister gets strong she will feed you and take care of you Grace said while nodding her head. You just tell big sister when you want to stop, okay? Lucy added. Auntie, elder sister, sister Lucy, I'm fine dot 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 brother Landon took good care of me when we were training. I want to get strong. Momo replied. My cute little Momo dot 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 so cute. Kim said while rubbing his head. My little man is so cute. Grace said while lightly pinching his jaw. Little Momo you are so adorable. Lucy said while lightly pinching his other cheeks. Momo turned and saw Lucius and Landon holding in their laughters. He felt wronged. No man wanted to hide behind women forever. What would people say? He looked at his arms and thought. Cute? Dot 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 adorable? Dot 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 no. No. No exclamation mark. Dot 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 bother Landon was right. Right now I'm too weak. Once the time was up, Landon yelled, line up and move out. In the minds of the men, the words line up was their devil commander's favorite words. And their worst. They were pretty sure they would have nightmares of the king chasing them while saying, line up. When they returned to the courtyard, Landon continued. Two weeks from now. All teams will compete with each each. The strongest in each team, would be made second in command to their team captains. Also, those who prove themselves will be promoted on the spot. Everyone was surprised and excited. Everyone is required to practice their swordsmanship for at least an hour a day. There will be three sessions, one after breakfast, one after lunch and one right before dinner. He looked at them seriously and continued. For today. We will train in swordsmanship now. And right after training, Commander Lucius will give you all your responsibilities. Some of you might need to guard to entrance, checking for spies, while others will work in the city. Everyone listened attentively. Landon took his sword from the ground and smiled at them, making them extremely confused. As of now I am not your commander. Commander Lucius is. Right now. His word is the law. I am just a knight in training. They almost coughed up blood. Who are you trying to deceive with those innocent looks? One minute you're a demon and the next minute you're an angel? Dot dot a thank goodness dot 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 at least now we don't need to be alert all the time. They all sighed from relief. Some even tried to sit on the floor. Lucius looked at them and knew that they needed discipline. And who said you could sit? Those who broke out of formation. Step out and give five me 100 push-ups each. Captain Josh, start training Page Momo. The rest of you take out your swords dot 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 let's train said Lucius. Sir, yes sir. They all yelled back including Landon. The couldn't help but sigh. From the frying pan to the fire. From one demon king to another. At the same time, Lucius was happy with the positive responses he was getting. The men were more attentive and did things more diligently. I can get used to this, he thought. Chapter 11 Farming Part 1 By the time training was done, it was already 9 a.m. The men all went to their assigned posts. Landon decided to take Momo. Lucy and Thread to the farmlands in the lower areas, looking at the farms. He could roughly estimate that there were at least 300 farms. The whole place looked like one of those industrial plantations on earth. There were three farmers on the land. When they saw Landon coming over, they rushed over to meet him halfway. Good day my lord, they replied with a hint of fear in their voices. Good day to you all dot 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 I wonder if you guys can tell me about the land here. I was hoping that I might be of assistance to you all. Landon said while smiling. My lord, may we ask who you are? Asked an elderly man. Landon could see that this man was like the leader of the pack. Everyone sort of hid behind him while talking. I am the new king of Baymard, King Landon. This is my personal knight Thray. 
my friend Lucy and I'm guessing you all know little Momo here. Dot, 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 please be at ease. I only wish to help. The farmers looked at Landon curiously. This was the first time they had ever seen or heard of a king who wanted to aid in farming. May I know your names as well? Landon asked. Your Highness. My name is Pat. This is Lior and this is Waldo. We are farmers here in Baymard, said Pat as he introduced everyone. Pat was a strong 42-year-old man with rich black hair and and light green eyes. On the other hand, 37-year-old Lior had blonde hair with light brown eyes. And 36-year-old Waldo had ink black hair with dark brown eyes. Your Highness, we have been farming in this land for more than 20 years now. The land is very barren, the growth of our crops are stunted and our yields are sparse, said Pat, searching through his mind, he knew he had to determine the soil type in order to fix the problem, dot 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 don't worry, by tomorrow I will give you the solution to the problem, meet me here, same time tomorrow morning, Landon replied, yes, your highness, although they agreed, they really didn't believe that he had a solution, after all, they had been farming all their lives while he had been living in luxury. Their fathers farmed on this land and now they did too. Since they could remember, the land had always been barren. They chose to keep farming because they genuinely loved everything about it. It felt like an accomplishment seeing something they planted sprouting out of the ground. Although the yields weren't high, they felt joy in doing their profession. So when His Highness said that he would give them a solution, they were taken aback and of course had doubts about this so-called solution. They decided to wait and see. Landon walked away from the men, poured some water onto the soil and waited. He observed that the water drained quickly. This was a good sign. He then grabbed a handful of soil and softly compressed it in his fist. The soil felt smooth and could hold its shape for a short period of time. So far so good. He thought. Landon then took three handfuls of topsoil from the ground and went back to the castle. Once in the castle Landon filled a white jade wine basin with water and poured the soil into it. He then stirred it vigorously, until all clumps of soil had dissolved. He then decided to place the basin by the window overnight. In fact it would have been best to use a transparent glass jar. But too bad. Glass hadn't been invented yet. He decided that in the future, he would teach the farmers and villagers everything he knew about farming. Knowledge is power, he thought. The more people that knew the right ways to farm, the better the crop yields in Baymard. System, can you give me a copy of the farming book from my starter pack? Answering host number. If host wants a copy, host should write it out himself. The system replied. Aren't you supposed to be an all-powerful and mighty technology system? Landon grumbled. It is exactly because the system is all-powerful and mighty that your request was rejected. The system is not a photocopying machine host. Landon was speechless. What a shameless system, he thought. So how can you help me then? Host can use the system's space-time capsules. Once host seats the capsule, host will be transported into the system's space. One hour in the outside world is equivalent to five days in the system's space. The system emotionlessly replied, Landon was excited. With this he could write down the entire book in hours. System, I want to use the space-time capsule, he said excitedly. Host does not have enough experience technology or bonus points to use the space-time capsule. Landon didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Then why did you tell me about the capsule? Landon asked almost wishing he could kill the stupid system. The system thought it was the appropriate time to tell the host. Landon massaged the temples on his forehead trying for calm down. How much time is contained in one capsule? And how many points do I need before I can use the capsule? Answering host. One capsule is equivalent to one hour in the real world. For host to buy a space capsule, host needs any of these points, 10 technology points, 5 experience points or 2 bonus points the system replied. Since I don't have any at the moment, what do I do? The system suggests that the host invents something so as to get the bonus points. Landon's eyes lit up. That's it dot 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 he'll make a blackboard, he thought. The next day, after training, 
He went to his bedside window and observed the contents in the basin. He took a spoon and carefully checked if the soil had any layers. At the very bottom was sand, the middle layer had silt and the top layer had clay. This was loamy soil. It was the perfect soil for agriculture. It was a mixture of sand, silt and clay. If the problem wasn't with the soil itself, then it there could only be one reason, lack of nutrients and organic matter. Chapter 12 Farming Part 2 As Landon looked into the basin, he realized that the water residue was clear in color and not a lot of organic sediments could be seen floating at the top. This was a bad sign. Typically, rich soil leaves murky colored water with a lot of organic sediments floating around. The solution is simple. The soil needs manure. Actually this problem would have been solved decades ago, if the people in this continent knew what manure was. The most important thing to know is that soil is alive. There are more species of organisms in the soil than there are above ground. These organisms convert soil minerals and organic matter to vitamins and hormones needed for the plant. So for more than a decade these people have been starving the soil. Obviously these organisms would either die or move away. It's that simple dot soil needs to eat too. In fact, Baymar wasn't the only place where the lands were said to be barren. There are so many small towns that had this problem. The reason Baymard was well known was because it was the third biggest city in the empire. For more than 40 years, it had been barren. From the reports he received, people claimed that one day, the land turned barren. Some people even said it was a cursed plan. Of course Landon didn't believe in all those stories. It definitely didn't happen overnight. Everyone gave up on the place as it was deemed worthless to the empire. As the saying goes the bigger you are, the harder you fall. Baymard's size was comparable to Tokyo Japan back on earth. Imagine if the entire Tokyo turned to barren lands and there was no food to dot 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 of course it make headlines. Landon also wanted to introduce crop rotation. Doing this would definitely increase soil fertility soil nutrients and crop yield. Crop rotation would also reduce stressful weeds and soil pollution. It was a good method for maintaining the soil structure. Having come up with a solution, he took a lot of bags and buckets, leaving again with Momo, Lucy, Terry and three other knights. On their way to the lower region, they stopped at the stables and got animal feces and then got water from the wells. They also picked up a lot of mosses, grass and dead tree skin and put in bags, as well as cooked discarded fruits, vegetables and vegetable peelings. Lower region if Baymard mix everything together and put on the soil, Landon said. Everyone looked at him as if he was mad. Wouldn't doing this make the soil rotten? They thought. Even though they were thinking that, they did it anyway. Water the farm beds. Remember not to flood it. Doing so will make the soil hard. They quickly went along to do what he said. Now we wait dot 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 in the next couple of days, you all will follow the exact procedure done just now. When you get a process, come and find me, Landon said. Everyone nodded as they too were curious to know the results of this little experiment. Once everything was done, Landon decided find a carpenter for the blackboard. Since it would take time for the crops to show any signs of recovery. He decided to open a school in the meantime. For now, he decided to teach all the children and villagers on how to read and write in Pyron language used in the empire and how to do math. He had already decided to ask Lucy to assist in teaching Pyron, while Kim and himself would teach math. Although both women knew basic addition and subtraction, multiplication and division would be hard for them to do. Hence he decided to break math into two parts. Math 1 Addition and Subtraction and Math 2, Multiplication and Division. Kim would Math 1 and him Math 2. Of course both math classes would start off with basic understanding of numbers. They would have to make sure the villagers knew how to count, before they started addition or multiplication. He also planned on teaching both women math every night from now on. He hoped that one of them could take over his duty as the second math teacher very soon. There were quite a handful of literate people living in the central region. From the reports, he knew there were a few alchemists, welders, and so on, who were literate. It would be a good idea to find these people and use them in teaching others. After all, 
he can't teach everything. He decided to follow the same schooling system that exists back on earth. No matter how old or young the villagers were, those who were not literate, would begin at kindergarten. They were to learn how to read, write, simple add numbers and so on. As the saying goes, you're never too old to go to school. In fact, Landon remembered that back in his university days, there was a 50-year-old man who was in the class with him. He was was so astonished and had deeply respected the man. Not everyone had the guts to go to school at such an age. Most people were either ashamed or very prideful. The situation in Baymard was very tricky. Everyone went out to either hunt, fish, cook, farm and so on. Because he didn't want to disrupt their daily lives, he decided to make a teaching schedule for the town. He would have morning sessions and late afternoon sessions. All illiterate villagers were required to attend at least one session a day. All villagers below the age of 18, were required to attend the morning classes. While those above 18 could choose to attend any session they liked. Morning sessions would have six classes three taking place at the same time. He decided to break the children down into three groups, those below seven, those below thirteen and those above thirteen. Lucy would teach Pyron to those below seven, Kim would teach Math 1 to those below thirteen, while he would teach Math 2 to those above thirteen at the same time. Once their classes was done, they would just take the next set of children. Landon thought all these things as he made his way to the center region in search of a carpenter. Chapter 13 Notice Chapter 13 Notice Hey guys, thanks for all the love and support. I'm starting my midterm exams tomorrow. I will resume posting on Wednesday, next week. Thanks for all your support. Chapter 14 Notice 2 Chapter 14 Notice 2 I'll have to push it to Friday guys. Dot, 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 dot. My professor is sick so we scheduled the last exam for Friday. Dot, dot, dot. Thanks for everything. Chapter 15 A storm is brewing Whitewood City. Standing by the castle walls of Whitewood Castle, a still hout could be seen looking over the city. The man had dark black hair and an overconfident smile on his face. However, hidden deep within his inky black eyes, a hint of anxiety could also be seen. Eli Barn looked at his most trusted knight, Zarius half kneeling in front of him and asked. When Zarius arrived earlier he gave a letter to Eli while doing his salute. Without opening the letter Eli asked. Is it done? Rest assured my lord, we made sure that his highness Landon was poisoned with Nalatwisp before he left the capital. Zarius replied. Perfect dot 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 how long will it take for my trash of a brother to die? My lord, this poison is a slow deadly one dot 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 there is no cure for this poison dot 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 it will kill him in five months time. Dot 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 by then no one would even suspect my lord for his highness Landon's death dot 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 I left no evidence my lord ha 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 dot 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 good dot 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 Zarius you have done well dot 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 that stupid brother of mine is the disgrace of my royal family dot 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 even if they found out I did it so what dot 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 father wouldn't care much dot dot hi he he dot dot he's already a dead man walking after all, everyone would think he got killed fighting over food or something. Dot 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 dot. Hi 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 hi. Eli said while smiling and laughing. Zarius looked at his lord with a confused gaze. Dot 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 dot. Why had his lord gone through all the trouble just to kill Landon Barn? Dot 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 dot. Everyone knew he would die sooner or later. So why the rush, my lord? Dot dot dot. Why kill him? Eli looked at Zarius and smirked. I need his land as a secret base for my knights. Dot dot dot. Dot dot I plan to be king within the next year and a half. Dot 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 the sooner that buffoon of a brother dies the better. As for father, he would never suspect me of anything. Dot dot so he'll take advantage of that and kill him when he least suspects it. A trace of violence flashed in his pupils as he spoke. Dot 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 Zarius looked at his lord in surprise. It was a genius idea. Even if they killed Landon Barn, they wouldn't let the Empire know. By doing so, 
they could secretly use his territory as a base to gather and train more knights. King Ban sent his officials as spies to all parts of the empire. There are tons of spies in Elis territory. The only way to train or get more knights without the king's knowledge was to use Landon's territory. It was the perfect location. King Ban had made his officials leave Baymard so as to prove that he wouldn't support the territory. The king believed that Landon would never pose a threat to him so he didn't see the need to send spies over there. Hence making Baymar the ideal location. Also King Barn had made sure that no one controlled more knights than he did in the empire. If the king knew Eli wanted to train and gather more knights, it wouldn't be long before he guessed what his son was up to. Dot 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 at that point King Barn would definitely kill Eli. The funny thing is that Eli is already the crown prince and his father's most favored son. So doing all this was really unnecessary. Greed is a fatal human flaw after all. Zarius' entire body trembled while looking at his lord, Prince Eli. His highness sure is vicious, he thought. What about the assassins we caught earlier? Eli asked. My lord. Five of them killed themselves but two survived and one escaped. Dot 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 from what we gathered your second and third brothers are working together to get rid of you, my lord. Zarius replied. Eli smiled coldly. So they plan to get rid of me first before killing each other over the throne? Dot 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 I'm not bad brothers. My lord, should we send our men to retaliate against them? Zarius asked. Eli shook his head while saying, no need dot 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 doing so would only alert my father and make things difficult for us as well dot 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 don't forget our new goal dot 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 a year and a half before I become king dot 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 anyway. It's only my brothers. What harm could those cubs pose to a full-grown lion? Dot 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 well dot 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 let's see how long they can keep this up shall we? Dot I don't mind being a star in their play dot dot ha ha ha. Eli remembered that he hadn't opened the letter in his hand yet dot 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 he opened it slowly and began to read it. My sister Jeanette wants to visit me from the capital dot 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 my, my. My dot dot this family just gets better and better, Eli said with a smile. My lord, do you think she knows that the assassination attempt failed? Zarius asked. I doubt that she would know dot 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 I'm sure my brothers haven't seen her yet and won't pass such serious information on paper dot 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 most likely she just probing to see if I'm still alive dot 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 I should reply here. No, Zarius smiled and replied, it's only proper my lord. Eli smiled while looking over the city once more and thought, it won't be before I rule the entire empire, by then all of them would die for sure. Drapern City, in a well-lit fancy room, three men could be seen talking to each other. Two of the men were sitting down while the other was half kneeling as a form of respect. Are you sure the rest killed themselves? asked Connor Barn. Yes your highness. While escaping, I saw it with my own very eyes, the escaped assassin replied. You may leave now, Connor replied with a cold voice. Yes my lords, after they made sure that the assassin could no longer be seen they both looked at each other deeply. Second brother, what do we do now? Dot if father hears about this dot 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 he wouldn't let us off, asked James Barn. Relax. He'll send first brother a letter saying that we want to come over for a visit. Dot 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 it would be better to be absolutely sure he doesn't suspect us of it. Connor replied. I agree, James replied. Also, it would be best for you to stay in my territory for the time being. Dot dot if he really knew, he would try to assassinate us together. They both nodded and decided that this method would be the best way to find out whether Eli knew or not. Chapter 16 Progress Landon looked at the tiny stone building in front of him. It was one of the few stone buildings in the central region of Baymard. As he walked in, he observed a short looking who seemed to be fully immersed in making something. The man looked to be in his late forties, having deep green eyes and whiskers that curled at the tips. His overgrown beard and monobrow made him look like a dwarf fairy tale character. Landon decided to sit and wait for him to be done while observing the tiny workshop. There were also six other people at the back, who seemed to all be around the ages of 1825. They were also fully submerged into their own works. Landon could tell that they were the old man's apprentices. Once the man was done, 
He looked up and was shocked to see that someone was sitting down waiting for him. He hurriedly wiped his hands on his apron and rushed towards Landon. Sorry customer dot dot I didn't see you the dot 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 I hope you didn't wait for long dot 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 in Tim Mayers. The owner of this workshop dot 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 how may I help you? The man said with a forced smile. Landon could tell that Tim was a kind hearted man. He could easily see that Tim felt guilty for making him wait. It's alright, I didn't wait for long anyways, I'm here because I want you to aid me in making school supplies, Landon said with a welcoming smile. After observing that Landon was truly not angry, Tim visibly relaxed and had a genuine smile on his face. Are you talking about slate boards and slate pencils sir? Yes dot 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 but I'm talking more about chalkboards. Tim was confused. He didn't know what chalkboards were. In this era, school children used slate boards to practice handwriting and arithmetic without wasting paper. Slate boards were made from slate stone. The boards were about the size of a laptop back on earth. They were portable, usable and disposable. Since, paper was very expensive in this era, it was more reasonable to write on slate stones. As for slate pencils, Landon really didn't need them as a plan to use chalk instead. Slate pencils were made from softer pieces of slate rock. Slate pencils always left scratched marks on the boards and the sound they make when used was just utterly terrible. It sounded like nails screeching on a chalkboard. In fact Landon thought that the sound was just like those shriek sounds in horror movies. Also when slate pencils were used. The boards would need to be thrown away after a short period of time. That's where chalk has the advantage over slate pencils. Chalk could be easily used without destroying the boards. At the same time, he noticed that teachers didn't write or show their capabilities. They just talked for hours trying to make the students memorize things. Slate stones could only be cut into smaller pieces, so making a very large slate board was near impossible. Hence. He really couldn't fault the teachers for their teaching methods because they didn't have anything like chalkboards also called blackboards. Of course in the future, Landon knew that he would upgrade to the popular whiteboards commonly used in universities. Landon looked at the confused Tim and smiled. Don't worry dot 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 he'll guide you on how to make them. Immediately as Tim heard what Landon said he nodded and felt reassured. How many would you need sir? He'll need 60 chalkboards and 2000 slate boards. Landon planned to line up at least 3 chalkboards in each classroom just like how his university did. Tim was quite curious about this customer of his. Judging from his clothes he must be a knight. So why would a knight need all these? Pardon me for asking sir. But who are you? Tim asked inquisitively. Ah pardon my manners, I'm your new king of Baymard, King Landon. I plan to develop Baymard in all aspects of life. I want my people to all be learned. For this I will need your assistance. Tim was shocked dot 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 weren't all nobles supposed to be snobbish? The young man in front of him was intelligent and very humble. Landon spent the entire day explaining how he needed the chalkboards to look like and what materials were to be used. At the end they came up with a price range for all the products. Each slate board would cost 7 copper coins and a chalkboard would cost 4 silver coins. Landon thought those were pretty reasonable price ranges. It was also concluded that a month from now, all the boards would be available. For the chalkboard paint and the actual chalk, he needed the mineral laws in the caves. The next day he gathered 300 men and appointed Lock Wiggins as the supervisor for digging the ores out, making the paint and also making the chalkboards. He agreed to pay each worker 400 copper coins, while Chief Wiggins would get 600 copper coins per month. He also arranged for all workers to have meals during their lunch break which would be cut from their salaries. A plate of food would cost 5 copper coins dot 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 so they didn't really mind. A week passed by and Landon realized that they had collected quite a lot of ores. It was finally time to show Chief Wiggins how to make chalkboard paint and chalk. From the group of 300, 20 men were selected to make blackboard paint while 80 men would make chalk. Chief Wiggins also appointed three new supervisors under him. Hale Verner would supervise ore extraction, 
Charles Mopey would supervise paint manufacturing and Jevon Stern would supervise chalk making. Of course Chief Wiggins would oversee everything. Their salaries were also upgraded to 500 copper coins. The last estate Landon went to last time in the lower regions was cleaned and used as the storage facility for all ores and the manufacturing industry for both chalk and paint. The ores were put into different buildings according to their types and the amount deposited registered at the end of every day. day. Landon also appointed five cooks and thirty knights to guard and protect the workers in case of any unforeseen incidents. Once the first batch of chalkboard paint was made, Landon sent it to Tim Mayers, as well as a sample of chalk. Landon knew that this chalk would be used by both teachers and children. For now he decided that chalk should be free... But once the economy picked up, he would sell 12 pieces for 10 copper coins. Time flew by very fast, and before he knew it... The last week of the month was here. Just when Landon was about leaving the upper region of Baymard, he saw Waldo running towards him. My king, the plants have bore fruits. Chapter 17 Establishing a farming industry ding. Congratulations to host for completing the first task. The system responded. Landon decided that he would check his reward when he went back home at night. For now, he needed to see the results for himself. Landon looked at the overly excited Waldo. Judging from his appearance, Landon could see that Waldo had been crying before. He assumed it was tears of joy. Waldo knelt down in front of him and almost began crying again. Your Highness... Dot 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 your idea was a success... Dot 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 with the soil not being barren anymore... Dot 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 w dot dot we dot 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 sniff... Dot 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 we would be able to produce enough food to feed everyone. Thank you your Highness... Dot 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 thank you. Sniff, sniff. Waldo said while trying to hold back his tears. Please stand. Dot, 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 you all are my people and my new family. Dot, 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 it is my responsibility to take care of you all, Landon said with a smile. Waldo looked at Landon and was filled with warmth. This is what a ruler should be like, he thought. Waldo, let us go to the farms and have a look at the fields. Yes, Your Highness, Waldo said with a smile. Once they got to the farmlands, Landon was shocked. He could see tall stalks of wheat. He could see bean sprouts, oats, peas, rye, and tomatoes. In fact, the farms all looked luscious and rich. When everyone saw him coming over, they all smiled and rushed over to him. They were no longer afraid to speak their minds in front of him. In fact at the middle and end of every week, Landon made sure to come over regularly. He always brought food over and spoke to them as if they were his family. The farmers were stunned at first, then they later realized that their king didn't care about appearances at all. All of them thought he was wise, intelligent, kind, generous and most of all humble. Your Highness, they all greeted and gazed at him as if they were looking at a god. How are you all? I heard that there are a lot of goodies from the farm this time. Dot 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 you all should make sure not to overwork yourselves. Taking care of one's health is the most important thing after all. Landon said while smiling. They all smiled in return and Lyo stepped forward. My king. Your methods were amazing. I feel like a toddler who is learning farming for the first time. Lyor said excitedly. Landon chuckled while looking at their excited faces. Don't worry, in the future I will teach you all on everything concerning farming. But for now, we need at least 250 more people here. We will hire people irrespective of gender. Of course children below the ages of 15 and people above 38 will not be allowed to carry or distribute the goods. They can only work on the fields for health and safety reasons. Everyone nodded in agreement. After all, it would be difficult for the elderly or very young boys or girls to carry those heavy bags of food. This food industry will have Lyo as the overseer for all farming activities. Pat will supervise how to work as plant and care for the soil, while Waldo will supervise how much yields we make and the storage of the goods. Bait will be in charge of 150 people, while Waldo will take on 100 people. Again, they all thought that was reasonable. At the end of the day, Storage of all goods is to be kept in the second estate on the left of the fields, and the amount recorded. Also, 
Waldo it would be your job to distribute the goods to the local stores in the central region. We will set reasonable prices for all food items, so everyone can buy them. Ten wagons will be assigned to the farming industry. Use the wagons to send the yields to the estate and the stores in the central region. Yes my king, Waldo replied proudly. There will be also five cooks and twenty guards assigned for protecting you all in the fields. You all will also have your lunch breaks in the estate as well. They were all happy that at least they had a place close by to get food. One needed to know that there was quite a good amount of distance between the farmlands and the central region of Baymard. Finally, everyone will receive their salaries from Lior at the end of each month. All workers would earn 400 copper coins, supervisors get 500 copper coins and the overseer gets 600 copper coins. Of course your meals will be taken out of your salaries. It would cost five copper coins a plate. Once more, they were truly shocked. All farmers in the empire were paid a measly 250 copper coins per month, but His Highness gave them so much more. They were beaming with joy and really felt grateful towards him. They swore in their hearts that they would work twice as hard and make the best of their new lives. Over the past few weeks, They've been hearing some of the miners brag about how grateful they were to His Highness. He gave them food, jobs and made them feel safe and cared for. They felt like they would hold their heads up high once again. So what if he wasn't favored in the empire? He was kind and very trustworthy towards all of them. In fact, some people even thought that Landon was the reincarnation of a god sent to help Baymard grow. Landon looked at their happy faces and smiled. Now, let me show walk you all to the estate that would represent the future food industry. Once they arrived the second estate, Landon showed them around while explaining how the estate would be used. He told them about his future plans so they would know that they were going to share the estate with others soon, although they didn't understand half of his plans, they believed in him, hence they didn't mind sharing with others, this was a man who solved the barren soil issue as if it was nothing dot 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 what more could they say, he was working his hardest to make sure that they had food in their bellies, Landon planned to make a section for fishing production of can foods and so on dot dot but that would be in the future. Hence he needed them to understand that they share this estate with others. He allocated some buildings to the farming department and told them to store foods in different rooms depending on the food types. He also showed them all the seeds he originally found in the estate and asked them to plant some more crops. He would need to get the rest of the seeds he found on the other estates over here later. He thought Lior had agreed that in three days time, he would gather 250 men to work for the farming industry. Landon could only wait. Chapter 18 Cooking Once Landon went to his room, he decided to look at his reward for completing his first mission. System, show me my stat and rewards. Host name, Landon Barn. Age, 15. Status. King of Baymard. Level, beginner level 1. Current situation, healthy. Fixing barren lands and mapping territory with the help of the system completed. Rewards, knowledge on gunpowder and cannon making. Host will also receive 100 development points. Overall points, 100 development points DP. A pop of message showed up when he was done reading the information on his screen. Receive rewards. Yes or no? Landon accepted it and immediately felt a surge of information flowing into his brain. After using 30 minutes to digest the large amount of information from the system, he decided to view his next mission. Mission, how can you protect your technology, if your kingdom defenses are so weak? Use your newly acquired rewards to create and test warfare cannons for the protection of your kingdom. Rewards. Will your people keep living in thatched and mud houses? As the future kingdom for technological advancement, it's very humiliating. Hence, host will receive all knowledge on cement manufacturing. Host will also receive 20 godly food recipes and 5 spice making recipes. In the future, if host needs to create toasters, microwaves, ovens and so on, your people should know why they need them in their everyday lives. Hence they need to appreciate these various cooking appliances, so as to create new ways of cooking and satisfy their palates. Lastly, 
host will also receive 250 development points DP and 1000 technology points DP. Deadline, no specific time required. Landon looked at the mission and was completely baffled. The rewards for the new mission left him stunned. It's not that he had a problem with cooking. But when anyone is asked about technology, they would think about A.I systems, laptops, cars and so on. No one would ever mention anything about cooking. But now that he thought about it, if he could come up with different spices and dishes, people would want to eat them every day. Hence they would really appreciate cooking appliances like frying pans, ovens, grills and so on. So in a sense, it was still a technological improvement in this era. After all, people want things that make their lives better and easier. Making them learn how to cook these godly recipes with their crude cooking methods, will make their palates satisfied. But once things like frying pans, microwaves, toasters, ovens and so on come out, they'll see how crude their cooking methods were and understand the importance of technology. They'll see how using these appliances can save time cook efficiently and open new doors in the cooking industry. More importantly, those appliances would be available to all. Not just royalty or large households. Peasants would be accessible to them, and sooner or later, they'll see these appliances as essential needs for everyday living. For a moment, Landon thought this system was actually trying to brainwash people. I mean, he loved technology and all and he saw its importance dot 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 but why couldn't he create these cooking equipments first before introducing these godly dishes the system wanted these people to crave for the dishes the more they craved the more they'd try cooking them over and over again by doing so they would spend lengthy amounts of time cooking a single dish and when landon makes cooking appliances that reduced the amount of time to used in cooking they'd be hooked on them for good. The system just wanted people to practically worship technology. At this point Landon wouldn't be surprised if in the future, a technology church popped up as a religion. In fact Landon observed that the people didn't really know about deep frying methods. They knew about frying food, but these fried dishes were only served in the palace and top class restaurants or large households. Even the way they fried was terrible. It was like they were so afraid to fry anything else other than rice, eggs and meat. Landon thought this era was somewhat equivalent to the 10th century medieval times back on earth. He just couldn't understand why they couldn't even fry vegetables or something else. What baffled Landon was that fish was often boiled, baked or roasted but never fried. I mean, if you could fry meat. Why couldn't you fry fish? What kind of logic was that? But he knew that he also couldn't entirely blame them too. Dot dot dot. After all, frying only became popular 60 years ago in the Empire. Landon's late grandfather, who he never met, had gone on a sea voyage to one of the empires in Bino, called Tariq. He had tasted the fried meat there and instantly fell in love with the taste. He later sent a group of chefs to learn about frying from them. These chefs returned after six months and taught the different chefs in the capital of Arcadina. As time went by, these practices spread out to other chefs, but majority of the chefs never experimented beyond what they learned. Landon guessed that the few popular chefs who did experiment, failed when trying to fry vegetables fish and other foods. So they concluded that these foods couldn't be fried. They probably fried them using the amount of time needed to fry meat as a basis. For sure, the results were catastrophic. The foods were burnt to a crisp. The more he thought about it, the more he changed his mind. It's not that they didn't understand logic, it was just that they were ignorant. After all seeing is believing. Back on earth, people believed that the world was flat until someone proved them wrong. They also believed that someone with a dying heart couldn't be saved, until some performed the first heart transplant in the world. If someone told Landon they could breathe in space, he would tell them to prove it first before he believed in them. Humans believe what they see. So when those chefs failed in experimenting with frying, they only said what they saw and believed. After all back on earth, 
it was only until the 13th century before people knew other foods could be fried, and only until the 16th century before people knew manure was good for crops. Unless you provide substantial evidence to support your claim, no one would believe you. Coming back to cooking, most people just roasted or boiled food over the fire for long periods of time. Then they would add various leaves honey and salt as spices. Land and thought grills were an absolute must as well as fridges. Some people didn't even use salt because salt was very expensive. Some of the cooking appliances in this era are not practical for everyday use. Their pots didn't have handles and were unnecessarily large. They looked like a witch's cauldron in those fantasy movies. The only thing that Landon found okay, was their baking methods. They could make sweet delicious pastries pies and various types of puddings. Their ovens were used in baking and also used in making mud bricks. They were really expensive for peasants to use. So he already decided to make ovens that ran on electricity like those found on earth. Most ovens only existed in large households and bakeries. In larger and flourishing cities, it was common for a community to have a shared ownership of an oven to ensure that bread making was accessible to everyone rather than private individuals. Ah dot 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 I have a long way to go dot 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 I see why I need those dishes dot 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 I wonder when I'll be able to eat pizza again. Landon thought as signed helplessly when he thought about the backwardness of this era. Just thinking about how much work he had to do in the future, gave him a minor headache. Why couldn't he transmigrate into an era which was close to the 18th century on earth or more? Truly tragic. Landon decided to sleep early, as he had to give the knights their first military test in the morning. Chapter 19 Mock Exams Part 1 In the early hours of the morning 4a.m. A large group of knights could be seen making their way towards the lower regions, in lines of three. Looking at them, Landon couldn't believe how much they had improved by. Their muscles were bulging and they had much more discipline and strength compared to their previous appearances. They all had upright postures, sturdy physiques and unfaltering determination. Little Momo was the only one that didn't have that robust physique, after all he was still a child. Nonetheless, he had all the other qualities instilled into him, so he wasn't very lacking as a soldier. He seemed more mature and had looked very confident for his age. As the group moved, their footsteps were so light that one would think they were assassins and not knights. Landon had taught them the importance of camouflage and giving the enemy the element of surprise. In this era, knights fought proudly and with honor liked to show off their flashy moves to prove that they were powerful. They thought sneaking around was an act of cowardice and showed lack of strength. But Landon disagreed. In war, finding the easiest and safest way to eliminate your opponent while protecting your comrades, showed true strength. The less casualties produced, the better. In fact, Landon had taught them how to set up booby traps and come up with different war strategies. He especially taught them how to knock someone out by hitting all their pressure points, especially the back of their necks. Since swords weren't allowed in the first phase of the exams, they would have to use their hands and their brains. Hence, he taught them basic martial arts and self-defense tactics. Two weeks prior to the military exam, Landon had located three mini hills that were far away from the farmlands or any of the estates. Each hill was surrounded by trees and a lot of bushes, making it perfect for camouflage and traps. Some parts even had sand pits, while others had little streams that obviously led to the sea. It was perfect. Landon had given each team a mini hill as their base and told them to build their own base wooden sheds and booby traps for the upcoming exam. Although he didn't tell them the nature of the exam, they immediately understood that each team would face each other in the upcoming exams. So they started preparing for the exam. Once they arrived, Landon looked at the men lined up in rows of three and was very pleased. They now looked and acted like the soldiers back on earth. There will be two phases for the exam. Phase one will include strategy and enemy infiltration while phase two will be on swordsmanship. Today we will only focus on phase one, while tomorrow will be on phase two inches, Landon said. While he spoke Commander Lucius and Butler Nathan placed boxes in front of each team. The boxes in front of you contain each team's headband, 
ropes and flags. Josh's team will wear the red headbands, Mark's team would use the yellow headbands and Gary's team will use the purple headbands. There are also 50 pieces of rope in each box for tying up prisoners. Each team should have 5 flags that have the same color as the team's headbands. Dot 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 your headbands can be worn on your heads, wrists, arms and even on your legs. Dot 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 wear them anyway yard like dot 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 now. Put on your headbands. The team captains quickly carried their boxes and distributed each headpiece swiftly. Landon was impressed. The men didn't break up their lines and just waited for their team captains to give them the headbands. Some put them on their legs, others on their waist, arms, and so on. No one put them on their heads. Landon smirked. They were smart. These so called headbands were just pieces of clothes cut from very old peasant clothes. Once Landon saw that they were done, he continued. Tonight each team should come up with its offensive and defensive sides. Your goal is to gather at least one enemy flag or at least 50 enemy headbands. I will not give any advice or aid on how to hide your flags or engage in this battle. Do you all understand? They hurriedly gave a military salute and yelled out, Sir, yes sir. Good. During the battle, Commander Lucius and myself will be moving between each camps to observe you all from the shadows. And at the end of the exam, everyone will all be graded. Lannan replied. Once they heard what Landon said, they were filled with more determination to prove themselves. Here are the rules for the battle. The use of weapons like swords or blades is prohibited. Only martial arts or self-defense tactics can be used to disarm your enemies. Finally, knocking your enemies out is also not allowed. They all listened carefully as they didn't want to miss any major details. Those who lose their headbands will be considered as dead. If you are captured and your headband is taken from you, you are considered dead. If you lose your headband by accident, you will also be considered as dead. Once dead, you cannot and should not continue with the battle. Aiding your team after pronounced dead is a serious crime in today's battle. He looked at them and released a cold aura which made their spines shiver. Anyone who disobeys these rules will get a month worth of intense punishment at the end of the exam. You will also not rank up as a soldier for the time being. Hence do not disobey orders. After all, dead men tell no tales and should not affect the battle in any way. Everyone felt as if the headbands given to them, had the same worth as a mountain of gold. They secretly asked themselves whether the position they placed the headbands were secure enough and well hidden from their enemies. One more thing, the duration of the exam is two hours. Once the time is up, even if the you haven't succeeded in the exam, you are all to assemble back here immediately. Failure to do so will also result in a weak punishment for all soldiers, irrespective of what team you belong to. They were shocked. So if someone in another team was late, then they too would get punished. In fact Landon did this to ensure teamwork with his knights. He wanted all of them to be their brother's keepers, or so to speak. Good luck men. Your exam starts now, Landon said. Chapter 20 Mock Exams Part 2 Josh's Camp Josh looked at his men whom he had successfully divided into groups of five. The first group had 12 men, the second had 36 men, the third had 20 men, the fourth had 16 and the fifth had 15 men. Group 1 will constantly scout the perimeter of the base. There should be at least three people stationed at each checkpoint. If an enemy approaches, one person should rush back to alert us, another trails them quietly from the shadows, and the last should always stay on guard at the checkpoint, in case other enemies approach again. Remember, unless necessary, do not attack them. Just observe quietly. Do you understand? Yes, Captain, they replied swiftly. When they were building traps, they also built hidden bases and covered them with mud, leaves, grass, and sticks so they could spy on their enemies without being seen. Group 2 will focus on infiltrating our enemy camps. Since you are 36 in number, 18 men will infiltrate Gary's camp, while the other half will infiltrate Mark's camp. From the 18, divide yourselves into 6 groups and infiltrate the camp from all entrances. Once your position has been compromised, 
escape and return to the base carefully. Yes Captain Group 2 replied. Group 3 will be stationed at all trap positions. Each trap should have three people guarding them. Once the enemy falls into the trap, secure their headbands and take them as prisoners or free them. Once the prisoners and their headbands are secured, one person should rush back give little Momo the headbands. Once given, return to your positions by the traps. The other two should redo the traps and wait for another enemy encounter. Yes Captain Group 3 replied. Group 4 will be in charge of guarding four of the flags, I will keep one with me of course, spread yourselves around the hill in groups of four and protect the flags. Remember choose a location that wouldn't give off your position to the enemy easily. Yes Captain. They also replied. Finally, Group 5 will have three subgroups in charge of, guarding our main base, protecting Little Momo and protecting myself. Remember Little Momo is the one who will have all the enemy headbands in his position. If another enemy steals all the headbands we worked hard to get, then we will lose this battle. Although I'm confident in my own skills as a knight captain, we must plan for the unexpected. Hence, since I have one flag as well, it is your duty and responsibility to protect me. Yes Captain, Group 4 replied. Outskirts of Gary's Hill. A group of soldiers hid quietly in the bushes and trees, carefully waiting for their preys to move closer towards them. They had planned to ambush their enemies. They had painted their faces, necks and hands with mud and had stuck tree branches, leaves and grass all over their hair. It was clear that they had tried as much as possible to remove any and all shine from their skins. It would be extremely hard for anyone to spot them with this kind of army camouflage. Barry Jacks was one of these soldiers. He stood at the back of a tree, waiting for his prey to get closer, while holding trees branches as part of his camouflage. There were a total of four people walking into their territory. Once the enemy was close enough, Barry and his team moved out quickly. Barry arrived behind one of the men, and sharply pressed his fingers behind the man's ear, into the pit between the jaw and the neck. This region was the parotid lymph node. He then gripped of the ear in a fist, and dashed the lobe from bottom up, twisting the ear up towards himself. The soldier whose ear was gripped, felt his entire body go numb dot 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 and he subconsciously fell on his knees in defeat. Barry swiftly took off the soldier's headband and used his rope to tie the soldier as a prisoner. By the time his team was done, they escorted the captured soldiers to the outskirts of their base. They figured that since the soldiers were now dead, they would not be able to interfere with their camp anymore. Hence they freed them and returned to their main base. As Landon watched through the monitors of the system, he took a mental note of Barry and his team, especially Barry, when the enemies came. He was the one who signaled the men to attack. If Barry had been a few seconds late, this ambush would have been a complete failure. Even Barry's quickness and decisiveness when dealing with his enemies was remarkable. The others in his team were good, but Barry was a natural. It was like he was born to be an assassin. Landon was pleased. Josh's camp. As Thray and his team left Mark's camp, they decided to first observe the perimeter of Josh's camp. They knew that like all their Captain Mark, Captain Josh would also station people around the perimeter. The team looked at the trees carefully, but didn't see anyone on them, so they ruled out the possibility of Josh's men using tree huts like they did. In their own camp, Mark had made camouflage tree huts with mud grass and leaves on top of the trees. Just as they were about move into Josh's territory, Terry spotted a heap of dried grass, leaves and twigs that looked suspicious. The only reason Terry noticed it was because the grass seemed to be growing in the wrong direction, compared to the surrounding grass. What do you guys think of that heap over there? Terry asked. It looks normal to me. Dot 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 dot. Do you think there's something weird about it? One of his teammates asked. I think their knights are hiding in there. Terry responded while nodded. The other three were shocked. Dot dot dot. The heap is really small. How can anyone be under there? Only a child could fit there, all right. Dot. Terry wasn't sure if his hunch was right, but it wouldn't hurt to double check. I'm guessing that they dug out holes there jumped into them and placed the grass and leaves on their heads while waiting for enemies. Dot 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 dot. Once the enemies passed through the checkpoint, 
they would get out of those holes and report what they saw to Captain Josh. Dot, 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 I have a plan. Chapter 21 Mock Exams Part 3 Terry and his team walked in casually pretending to not be aware of the hidden knights in hiding. Once they were out of view from the heap on the ground, they hid in the bushes and waited to confirm their speculations. As expected, after three minutes dot 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 two knights jumped up from the ground. One went towards the left, while the other towards their direction. Terry signaled for two of his men to capture the other knight, while the rest focused on the, the approaching knight. Once the knight passed their hiding spot, Terry quickly arrived behind the knight and covered the knight's mouth with his hand. While his teammate quickly weakened his pressure points and took off the knight's headband from his arm. Now you are considered dead. Remember dead men tell no tales. So once I take my hands off your mouth, you cannot speak or scream dot 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 understand? The soldier nodded understandably. After all, what could he do? He was just a corpse now. They decided to check if there was any other person in that hole. They couldn't ask the captured knight because he was already considered dead. Terry decided to go for a surprise attack by jumping into the hole and taking out his enemy. Once in the hole. The young knight was shocked for a while before trying to defend himself. They battled in the hole for two minutes, before Terry found an opportunity to secure the knight's headband. It wasn't that the knight was weak or anything. In fact, from a spectator's point of view, they were evenly matched in strength. The only reason why Terry won was due to the fact that he had way experienced in combat and battle than his opponent. Just as he was done. His other teammates brought back the headband from that night that went towards the left. With just three headbands, they decided to continue until they got at least ten more. A while after they left, Lucius came out from his spot of hiding. He told the dead knights to go towards the meeting ground and wait there until the exams were done. Terry my boy, your biggest asset is your brain. This boy is already smart and observant enough to access his enemy's potentials. Combined with his fighting prowess, in the future he will be a powerful force to behold. Lucius thought, Mark's territory. A group of knights were silently following their prey while waiting for an opportunity to seize their enemy's flag. At the start, they thought that these soldiers were looking for people to hunt down, so they decided to lay low for now. But after following for a while, they noticed that their soldiers were not hunting but hiding. This only meant that they had their camp's flag with them and didn't want to get caught. There were four enemy knights in total, but his team only had three members. They needed to act real quick to accomplish their task. Although it was risky, they were all willing to take that risk. One of these soldiers was Billy Vane, who was a knight under Captain Josh. He was the shy knight that gave Landon a smart suggestion during the city's inspection a while ago. But now, he was beaming with confidence. The enemies located a good hideout and decided to stay there for a while. Just as they were about to lay low, Billy's team appeared swiftly. Billy quickly numbed the first knight by hitting his pressure points and took his headband. By the time he was done another enemy came towards him. This one was strong, a began seriously fighting while observing his other two teammates from the corners of his eyes. His teammates had been a little slower in attacking their enemies. Hence the element of surprise didn't go too well as they planned. Everyone was fighting seriously trying to snatch each other's headbands. Billy had been thinking of how to get close enough to snatch his opponent's headband tied around his neck, when all of a sudden he realized that his teammate was about to be killed headband taken off. He hurriedly kicked his opponent and successfully helped his teammate in the nick of time. His teammate used the opportunity to quickly take the headband, while Billy returned to fighting the knight he fiercely kicked. His teammate who he had just helped decided to assist the other teammate who also had trouble finishing the job. Billy fought for seven minutes before successfully taking the headband from his opponent. He looked at his opponent and said, You're good, I'm honored to have fought with you this time. I was just lucky to have won this time around, thank you. Billy said while smiling. His opponent smiled back but didn't say anything. After all he was dead. What could a dead man say? Once Billy and his team were done, they decided to quickly leave and head back to Josh's camp. Walking around with the enemy's flag was also too risky. As Landon observed more, 
He was shocked at Billy's transformation. Wasn't this the boy who had once looked like a cute pop star? Now his body looked like a sexy Gong Yu. Even his shy attitude and aura had been replaced by a serious and manly one. Landon really admired Billy's courage and fearless attitude. Although it was risky for their three-man group to go against four enemies. They still took the chance, and when Berry saw the helpless situation his teammates were in, he didn't even hesitate to help them out. He was loyal and hardworking. Such a man could even die for his comrades in war. Although it was admirable, Landon didn't like them taking such risks as sacrificing their lives easily. What he wanted was for them to think various ways of rescuing their teammates and themselves safely. If the chances of a soldier making it back was less than 70%, Landon didn't want them to take on the jobs. Like he said it was admirable, but too risky. Take for example, if the Empire was to send thousands of troops right now to kill him, his people and retainers, he would try to find a way to secure everyone's safety by letting them escape. What was the point of fighting to the death with no power? Landon firmly believed in the live today to fight tomorrow philosophy. Just because one couldn't fight his enemies today didn't mean they would never crush them in the future. As for Landon L, the only thing he needed was time and the system's help to avert all crises coming his way. And when he was ready, he would find out who poisoned this daddy here. Oh yes dot 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 he was still pissed about the poisoning that took place when he first got here. Although he was cured, he was still a very petty person. If you were good to him, he would give you the world. But if you looked for his trouble, he would kill you a million times over. He was a very 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 petty man, and he was aware of that flaw. Chapter 22 Mock Exams Part 4 Before everyone knew it, time was up. They had been constantly battling, observing and capturing their opponents for two whole hours. Everyone assembled in straight rows of three behind their captains. No one was late. Landon had put two bags in front of each team captain. One bag was used to collect all headbands from their surviving team members, while the other, was used to collect enemy headbands and flags. Once collected, Landon counted everything in front of everyone so that they could know how they did as a team so far. Josh's team had collected two flags and 19 headbands, Mark's team had one flag and 25 headbands, while Gary's team also had one flag and 27 headbands. Their results were overall the same in Landon's eyes. Although Josh had the lowest amount of headbands, he had obtained two flags, while Gary and Mark were similar in their scores too. Everyone had successfully passed as a team in this exam. Once the soldiers heard their results, they were so happy that they almost cried. One had to know that this was the hardest exam in their lives. Most of them lacked battle experience and weren't all that familiar with battle tactics. But they persevered through and all their hard work bore fruit. They themselves had seen the changes in the bodies and their ways of thinking. They regarded each other as family, and for the first time had a deep sense of brotherhood. Now that they thought about it, most knights in the capital were very selfish, only thinking about how to get more power and wealth. If you were not strong you would be trampled on and even ridiculed there. But here in Baymard, they had a new understanding of how life should be. The strong should always protect and provide for the weak. No matter how poor people are, it was not enough reason for anyone to treat them like trash. Now was just 6.30 a.m. which was too early for their normal training sessions to end. So they knew that there was more to the exam than this. Since we time on our hands. We will move on to the next stage for today's exam. You can what you just did as phase 1 part A while this one will be phase 1 part B. Landon said, I need you all to form groups of 6 which will include 2 knights from each team. The last test showed how well you performed in your captain's team, but now I need you to work well with other knights under other captains. Remember we are all people of Baymard. No one is more superior or inferior to the other. There is always room for improvement, so keep working hard. Landon continued. The men thought what Landon said was right. They were all for Baymard. It didn't matter which captain they were under. 
provided they did their best for Baymard. Now dot 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 form groups of six as required. Of course the captains will be grouped together separately from you all. They hurriedly form their groups and waited for further instructions. Over the last weeks, I have been training you all on how to use simple tools with your own bare strength and then using them to climb hills and cliffs. By using your bare hands, you all have improved your physical stamina, flexibility, mental strength, muscle coordination, muscle strength and a sense of judgment for adaptability. Some of you have even conquered your fear of heights and death. Landon looked at his men who were beaming with pride and confidence and felt a sense of accomplishment within him. A few days ago, he had paid some villagers had to assist him in building the exam set. For this test, Landon had set it up almost like the military drill sessions back on earth. You all follow me and I will show you where your next exam will be held, Landon said. Once they arrived, seeing what was in front of them, they were confused about how the test would progress. For each team, Landon had put five stacks of wood separated by a very short distance. Only six people could jump over one stack at a time he had used trees for this test after all. The soldiers were all expected to jump over these wood stacks without touching them. The next drill was the tire drill exercise back on earth. Soldiers would hop in several car tires while trying not to fall. Since there were no tires in this era, he made circular molds with mud, leaves, grass and twigs. Olds were required to hop through 20 tires without falling before going to the next exercise. He later built a five-row wooden jumping bar over some muddy water which had dried out now but it made the ground look mushy for each team. The goal was for the soldiers to cross the muddy water by using the hanging wooden bars he built, without touching the ground, followed by a large wall made of net, hanging over the side of a 10 feet, sturdy and old tree. The men would run up to the wall, climb and slide down the tree like a pole and move on. They would later crawl under several nets, that were pinned very close to the ground, and finally, they would have to rock climb the cliff at the side of the mountain to get to the top. Once on the cliff top, they would meet Commander Lucius, get a block of wood from him and rush back to present it back to London. Mission complete. For your test, Baymard is at war and the only way to save it from extinction is to retrieve something very important from Commander Lucius and bring it back to this king. Your task is to pass through all the obstacles, get the item and successfully retrieve it without damaging it. Landon looked at his excited men and continued. But there's something very important to note. When doing rock climbing, each team will only be given eight ropes to use. You are to secure your rope as well as your teammates before proceeding to climb. Commander Lucius will not give you the item if you are one teammate short. If one person isn't there, you all fail. Everyone finally understood that they seriously needed to work well as a team. Also, going to Commander Lucius and coming back should only take 15 minutes. Once the time is up, your exam will end. They were all worried now whether they could do it or not. As Landon looked at their worried faces, he decided to boost their confidence by letting their captains demonstrate it for them. In fact, once Landon finished building all the obstacle courses, he had showed Lysias and the captains how to perform the drills. At first they were slow, but now they were prows. After all, they didn't want to let the soldiers see them fail as captains, so they trained extra hard for this. As you can see there are five sets of obstacle courses in front of you. There are three net walls available for all to use, remember that. The only other thing you all share is the cliff. So five teams will perform at once. Now we'll let you see how it's done by letting your captains work as a team for this test. As the men watched their captains work together very fast. They were amazed and looked at them with worshipping gazes. The speed at which their captains climbed the cliffs together amazed them, as they knew that they themselves couldn't be that fast as of now. But nonetheless, they were now confident that the test was within their capabilities. When their captains returned, everyone clapped and said various honest heartfelt praises. Now dot 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 the first five teams. Step up and begin. The exam starts. Chapter 23 Mock Exam Part 5 Joseph Fig was very anxious and nervous as he watched the exam progress from the sides. He observed that some knights had their legs tangled up on the rope wall, 
while others couldn't jump swiftly over the stacks of wood present. Most people fell when they had to jump through the circular stacks of dry muddy leaves, and few people were slow when doing rock climbing. Their king had taught them how to make decisive decisions on where to place their hands when rock climbing. He also noted that for some people, by the time they reached the cliff top, Landon would say their time was up. Others had collected the item from Lucius and on their way back to Landon, their time was up as well. Some people also damaged the item on their way back by dropping it in the mud, or letting it fall from the top to the bottom of the cliff. This was also a fail to their king. Their king said the only thing he would allow to damage the item was blood. Carelessness with important items or even state documents could lead to exposure and worsen your position with your opponent. If you get the item, one must secure it before proceeding to return. But surprisingly, what Joseph was worried about was cliff climbing. When he climbed before, he was confident because he was alone on his rope. But now, other people might depend on him to climb up the cliff. Their security and lives were somewhat in his hands. Their king had told them that in a military war campaign, when a rock wall cliff or mountainside, was visible any time, many people would choose to go around it, Joseph concluded, this was the first time he had ever heard of a need to know how to scale hills, cliffs or mountains, no one had thought of this idea, but Joseph could see the wisdom in it, no enemy would imagine that someone would willingly climb a cliff just to attack them so they would leave that edge unsupervised, giving room for them to invasion to occur, and if you were not fast enough when climbing a cliff, the enemy might discover you and throw boulders down on you instantly crushing you, as their king always says you need to be swift as an assassin in war, Joseph decided to do his best and toughen up for the glory of Baymard and his majesty, as well as improve himself, even if he didn't complete the exam. He needed to be confident in carrying his teammates through. And Joseph was right. Although time was important in this drill, Landon's primary objective was on teamwork. He needed each night to feel the responsibility given to them in a team. They couldn't act selfishly and they needed to make wise decisions that benefit the entire team as a whole. When Joseph and his team ran towards the bottom of the cliff, Joseph took one end of the rope knotted it around his waist and passed the other end of the rope to his next teammate, this was of course for safety measures, Joseph realized that he was the safety climber lead climber of the group, while the others were supporting climbers behind him, Joseph took another rope, tied it around his legs and butt as a harness and knotted both ends of the rope with the other team rope around his waist, his teammates did the same thing as well, of course his highness had said that each person must always have a dagger when climbing up a cliff or rock wall, one end of a new rope should always be tied to the dagger and the other end to the climber's waist rope, once they reach a dangerous height, the lead climber was to pierce the soil and rock cracks deeply as support and climb up the cliff, in this way, if all of them slip, the rope attached to the deeply pierced knife will save them, Joseph looked the tall cliff in front of him and decided to start climbing it, he looked at a vine in front of him and hesitated whether or not it would be wise to grab it now, when he did, nothing happened and he immediately became happy in knowing that he made the right choice for his team, as they progressed up the hill, suddenly dot 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 g r r r r r r r r r r r p dot 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 joseph felt a tug on his team waist rope and looked down he immediately saw one of his teammates dangling helplessly from the team rope his teammate had slipped joseph thought fast use your dagger to stabilize yourself by stabbing it into soil and climbing back to your position we will wait for you don't worry Joseph said with a smile, the knight smiled bitterly with his face filled with guilt, he looked like he was about to give up, it doesn't matter if we don't make it in 15 minutes, what matters is that we work hard together and better our skills, you were the best at the other obstacle activities, so what if you're slow in this one now, with his highness help we will become professionals in no time, preserver and don't give up easily, Joseph encouraged while smiling with confidence, yeah he's right, cheer up, I myself almost slip, the two, we are all learning, are we not, no one is as good as our captains now, so don't worry, push on, said another knight smilingly, the knight looked at Joseph and the rest, 
and smiled more confidently as if he just had an enlightenment. Thank you all, he replied, as Landon, the captains and Lucius heard them. They all smiled and nodded as if acknowledging what was said. It was the main point they were trying to drive home today. Likewise, as the other knights heard this, they also had a stroke of epiphany and finally you understood what the real goal was for this exercise. Once Joseph and his team reached the top of the cliff, their time was up. Although they had failed in the aspect of time, they had passed regarding their teamwork. They held their heads high and didn't feel down at all. In their minds they were thinking of how to improve themselves more over time. In fact all the knights didn't get discouraged but aspired to improve and become as tough as their captains. Once they were all done with the test, everyone went on with their daily duties excitedly in anticipation for the last exam. Tomorrow was the last day for this hellish exam. Would it be a normal sword fighting competition? Or something else? This question made them ponder deeply the entire day. Z snore and finally everyone went to bed with anxious smiles on their faces and a sense of accomplishment in their hearts. They felt strong and confident. Chapter 24 Mock Exams Part 6 Final The next day, the soldiers had gathered at the training courtyard in the castle. Today was the last day for the exams. Those who were proclaimed dead yesterday felt like they had to do exceptionally well in today's test. They were so anxious such that they were literally shaking unknowingly. For them, they had let their commander, captains, teammates and his highness down. This alone was enough for them to want to prove their worths. Landon looked at his men and smiled. Today. Commander Lucius and I will test your swordsmanship skills. We will be looking at your reaction time, flexibility, prowess and fighting tactics. Each person will be given four sandbags weighing four kilograms each and a fifteen kilograms sandbag to carry on your backs. You are to fight each either Commander Lucius or myself for five minutes, while wearing these weights. Two matches going on at the same time. Commander Lucius will fight in one match, while I, the other. Landon knew that Lucius could last for two hours straight without even taking a break when wielding his sword. Lucius was a war veteran. To get the his position, one needed to have slaughtered a lot of enemies in the battlefield. In some war cases, Lucius had to fight for four hours straight before the war ended. Others lasted for two hours while some for three hours. Breathing exercises were very popular for knights. In the battlefield, one needed a lot of stamina and momentum to push on. Landon knew that at the end of every match, it would take one minute for the knight to leave and a new one to come on stage. For veteran knights, that one minute was perfect for breathing exercises and gathering momentum for the next opponent. Although Landon knew this, he still didn't want to burden Lucius that much. As for Landon he knew that he couldn't last for more than an hour without getting tired, so he asked the system for help. System dot 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 do you have energy boosters that I could use? Answering host, this system has everything, even instant ramen noodles. Therefore, system will have energy boosters. One shot of energy from the system can last for one hour only and costs either three development points, five technology points or one bonus points. This energy shot revitalizes one energy level, bringing one's body to maximum energy conditions. All traces of fatigue and pain will disappear from the user. Does host want to use his development points towards this? The system asked. System. Can I use this shot on anyone other than myself? Yes you can host. Good dot 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 after every hour, give Captain Lucius and myself energy shots. So for four hours we will need three shots each. In total, six shots will be used. Right system. That is correct host dot 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 in total the host will use up 18 development points for the hourly energy shots. Landon nodded and was pleased. He also decided to get some for Lucius, because although he knew that, although Lucius could really last long, he wanted Lucius to fight the young knights in his best conditions. Others should not fight Lucius when he was tired as that will also not be fair to the knights who fought him in his best condition previously. The reason for the weights is to see how the men could fight in different scenarios. When facing an enemy, 
you might have to fight when carrying heavy items or even rescued civilians on your back. What if you were carrying an unconscious princess and the minute you put her down, someone sneaks attacks you and kill her. Besides you might need to escape while fighting and carrying heavy items in your hand or a person on your back. Adaptability is key. It is also important to note that your enemy might not carry any extra items or persons when attacking you so they would be free and weightless compared to you. Hence Landon insisted that they fought with these weights on. Landon realized that most of the young knights couldn't fight well when carrying weights on their backs and legs. Surprisingly, the weights on their hands didn't disturb them all that much from wielding their swords. The problem was that they didn't know how to balance their center of gravity when fighting with these weights. So most of the time, they would fall down trip or even accidentally drop their swords. They were struggling to adjust themselves, but in battle, the enemy will not give you the time to adjust. Looking at his men, Landon decided that he would start training them regularly with weights. After one hour of battling, Lucius was surprised that he didn't feel tired at all. He assumed it was because of the breathing exercises he did during the battles. Lucius looked at Landon and was deeply impressed. He had assumed that the young lord would get weak after an hour of multiple intense battles. He decided to see how long Landon could last before opting for a break from the exams. Two hours went by and even three hours had gone by. Yet Landon didn't even break a sweat. Although Lucius found it oddly strange that he wasn't tired, he now regarded Landon as a monster for wielding a sword so long. In fact Lucius wasn't the only one thinking that. The young knights all thought Landon was not human. Lucius they understood, but Landon who had never gone to war before could last this long. They were all impressed by their king. Once the exam was over. Landon informed the knights that they would get their results and rewards tomorrow morning before their regular training sessions. After having breakfast, Landon made up his mind to check on the farmlands and mines today. As he was walking out of the upper region with Terry, one of Tim's apprentices rushing over. Good day your highness, all the slate boards and chalk boards requested have been successful made. Paul said while bowing, his head at Landon, raise your head Paul. This is wonderful news, let's go see your master first shall we? Yes your highness. Chapter 25 Starting the mission Good day your highness, all your orders have been completed and are ready to go. If I must say your highness, these chalkboards and that strange white stone you call chalk are simply genius. Tim said while gazing at Landon with eyes filled with worship and adoration. Landon chuckled. Don't get too excited Tim. In the future we will create more marvelous products in Baymard. After all, although the idea was mine, you and your apprentices did all the actual work. So you all deserve most of the credit. No 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 your highness, a true man doesn't take credit for what he did not do. Tim said while shaking his head. Landon could only look at him helplessly. In fact, as time went by dot 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 Tim had come to know of all the brilliant ideas and things his highness had done in Baymard, from making the land bear food, to producing chalk and so on. How could a fifteen year old have such profound knowledge? In his eyes, Landon had already become a wise sage who knew how to solve every problem in the world. Tim, are you and your apprentices literate? Landon asked. Yes your highness, I taught them how to read right and do math. Tom answered confusedly. In the future, I would like you to teach more people about cape entry and construction. Would you be able to do that? Tim thought for a while and finally replied. I would your highness, but my workshop is too small to accommodate a lot of people here. Tim said while looking around his messy workshop. Don't worry about that for now. Dot 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 Tim. I want to open a school for everyone in Baymard. Once people know how to read and write, I want you to pick two of your apprentices or yourself, to teach them about cape entry and construction later on. You don't need to worry about anything else. I will give you an entire estate in the lower region consisting of 18 buildings for your new workshops. Tim was shocked.
fact, isn't an entire estate too big for just a tiny workshop? What is his highness planning? Dot 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 Landon looked at him and instantly knew what he was worried about. These buildings will be able to allow over 2,000 people to work in them at once. I will put you in charge of these buildings and all construction projects in Baymard. Although we don't have a lot of people now. Very soon this place will be filled with people. Tim finally understood where Landon was driving at. Plus in the future, I will also teach you new never before seen techniques for welding, constructing materials or buildings and creation of new devices and equipments. You will be the first person in the entire empire to use these techniques. As for the new equipments. They will mostly be made from iron. Of course you and all villagers under you will get paid for your services monthly. The more Tim heard, the more excited he became. Right now, he hardly had any customers who in his workshop, his customers over the years, were the barons and the city lord. They paid him a fair price for all his works, and he was content with the amount. The only reason he cared about the money was to feed his apprentices and himself as well as help some villagers here and there. When he had excess money, he would drive a cart to the next village, buy food and share with some villagers of Baymard. But now, he had the chance to let the villagers earn some coins, while he would learn new skills and techniques in his profession. How could he not agree to his highness request? So once you understand the principles and methods that I teach you, I need you to also teach everyone coming later on into your workshops, Landon continued. Of course your your highness Tim said happily. Landon knew that he couldn't request Tim to teach the principles of construction now, on Wiggins to teach the principles of mineral or extraction or anyone for that matter. Right now, none of them knew anything about physics, chemistry or even biology. They knew math, but not the earth type of math. They only knew how to add subtract and do basic division. The good thing was that they were all literate. Landon planned that while the villagers were learning how to read, write and perform math, he would give each of the leaders books on all four subjects, allowing them to study them first and then later teach their work as in all work departments. Tim was happy dot 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 but also now extremely worried. But your highness, more importantly how are we supposed to get enough iron for all these? Don't worry, after you install these chalkboard to the various classrooms in the upper estate, it'll take you to a place. Tim was still confused, but chose to believe Landon anyway. Tim took three apprentices, put all the boards in a cart and followed Landon and Terry to one of the estates in the upper region. Once they arrived, they spent their time dismantling the fancy designs and paintings on each wall. After all, Landon thought classrooms should be free of all distractions, so the students could better concentrate on their studies. They attached the chalkboards to the walls in various rooms and used one room as a storage room for all slate boards. Landon decided to go to the lower regions so he could show Tim the iron ores and also collect chalk for the classrooms. On his way down, the system notified him for his reward. Ding! Congratulations host for creating chalkboard blackboards and chalk. You were rewarded 40 bonus points BP for the creation of the chalkboard and 10 BP for creating chalk. The system replied. System show me my stats. Host name, Landon Barn. Age, 15. Status, King of Baymard. Level, beginner still level 1. Current Satoshian. Healthy. Overall points, 82 DP and 50 BP. Note, DP is development points and BP is bonus points. Actually Landon had forgotten about the fact that he could get points for creating chalkboards and chalk. His mind was very focused on starting his mission on cannon making and gunpowder. He needed to teach Chief Wiggins the alchemist, how to make gunpowder for the cannons fast. Suddenly, the system gave him a new warning alert. Warning warning dot 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 host a ship is sailing towards the sea coast of your land. Chapter 26 Unexpected Visitors Landon said his goodbyes to Tim and rescheduled with him for tomorrow. Landon then made a U-turn with Terry back to the upper region. Terry was confused as to why Landon looked so flustered. Immediately as Landon stepped into Lucius' office, he said, Uncle Lucius. 
see as a ship coming towards the sea coastline of Baymard, please gather 100 men and come with me towards the coast, Lucius jumped up from his chair, took his sword and ran out, while they were running Lucius asked, how long do you estimate before they arrive, two hours time, Landon replied, everything happened so fast and Terry was still confused, but he decided to wholeheartedly trust Landon's analysis. He thought that when he and Landon made their way towards the lower region, Landon must have probably seen a tiny dot-like figure on the sea approaching Baymard. After all, one could see the seas from the central region clearly. One hour later, while they were gathering enough men, a soldier from the seaport ran up to them. My king! A large ship is approaching the coastline. It is estimated that they would arrive in an hour's time, said the knight. You did well soldier. Thank you for your report. Go back and tell the rest of the soldiers stationed there that we will bring enough men for safety before the ship docks on the coast. As the soldier was about to leave, he turned around and realized that a lot of knights were already gathered in the courtyard with Landon. Did his highness already know of the approaching ship? or is there another training routine I'm not aware of? The young knight bonded. Just like that, thirty minutes more had passed by, and Landon started moving towards the sea coasts with his men. Once at the seaside, Landon had the villagers go back for safety reasons and waited for this unexpected ship to dock. The first time Landon came out here during the inspection, he knew something fishy was going on. There was an already built ship dock here and the most villagers had said that every after four months, Landon's father, the king of Arcadina who came to Baymard in the ship for visits, apparently the city lords and barons had lied to the poor villagers so as to stop them from being nosy, during the time when the ship docked, the city lord would always ban people from coming to the coastline or even going towards the lower regions. The city lord claimed that they would bother his majesty and get killed if they showed up to any of these places. The villagers were so afraid to die that once the ship docked they would hide in the central region and only hunt for food in the forest outside the city gates. At first, he didn't understand what the barons and city lords plans were. But after visiting the mines in the lower region, he had finally completed the puzzled mystery. There was no way his father would take time out every three months to visit Baymard. He would rather believe that cows could fly that believe that story. The villagers had lived all their lives here and were simple people. What did they know about royal visits? Sigh dot dot they were really scammed out by those nobles. It was clear that these were the merchants who traded with the city lord and barons. The emblem and flag on their ship shows that they are from the empire of Corona. From Baymard's location, Corona was its closest neighboring empire compared to Tariq. It made sense that these nobles would trade with people outside the empire of Arcadina. That way his father would never know a thing. So Landon concluded that this ship must be a merchant ship. As the ship docked, a chubby twenty-year-old boy surrounded by his own knights walked off the ship towards Landon's direction. He smiled as he opened his arms and loudly spoke, Ah where is Baron Sylvan and City Lord Augustus? Have they fallen ill? I have just finished trading with some cities in the Empire of Yodan and decided to get my usual supply from here. As Landon looked at the boy, he observed that the boy was completely clueless about Baymard's current situation. This boy was a jolly guy all right. In fact Landon thought that he was the smaller chubby version of Santa Claus back on earth without the grey hairs and beards. Just looking at him would make anyone smile. As he spoke, one could tell that his smile was genuine and his cheeks would get turn rosy red. Such a cheerful guy, Landon thought. Sorry sir. But the city lord and barons have been stationed in other cities in the empire. I am the new lord and new king of Baymard, King Landon. Landon said with a smile. Mr. Santa Claus was taken aback. Yes, Santa. In fact Landon had already decided to call him that irrespective of what his real name was. Santa's eyes almost popped out and his mouth opened widely. Landon really thought that this guy didn't have any poker face at all. Why so surprised? So you are King Barnes' son Landon? You're nothing like what the people describe you to be. I can tell a person's true nature by just observing them. H-E-M-M-H-E-M-M -M 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 -M. I think you're a good fellow bro. You give me good vibes. 
The man said while nodding. Santa walked around Landon in a circular manner while constantly nodding. Landon and his knights didn't know whether to cry or to laugh. Sir, can't you see he's our king? Can you at least not circle him as you like? Can't you do it without making it look so obvious? The knights thought, yup, I was right, no poker face at all. But I like it Landon said with a smile. Ah where are my manners? Santa said. Everyone rolled their eyes heavenwards. Even his own knights did it too. My name is Benjamin Hamilton dot 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 for short. You can call me Ben or whatever you like. Since we are already friends, I'll call you younger bro dot dot hi he he in fact you all should call me elder bro or little bro dot dot hi hi he he Santa said while acting shy like a blushing maiden. Since when did we become friends with you? Can you not be so shameless? Most of the knights thought since we are already friends. I'll call you Santa from now on dot 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 right Santa, Landon replied playfully, no 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 what kind of name this that, little bro, are you making fun of your older bro here? dot 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 HMHM it's weird alright, Santa said while holding his jaws and shaking his head, Landon couldn't hold it any longer and burst out laughing hard, eh, hey, you said I can call you whatever I want, so are you going back on your words now? Dot 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 besides Santa means a cheerful person he lied dot I like you a lot that's why I gave you the nickname really? Dot 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 I like you too bro dot 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 yay Santa replied while holding Landon's hands and shaking them vigorously. One of the knights from Santa's side coughed and looked at Landon as if begging for him to forgive Santa for his actions. Landon smiled back at him as if reassuring him that it was okay. Little brother let's talk business Santa said as he held onto Landon's shoulders and walked towards the lower region. In conclusion, when it concerned Santa. Landon had just one philosophy to go by. If you can't beat him, join him. Chapter 27 A Successful Partnership Little bro, I won't even lie to you. I came here to buy some mineral ores from you. Would that be possible little bro? Please, Santu asked with pleading puppy dog eyes. Of course it would. Not only that. In the future, I will be making new unique and interesting products that'll be only available only in Baymard. Anyway, just tell me how many tons you need and I'll provide them for you immediately. Santa's eyes lit up when he heard the words unique and interesting. He was a merchant after all. As they moved through the lower region, Landon purposely showed Santa the labs and chalk samples that he developed. As they moved through the lower region going, Santa was stunned. He actually made the land bear food dot 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 this guy. Santa thought with a smile on his face. One could see fields of wheat, beans and all other foods covering up to farm islands. There were bananas and plantains growing on the sides as well as apples, tomatoes, lettuces, cabbages and spinach. All the times he came to Bay Mud, 97% of farms didn't even have a single crop growing in them. But now these farms were overflowing with rich crops. How could Santa not be shocked? Was this still the Bay Mud he knew of? And unlike the other nobles he met, Landon didn't disrupt the peace in the village just because he was passing through with a guest. Santa observed that as they passed through, everyone on the farms greeted them warmly especially Landon, and there were no false pretenses in their gazes. He noticed that most people looked at Landon as if he were a god. This little brother of his even cracked jokes with the villagers and carried the little children who came to see their parents at work. The kids were all happy that they could touch or be carried by their king. He even did a little magic trick for them before they left. This is how nobles should act, Santa thought. In fact, Santa was a noble himself. He was the third son of Baron Hamilton of Corona. Since he couldn't inherit his father's title, he chose to be a merchant. Over the years, he built quite a name for himself and became known throughout Corona as the foolish noble merchant by many. They call him foolish because since he was young, he never liked following all those pretentious and fake Nobel rules. At an early age, he always liked doing things that regular people loved. Once, he disguised himself as a peasant and worked in a bakery for three months. On the third month, his dad found out and gave him the beatings of his life. 
because of his nature, he became a thorn in his dad's eyes. People would mock and laugh at the baron saying that he had a peasant son, as if there was anything wrong with that. He later on bought a ship and successfully crossed the seas bringing different things from different parts of the world into Corona. He became popular and a goatman for all shop owners and nobles in Corona, but his dad was still constantly disappointed in him as well as his two older brothers. For them, it was an honor for a noble to fight and go to war for his majesty. The only people who loved him dearly were his mom and his three sisters. They thought he was cute, funny and very kind. He just didn't like pretending and doing senseless things. Why couldn't people talk to each other regularly without the extra rules attached? That's why he secretly admired Landon, he could tell that Landon wasn't one who was also hung up on the rules of Etike. As they passed through, the villagers didn't even bother with Santu at all. Their gazes were on full focus towards His Highness Landon. Was this the weak and dumb bastard child of King Barn? In fact, Santa knew that he wasn't weak. The aura Landon gave out was that of a person who had experienced a lot of battles. When he learned that Landon would be creating items that have never been seen before, Santa was skeptical. After after taking a tour in the laboratory and seeing this so-called chalk, Santa was pleasantly surprised. Although chalk seemed like a small matter, to Santa it really wasn't. It was genius. Do you know how many slate boards are thrown away per year in his empire because they get scratched or destroyed? Chalk was way better than slate pencils and way cheaper. Slate pencils are like sticks which are used to scratch the boards for educational purposes. Chalk was the best solution for this problem, and it was only found in Baymard. How could Santa not want any? Little brother, is it possible to buy these chalk sticks now? I need enough chalk for 10,000 people in one go. Not for now Santa. These chalk sticks are barely enough for my people as it is. And we don't have enough man labor to produce such large amounts. Dot 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 but, if you can get me 3000 slaves or people who are genuinely looking for work the next time you come, then you'll be able to produce a huge batch for you. Dot 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 how about that? That makes sense little bro. Dot 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 okay okay. Dot 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 at the end of each month. I will send one of my trusted aides to you with a ship containing 1000 workers in them. I will do this every month, until you have 3000 men from me. That's good. Speaking of which dot dot how much will you pay per ton of ores? Landon asked. I usually pay 1200 gold coins per ton little bro. And he'll be leaving with 150 tons of these ores today. So he'll get 180,000 gold coins today dot 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 not bad. Landon thought. All right dot 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 so how much does it cost to get slaves? Landon asked. In the slave markets. Slaves are gotten by how beautiful or how strong they are. The average slave costs 1,600 copper coins per person Santa said. So for 3,000 people he'll need 480 gold coins. Landon thought. Do you have any rare seeds on your ship? Of course I do silly. When I used to come here, the nobles would buy bags of wheat beans and other foods from me. There would also be a few who bu eye the seeds of these foods, although they knew that the lands couldn't bear anything. I'm guessing they still wanted to try their luck, Santa said with a smile. Good dot 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 once we are done with your order, I'll take a look at your seeds. Chapter 28 Busy day as the day went by, Landon, Santu and the knights loaded up all the oars onto Santa's ship and Landon gave him twelve chalk sticks as a parting gift. Landon ended up using 300 gold coins to buy bags of dried apple seeds, pear seeds, watermelon seeds, beech seeds, grape seeds, orange seeds, pepper seeds, peanuts, rice and beans seeds. He quickly looked for lye ore and carefully explained how the fruit seeds are to be planted. The farmers who saw the seeds were curious about some of them. They had never heard of watermelons and beech fruits before. They were now curious as to how the fruits will look and taste. Plus Landon was craving some himself too. With 179,700 gold coins more in Baymard's pocket, 
Landon was thrilled, but this gave rise to a new issue he had dot 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 who would be in charge of government funds in the future, for now he and his mom could do it dot 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 but later on, he needed to write laws, procedures and violations codes for Baymard, all his trusted aides were knights, and he couldn't use his mom or Lucy either, the finance minister needed to be someone who was trustworthy and didn't show any characteristic traits of a greedy person. The chosen minister must also be well learned, with a mindset that always focused on the improvement of Baymard. Dot 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 dot. This would be difficult, Landon thought. The next day, on the training courtyard, Landon promoted some knights and rewarded them as lieutenants under their various knight captains. Mark, Josh, and Gary were promoted from captains to major generals for the army. Each major had two captains under them, and each captain had four lieutenants as well under them. Every knight was told about their strengths and witnesses, as well as recommended personal workout routines for them to do in their free time. The knights who got promoted were extremely proud of their accomplishments and felt that all their hard work paid off. Those that didn't get promoted, didn't feel jealous or envious of those that did. They knew how hard those captains and lieutenants strained to get those rankings. Barry Jacks, Terry, Billy Vane, Joseph Fig and two others were promoted to captains under their various major generals. Once the training session was over, Landon took Tim to the lower region and showed him around the estate on the left side of the farms and the mines. Tim saw both mines and was completely shocked. One had iron ores while the other, Melibdenite. Dot, 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 dot. The other ores in the caves held no importance in his eyes. Dot, dot, dot. But to Landon they were extremely rare ores. Tim, I will put you in charge 350 men who will work in the estate. Out of the 19 buildings present in the estate, one will be used as a storage facility for keeping all ore stones extracted from the mines. Each stone type will be stored separately in different rooms. No problem your highness, this won't be an issue, Tim said while nodding. The second building in the estate will be used for glass production. We will need to collect a lot of sand from the sea for that. Glass. Tim was shocked. One had to know that glass was only produced accidentally by lightning in this era. Hence it was very rare and valuable. Sort of like a collector's item. Tim had seen glass before, green colored glass and blue colored glass in the former Baron's estate before. In this era, sometimes when lightning strike, the ground tubes of glass would be formed. The electricity in a bolt of lightning can melt the sand making it combine with other substances which later hardens into glass. Hence people thought that only the gods could make glass. Back on earth, glass was first man-made in the late 15th century. And before that, people only waited on lightning to do some well. Obviously, Landon couldn't wait for the 10th century to move towards the 15th or 16th century for glass making be invented. He urgently needed laboratory test tubes, so as to make gunpowder. He needed to isolate different compounds from the ores and accurately combine them to make effective products in the future. He needed to complete his mission as soon as possible as well as ensure Baymard's safety for the time being. He hated the feeling of vulnerability towards his enemies. Anyone could gather a large army and kill him presently. Ever since he was cured from the whiz poison, he had felt something or someone wanted him seriously dead. He ruled out his father because, although his father hated him, his father also couldn't bother to kill him. His father was the sort of person that wouldn't waste his energy on an enemy that he considered to be weak. So that leaves his siblings in the mix. All of them were black-hearted and downright cruel. It had to be one of them. He needed to make the cannons fast so as to protect Baymard, his mom, Lucy, his men and himself as well. As Tim listened to Landon, he couldn't help but wonder if Landon was actually the reincarnation of a god. Either way, he was happy to be a part of the glass making process. This was history in the making. Don't worry Tim, it'll show you how it's done Landon replied with a smile. Tim calmed his exited heart down and looked at his highness with reverence. The third building will be used in producing what I call war cannons. Dot 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 dot. I will also teach you how to create them. The fourth building will be used to make construction tools like pickaxes, construction rail cars and other mining equipments. Dot 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 dot. As for the rest of the 16 buildings, Q 
keep them unoccupied for now. Dot, 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 dot. Soon, other things will be created in them. Landon continued, Your Highness, how soon do you want to start? As soon as possible. Out of the 350 men, 100 will work on ore extraction, 100 will work on glass production, 100 on cannon making, and 50 will work in producing construct equipment. Dot, 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 dot. Don't worry, by the end of the month, Baymard will be expecting new workers so by then you'll have more people in the production line. Tim nodded and listened attentively. You will be the overseer for all departments in the estate. I also need you to assign all six of your apprentices as supervisors for each sector and department. Landon said. The glass making department will have two sectors sand extraction from the sea and glass making itself. Dot, 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 dot. Likewise, or extraction will also have two sectors, ores from the first mine and those from the second mine. Landon continued. Landon later told Tim the salary for all workers, supervisors and overseers. He also ensured Tim that he would have cooks and guards around the estate for the workers. Since the paint company had used up all the mining pickaxes available, Landon gave Tim enough money to go to the next city and buy 1,000 more in preparation for the set of slaves coming from Corona. Tim had agreed to go to the neighboring town, the next day and return before the end of the week, so Landon had to postpone his mission for now. Speaking of the slaves, Landon needed to make accommodations readily available for them once they came. In the central regions, most houses were concentrated far away from the front gate of the city in fear of enemy attacks. Landon thought that he could use those empty spaces to build mud thatched houses for them. He would need to gather and pay a few more workers for the job though. Chapter 29 Schooling System The next day, since Landon couldn't start the mission until Tim came back, he decided to open his school today. The adults could attend classes any time of the day due to the fact that some of them worked at morning shifts while others worked at afternoon shifts. Landon forbade anyone, especially the miners to work above 9 p.m. in Baymard. Mining while using lamps air candles was still too dangerous in Landon's opinion. The children on the other hand, had to attend only morning classes. After training, he asked the knights to gather all the villagers around the town square inches the central region. Even the miners and farmers had to attend, plus the alchemists and fishermen. Everybody. He looked at the large crowd and climbed up the podium in the city square inches the central region. Citizens of Baymard. Within this past month and a half, history has been made here in this glorious city. The farmlands have bored food. The people are healthy and the town is growing steadily. Some of you have had steady wages from working in the various jobs in Baymard, and can now afford to feed your families. You all need to feel proud because this is the result of your hard work, Landon said. Everyone nodded and felt warm inside, especially those who had been working in factories and farmlands. As you all know, Baymard is no longer part of Arcadine. The Empire has rejected us because in their eyes we the trash of Arcadine. The Empire abandoned us and left us for dead. But do we need them? Dot, no we don't. We will make our own Empire and make them regret ever throwing us away. As they listened, their blood began to boil. For years now, they had been requesting food and assistance from their former king, Landon's father, King Barn. But what did he do? Absolutely nothing. He neglected them for years and left them to their hunger. The Empire laughed at Baymard thinking that we would always remain weak and die from starvation. Dot, 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 dot. But, haven't we proven them wrong? It is my dream to make Baymard a paradise on earth for you all. We will progress mentally, physically and financially together. We will fight and trample on our enemies together. I promise to make the city a holy land to all who see it. Are you all with me? Are you all with me? Landon asked loudly. Yes they yelled passionately. Good dot 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 in future, I will offer up more jobs to you all allowing all of you to make as much money as you would like and live better lives than your current states. But for this to happen, I need my people to become literate. I will teach you all and allow you to further yourselves in the world. My people must not be looked down on by anyone in the empire. I will make you all leaders of tomorrow and Baymard, the promised land for all. This is my promise to you. They were stunned. 
His Highness was willing to teach them, their hearts were filled with joy and gratitude towards Landon, their children would become literate and smart like people in flourishing cities. They vowed that they were going to seriously learn and develop Baymard alongside with Landon. They also wanted to witness history in the making. Landon explained the schooling system to them and had everyone register for a session. He had Lucius and the three major generals write out their names on parchment papers. Lucius wrote down the names of all children, while the three generals registered the adults. Gary registered adults for morning classes, Josh for early afternoon classes and Mark for late afternoon classes. Registering allowed Landon to know how many people would attend the classes daily. Just like that, the first day of class was set for tomorrow morning. He also told them about the slaves and refugees that would come at the end of the month, and got 100 volunteered men and women who would aid in building houses for them. He discussed the pay and also promised to provide them with food and guards while they were working. He wrote down their names and told them that they would start the next day. And finally, he gathered 350 men and women in advance for the building and development of cannons. He also wrote down their names and told them to begin work Monday next week, since Tim would come on Friday. Off the bat, he decided to let most of the women work with making glass, as that did not involve Stennis digging for ores in the mines. Although women could do the job, men had more ore strength and were just faster than women on earth. Women could work in a lot of jobs due to the progress of technology. There were machines that dug up the ground and carried raw materials for people. All one needed to do, was to control these machines. But now, in this ancient and wayward era, there was no way he would allow women carry heavy stones and rocks all day. They'd get sick and damage their organs and bodies. Landon wasn't risking it. But he could allow them to be a part of putting sand in sacks and letting the men load them onto carts that would transport them to the glass making factory. The women could also become alchemists or scientists if you will. They could also weld and mold the cannons in a giant furnace dot 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 but he would never allow them to work in the mines. The women who signed up were happy and excited. Women in this era only cooked, took care of their families, sewed, farmed, mulled mud bricks or became maids for rich households. Even working as a blacksmith's apprentice was not allowed. They were bored with these jobs and wanted something new, but now they could. And the best thing was, they got to earn the same salary as a man. In this era, even in the same profession, men earned more than women. For example, in the same bakery or farming jobs. Even if a woman did exactly the same thing as a man, she'd still get lower wages compared to that man. They usually got frustrated because they too have families to take care of. Some of them were widows and some had husbands who were became bedridden with illness. They became the breadwinner in those cases, and had to support their slusmans and children. But this era made things too hard for them. Over the past month, Landon had been teaching Lucy, his mom Kim, Grace and Little Momo math. Likewise, Lucy and Kim also taught Grace and Little Momo how to write, read, count numbers, and also do basic addition and subtraction. In Landon's opinion, Grace was very intelligent and had a sharp mind. With more time, Grace would definitely become a master in mathematics. In the future, he would let his mom teach math too while Grace thought math won, but not for now. Dot 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 she had to continue learning properly. Landon went down to the alchemy department and transported a huge stack of chalk to the classrooms in the upper region. Each student would be given two packs of twelve stack chalk sticks, twenty-four pieces of chalk in total and two slate boards for free at the beginning of the term. Once they lost or finished their school supplies, they could buy extra supplies from the school store or the local stores in the central region. Chapter 30 Development After Dinner Landon decided to continue writing books on all the knowledge he acquired from his past life as an engineer and from the system rewards. Ever since he finished the farming mission a while ago, he had been writing daily on farming. 
basic chemistry and mathematics. He had been using the system's time capsule for three hours a day in the real world 15 days in the time capsule alongside a concentration speed pill. One concentration speed pill allowed him to concentrate and write super fast for one hour in the real world. After taking the pill, he realized that in two hours 10 capsule days, he had written five books. Landon was pleased with the pill. So far, he had written 32 copies of basic chemistry. 25 copies of Introduction to Farming, 39 copies of Basic Mathematics and 3,000 timetable parchment papers for each student. Today, after his morning teaching session, he decided to continue making more copies. His goal was to have, 60 copies of Basic Chemistry, 50 copies of Introduction to Farming and 60 copies of Basic Mathematics by Friday. Once all the copies were done, he would allocate them to schools and all industrial departments in Baymard. He also decided to continue writing and readjusting the laws in Baymard, as well as the military rules for soldiers. Baymard was sort of a ruler's city. Since the Empire stopped caring about the place, the nobles who lived here before, just did what they wanted and also took what they wanted. They were just bullies, Landon thought. And just like that, Landon's week flew by fast. He spent his days, writing, teaching, assisting in farming, building mud houses, fishing, training and building gigantic furnaces for different departments in the construction industry. Occasionally, he would also visit the mines and the alchemy laboratory, to see how they were doing. By the time it was Friday, he had accomplished all his goals. Out of the total copies he had, he kept 30 basic chemistry books, 30 basic mathematics books, 30 introduction to farming books and 2,000 copies of the timetable in the school storage room. In Baymard, every student would get two parchment paper timetables for free. But if the student loses them, Hesh would have to buy one from the school or ships in the central region. Two of them would cost one copper coin. As for the rest of the books, he decided to distribute them to all supervisors and overseers within all the industries in Baymard. On Friday, Tim came back with a large wagon filled with pickaxes. They were unloaded and neatly arranged in a tool storage facility for the workers. Thinking about it now, Landon thought it would be a good idea to build a locker room where everyone could keep their tools in it. Of course building it, would be the duty of Dio Artment 4. When they start working, Landon gave 10 copies of basic chemistry, 10 copies of basic mathematics and 300 timetable sheets to the construction industry. Since all the supervisors already know how to read and write, as well as do math, he decided to give them the copies. Be it the alchemists or even Tim's group of people, all of them knew how to read. Hence, each supervisor was to keep one copy and read and fully understand them. In the future, Although these courses will still be taught in school, if the employee doesn't understand something at work, it is the duty of the supervisor to explain it to Hymer. Back on Earth, supervisors and overseers knew the hows, the whats and the whys. Dot 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 why they kept the temperature low in some procedures, why the pressure was high, the dangers of doing certain things and so on. Engineering itself is a very risky field. Some compounds and chemicals, can only be kept or worked on, at certain pressures and temperatures. Higher pressures, could cause explosions in the tank, killing everyone instantly. After all 95% of chemicals are flammable at specific entropies, pressures and so on. Hence, in Landon's mind, the supervisors and overseers must be knowledgeable enough to explain and assist the workers. They must act and guide all those under them. He also gave 10 copies of basic chemistry, 10 copies of basic mathematics and 300 copies of the time stable to the clickamy industry, as well as, 4 copies of basic chemistry, 8 copies of introduction to farming four copies of basic mathematics and 300 copies of the timetable to the food industry. His reason for giving the food industry chemistry and mathematics books, was simple. Very soon, Baymard would start processing canned tomatoes, tuna and many more, as well process their own spices and food preservatives. To make all this happen, chemistry plays a major part in it, 
talk less of mathematics. Once the night came, Landon jumped onto his bed and closed his eyes immediately. Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Z Finally, the little king was fast asleep. Again, the days flew by fast, and just like that, Monday was here. Let's make some glass Landon thought. Gunpowder was a delicate thing. To make it, one needed saltpeter, charcoal and pure sulfur. The purer the sulfur, the stronger the explosive effect of the gunpowder. So far, there was saltpeter and charcoal available, but pure sulfur was a different matter on its own. Pyritrox called the fool's gold is formed when iron ore and sulfur fuse together naturally with time. Since iron is silvery and sulfur is yellowish, the rock is a blend between the two colors and can easily be spotted in the mines. Hence the name fool's gold. Most pyrite rocks have 53% sulfur in them. If Landon just threw these pyrite rocks in with the charcoal and saltpeter, the gunpowder it would produce would be trash. He needed at least 97% of pure sulfur for it to be extremely powerful. Hence extraction was the only way. Landon could have used the clay pot method to extract the sulfur but that method was unsafe and not practical for industrial use. Generally, when sulfur is being extracted, a very poisonous and toxic gas called H2S is released. When using the clay pot method, there is no real safe way to dispose of the H2S making the workers breath the poisonous gas. Large amounts of H2S can instantly damage your health, but small batches will not cause a lot of harm. That's why people only use this clay pot methods in small batches 5 to 6 stones a time. Landon didn't want to risk the health of his workers' health, so the clay pot method was off the table. How could he let them breath in poisonous gases? The workers would be producing gunpowder for god know how long. At Leafy it should be safe. Hence, he decided to build his own apparatus using iron and glass. He wanted to create a safe way to dispel the H2S gas, as well as carry out an industrial scale batches 150,300 stones. If he was going to build something, why not make it industrial scale? What's the point of throwing five or six rocks there, when you could throw one hundreds? It didn't make anything sense for Landon, who had hired more than one hundred workers to just throw a few stones a day. He wanted a mass production of sulfur, not a tiny sample. Go big or go home, he thought. He also decided to build it in a way that was easy to manually control for now. But when electricity would come. He he he. He would attach temperature sensors, pressure sensors, and other devices to a control room. The future is so bright. I can't wait to build a food processing plant. Oh, wait. Dot 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 I miss toothpaste maybe a dot 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 no 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 dot 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 he'll do an industrial paint making plant first. Landon thought while drowning in his futuristic fantasies. Little did he know, that dangerous forces were gathering in the shadows dot waiting to make their move. Chapter 31 City Lord Shannon Riverdale City. So. You're saying that you personally saw Tim Mayers leave with the wagon filled with thousands of pickaxes? And he didn't tell you why he needed them? City Lord Shannon asked with a cold and intimidating voice. Why dot 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 why dot dot yes City Lord. W. We saw him, said one of the young men kneeling on the ground fearfully. W dot dot we don't know why he nay dot 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 needed them my lord. Another one said. Shannon Lerp drummed his fingers against the table and carefully observed their reactions. Drum 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 his fingers drummed. It doesn't look like they're lying, he thought while sizing them up. The four poor men were shivering under his ice cold gaze. They dare not meet his gaze. Everyone knew that their city lord was a tyrant. He killed when he felt like it. In their opinion, it was best not to anger this maniac. It's just that they couldn't understand what they had done to wanton the city lord's attitude towards them. Three of them were just common welders, while the other was also just an ordinary merchant. They didn't even know Tim Mayers well enough. Dot dot dot. So why were they treated like this? Was he a criminal? Was he wanted in the empire? Did they accidentally sell goods to a fugitive? Is that why they were here? They asked themselves worriedly. You all can leave. And 
Keep this conversation confidential. I don't need to remind you all of what I will do to you if this conversation gets out. Do I? My lord, I swear on my life that I will never tell another soul, replied one. I swear to my lord the other three said hurriedly. Go. Shannon Lerp yelled. They shivered as they stood up and immediately walked away as fast as they could. In their minds, they had just come out of hell. They made up their minds that if they saw Tim Mayers again, they would stay as far as possible from him. Once they left, a man came out of the shadows and sat beside Shannon Lerp, he knows the man said. This man was Baron Rogers who used to live in Baymard before Landon took over. Baron Rogers was sent, four cities away from Baymard by King Barn. He was sent to the flourishing city of Prajdon. As soon as he arrived, he realized that his stay there, would be far much worse than when he was at Baymard. Prajdan was a moderately sized city with over 15 barons and one city lord who controlled and distributed funds for all the nobles. Part of the money he received from the capital as a baron, was cut away by the city lord of Prajdan. Apparently, he was not the only one. The city lord of Prajdan requested for the nobles to give him 10% of their monthly wages given by the empire. But Baron Rogers needed the money more, so he couldn't to accept it. He requested for his money to be returned back to him, but the city lord never even gave him a glance. What an jackass he thought. He looked at Baron Rogers as if, looking at a foolish child who didn't know what was good for him. Baron Rogers was almost angered to death. For Pitt's sake, he needed more money to take care of his knights and keep his household in check. Back in Baymard, although the land was barren, the money he got from selling those ores was at least four times greater than what he received in Prajdan as his monthly upkeep. The worst part was, ever since his fight with the city lord, everyone isolated him. Some barons constantly tried to pick fights with him and even tried seizing part of the money as well. They even tried to buy his knights over, promising to give them more money than what he offered. How could he take this kind of insult as a man and as a baron? Living in Baymard for all those years, he had truly forgotten how nasty and horrible nobles and people in power could be. His wife and children, who used to be too high up they were the ones who bullied and beat up the maids and citizens of Baymard, were now mocked and picked on by the other nobles. His sons had been constantly bullied in the knighthood academy of Prajdon and his wife constantly mocked because she didn't have the latest fashionable clothes. He felt really low as a man. Hence he needed money fast, so as to secure his position in Prajdon. Once he thought about the mines in Baymard, he started thinking about Landon's death. For him, even if all the citizens of Baymard had to die for Landon to do die as well, he wouldn't give a damn. All he wanted was the money, he couldn't just move his knights, who were four towns away to come over and fight Landon and his 300 knights, everyone in the empire would be suspicious, especially King Barn and that annoying city lord of Prajdon. That's why he had told and made a deal with city lord Shannon about the mines and the land. Since Baymard was very close to Riverdale City, city lord Shannon accepted the deal. For him, it was a great way to expand his territory and while making more money at the side, because Baron Rogers had to do it discreetly. He decided to leave Prajdan on the excuse of visiting an old friend. If word got out that he was interested in going to Baymard, people would start wondering if there was any special treasure there in Baymard. From there on, they would launch a full-scale investigation on Baymard. If they truly discovered the mines, he was sure that King Barn would surely execute him immediately. Off with his head. As for Shannon Lerp, he had no intention of informing the king as well. After all, he too wanted the money made from the mines. Once and if, King Barn found out about the mines, no one would benefit from it other than King Barn himself. So they decided to find an opportunity to discreetly deal with Landon without raising any suspicions. If they suddenly attacked Landon, people would want to know their motives. This would definitely bring the king's attention on them. So for now, they decided to play it safe, it doesn't matter whether he knows about the mines or not. Well assassinate him. Assassination is the only way to get rid of him without raising any suspicions. Shannon Lerp said. I agree. But, if we're going to do it, 
We need to get one of the top five assassins in the Empire. I think Dumbo the Butcher would be the best candidate for the job, said Baron Rogers. Not a bad choice, after all he's the closest one around presently. I reckon if we send a letter now, he would arrive here in a month and a half. WLN, what do we do till then? Baron Rogers asked anxiously. We wait. Remember. Right now. The capital is in an uproar, if we pull attention to ourselves, the other princes would surely seek us out, waiting is the only option, Shannon Lerp replied, while sipping on a cup of wine, Baron Rogers thought that what Shannon Lerp said made sense, the fight for power within the royal family was a well known fact to all the nobles in the empire, as nobles, they had the option to side with any of the princes in the empire, but if the prince they choose, doesn't win in the fight for the throne. It meant that their days were numbered, or they would be hated and treated as trash by the ruling king. It was a tough call for most nobles. Who do you think would win the fight for the throne? Baron Rogers asked. Shannon Lerp leaned on his chair and looked up to the ceiling. He seemed to have fallen in a deep trance. The Royal Barn Family Chapter 32 The Turbulent Barn Family Whitewood City Eli stood at his castle balcony, watching as his little brothers, Connor and James, got off their carriages. So they finally came, he thought. Zarius, where is Princess Jeanette? My lord, she is currently within the castle garden. Inform her about the arrival of my dear brothers. Eli said, in fact three days ago, his younger sister, Jeanette, also arrived at his castle. She had claimed that she missed him and wanted to spend more time with him. When she had arrived, Eli could see a trace of disappointment and dissatisfaction in her eyes. Knowing that the assassination attempt had failed, how could Janet not be angry? A month ago, when her brothers said that they would assassinate Eli, she was extremely happy and didn't wait to confirm if the assassination attempt would fail or not. After all, they had hired the Golden Lotus assassins who had a success rate of about 98% in all their missions. Instead Jeanette wrote to Eli, saying that she would visit him soon. Her thinking was simple. If he was still alive by by the time she got there, she would claim that she missed him dearly and wanted to spend more time with him. But if he was dead dot 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 he he he. After delivering the letter, she got on her carriage two days later and headed to Whitewood City. In her mind, Eli was already a dead man. She even started practicing her performance for his death in her head. She could already see herself kneeling over his grave while shedding fake tears and screaming, Brother Eli... Why did you have to go? Sob sob. Why didn't I die in your place? No. I... I won't allow this. Dot. Let me go with you. I want to be with you brother Eli... Dot 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 sob sob. After that, she had also imagined how people would beg her not to take her life and live longer... Dot 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 in her mind, her performance had to be flawless, so she kept practicing in the carriage. Since it would take a month from the capital to Whitewood, she calculated that her arrival would be faster than that of her little brothers Connor and James. This was good. After all, she too thought of killing their father. So she urgently needed more knights, and funds as well. She had planned to arrive early and secretly disguise the knights as slaves. Then, she would lead them back to the capital, and into her territory. For her, there was no need looking for another base. If her father realized that the 5,000 knights he gave her, had left the capital, he would be suspicious, so she could only secretly gather more forces in the capital. Even though her father had a lot of spies, she thought she could outdo him and secretly bring these men under his nose. Stupid girl, why couldn't a woman rule a kingdom? Ever since she was a little girl, she had dreamed of being the first ever queen to rule the empire. She wanted to make history, but that old foggy father of hers wouldn't even bulge. He was so hell-bent on her older brother Eli as ruler of Arcadina. Wasn't she smart? Wasn't she talented? Dot 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 so what was wrong in her being ruler? This was not fair, she thought. Her plan was to wait for all her brothers to kill each other, then, she would assassinate the last man standing. On her way, she didn't want to contact her other brothers for fear that the assassination plan would be leaked. Little did she know that, they too didn't contact her when the assassination attempt failed, 
because they wanted to tell her in person to avoid other people from finding out about their schemes. If Thera father knew that they had tried to kill the crown prince, he would decrease their funds and take away half of their armies. So, imagine her surprise when he she sees Eli receiving her when she arrives at Whitewood City. Do you know how many days she spent planning that fake crying scene? TSK. She immediately pretended to have missed him and asked him about everything that happened in Whitewood City. Eli told her that someone tried to assassinate him, but he doesn't know who it was. As she heard him say that, her eyes lit up and she smiled. So, he doesn't know? She asked herself as she looked at his facial expression. Jeanette had spent these three days gathering information. Apparently, the assassins killed themselves in front of everyone, before they Eli had a chance to catch them, and only one escaped. After constantly digging information from their maids, common folks and every other person she could think of, Jeanette decided to believe Eli, as all the proof showed that he really didn't know anything else. Eli went down the castle, to welcome his beloved brothers who also missed him dearly. Apparently, at the sight of Eli, both Connor and James smiled widely. If one didn't know any better, they would think that these brothers actually loved Eli. Eli smiled as well and received them with a hug. Little brothers, welcome to Whitewood. How have you guys been? How come you only write to your elder brother once in a year? Don't you miss me? He said why pouting. Elder brother, that's not it. You know that we have to take care of our territories as well. How could you say that we don't care about you? Connor said while hugging Eli tightly. Elder brother, I don't know how you do it. But for me, running my territory is so hectic. I have to run up and down all day. Of course we miss you. Sigh. It's just that there's too much work in my territory right now. So of course I didn't have time to write to you. James said while hugging Eli too. Three trio spoke while making their way into the castle. As they arrived Connor and James were shocked. What is she doing here? Was she the one that leaked information about the assassins to Eli? They thought. But they quickly dispelled those thoughts after they found out that she had also arrived three days before. Once everyone was settled in their rooms, Eli went to his office with Zarius his head knight. He walked towards his bookcase and Zarius pushed it open. View um. There was a staircase, leading to a secret room. Zarius lit a torch and walked down the staircase with Eli. At the bottom, there were torture devices hanging on the walls and tables. And at the end of the room, there were three cells that held two chained up men in them. While the other cell, had a man who was treated as a king. Eli walked past the first two cells and finally arrived at the last one. Old friend, have you enjoyed your stay at Whitewood Castle? The man looked at Eli and smiled. Chapter 33 The Ghostly Prince A man laid on a black beautifully crafted couch. In front of him were different foods and fruits all lined up in well crafted wooden bowls, as well as a jug of wine to quench his thirst. The man was also the same age as Eli. He had dark red hair, thick manly eyebrows and light green eyes that looked like that of a cat. The man in the cage, was called Slytherin Cord. He was one of the top intelligence personals in the Empire. Whatever you wanted to know, he would get the information for you. His results were always 97% accurate, because his siblings had arrived. Eli didn't want to risk them finding out about his involvement with Slytherin Cord. Although they wouldn't be able to recognize him, one should always prevent unnecessary situations from arising. One year ago, Eli received shocking news about his father. In all honesty, he thought the Nan was an arrogant pig. His father had another bastard son other than Landon, and this bastard son was older than Eli by a year. The bastard went by the name of the ghostly prince. His whereabouts were a mystery to those that try to find him. He always wore a giant silver ring on his thumb, as well as a silver metal face mask no matter where he went. It was only a struck of luck that Slytherin found out about him. Slytherin was passing through the city of Gangia and decided to lay low for a while since he was on a mission at the time. 
He saw the metal-faced masked man by a stroke of luck and was curious. After doing investigations for five months he was disappointed. This man had a tight network around him. Slytherin then decided to kidnap one of the man's lower-ranked knights and tortured him. Although the knight didn't know much, what he did know was still astonishing. This man had been building his army for the past four years now. No one knows his base, not even the knights, apparently. He keeps knights of different cities and makes them blend in, by letting them work with the city lords and barons. So basically, the knights worked as double agents. Even the king, city lords and barons didn't know about his existence. From Slytherin's view, the ghostly king was a dangerous one. All the men Slytherin sent to locate him, turned up dead. This man was a ghost all right thought Slytherin. Ever since Eli had received this piece of news. He had been planning on killing his father and sitting on the throne fast. Small fries like his royal siblings didn't bother him at all. Dot 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 but this ghostly king dot 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 this one was a hard but to crack. Eli didn't know what the ghostly king was planning. And neither he did he want to find out. His father had to die fast, before other bastard children pop out again to claim his throne. Did you finally locate his whereabouts? Not yet. I think he knows that someone is trying to track him down. My next operation might be a setup. It's too risky. Slytherin answered. You're right. Lay low for a while before you begin again. As you wish. Crown Prince dot 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 dot. Oh that reminds me. Thea's turmoil in the capital. The left minister has rallied up a lot of nobles to support Prince Connor as the crown prince. And for my brother to make this move, it shows that he is confident about his strength. What about the right minister? Recently, our spies have also reported that he had successfully been bribed to side with Prince James for the position of the crown prince. Although you're the crown prince, your brothers are more popular in the capital than you are. Slytherin answered while crunching on an apple. That's a given. After all, they took advantage of my absence and worked their way up. I also heard that Prince James and Prince Connor had been giving out money to a lot to the peasants in hopes of gaining their support. Ha <laughs> ha. What a desperate move to make. At the end of the day, the one who decides who becomes king and who doesn't is still my father. Eli responded, true. I also thought it was stupid. From what I can see, your real competition is the ghostly king. That man would be a hard wall to crack. Dot 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 even your father doesn't know of his existence. I know, that's why I need to gather enough forces fast. What about your royal siblings and all the disturbances they're causing in the capital? Why bother over something like this? What does it matter anyway? Soon they'll all be dead. And your bastard brother Landon? Dot dot do you want me to find out about his situation? Slytherin asked. No no no. That would be a waste of your skills and time. What can a dying man do? Besides Baymard is a three month journey from here. Slytherin listened and thought that what Eli said made sense. After all, Slytherin had personally witnessed Landon being poisoned at his 15th birthday feast. Eli had sent him there to make sure that his knights did a good job of poisoning Landon. So he had observed from the shadows. He had also continued observing Landon within the two day period before his departure to Baymard. Landon's complexion had changed to a pale bluish color within those two days. Even getting him under the carriage required help from his knights. Anyone who saw this would know that Landon was already a dead man. There was no cure for that poison, only death awaited him. Besides, I need you around here. I need you to keep tabs on Connor, James and Jeanette. Find out about their every move. Dot. I want to know, where they go who they see and what they are doing daily. Don't worry about that bastard Landon. Soon I will take his land from him. He is but the least of my worries right now. Eli continued. Not a problem. He'll send my men to secretly follow them on their way back to their territories. As for the ghostly king, make sure no one finds out anything about him. Not even my father. It would be better if his existence remained a secret. And if anyone is curious about his background, come up with any story you want. But never mention the fact that he is the king's son. As you wish. Crown Prince Slytherin replied. Good dot 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 soon, 
I will take care of him as well. By then, I would like to see just how powerful this brother of mine really is. Chapter 34 Cannon Firing Within a Week and a Half Landon had successfully produced 12 cannons within the construction industry and 56 large sacks of gunpowder in the Alchemy Estate. To ensure that the gunpowder had a superb combustion ability, Landon had gone through several processes to ensure that the gunpowder particles were all finely crushed powders with uniform particle sizes. At the same time, Landon had also recruited 150 knights into the army within this past week and a half. Landon wasn't worried about the slow production rate of cannons and the number of knights he had. Because he knew that, in another one and a half weeks more, slaves and refugees would be arriving Baymard from Santa. Today, Landon positioned eight of those cannons on the city walls and decided that the remaining four cannons should be brought to the barracks headquarters in the upper region. Behind the barracks was an empty field that led to a dense forest. From the high walls on the barracks, one could see the dense forest that went on for about 80 square miles leading to a tall volcanic mountain. From what he had heard, the mountain has not had an eruption for at least 10,000 years and is not expected to erupt again in a comparable time scale of the future. So this was an extinct volcanic mountain. It was the perfect place for the knights to practice cannon firing in future. For today, he chose to test one of the four cannons from the barracks and had two knights drag the cannon onto the empty field. Both knights and workers wanted to see, as well as his mom, Lucy little Momo and Grace, so he allowed them to come. But not all the knights of course who's going to guard the city walls in the central region. Many of the workers were curious as to what they had been making. They had been creating this weapon for quite some time now and didn't fully understand what it could do. But for Tim Mayers and Chief Wiggins and the various supervisors in the industries, they understand exactly what would be happening today. Based on the chemical reactions and production processes, they knew that this weapon would have a great explosive factor. Everyone's heart was pounding as they crowded on the city walls, waiting to witness history. Landon also had some workers create seven strong circular wooden fences with rope and wood, three feet away from each other. Then, he had his knights place seven wild boars in each circular fence. He assigned a gunner and crew needed for operating a single cannon and instructed Lucius and the knights on how to operate the cannon. Cannon operation required a specialized crew and a gunner to run it smoothly. Each cannon was to be manned by four soldiers and a gunner. The gunner was in charge of loading the gunpowder, while one soldier was in charge of providing cartilage by igniting the cannon. The three other soldiers were in charge of ramming and sponging the cannon, as well as holding the ladle. Also, each cannon could fire about 6,075 shots cartilage daily. After properly explaining to his knights, they followed instructions and pointed the cannon at a projected angle towards the fourth middle animal fence. My lord, we are prepared, Major General Gary said. Good dot 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 now. Fire. One of the soldiers ignited the cannon. Sludge and smoke fired out from the cannon, and instantly, Boom. The ground shook slightly and everyone felt sounds echoing loudly in their ears. It was truly deafening. Everyone was shocked silly. This. What kind of weapon was this? The results exceeded everyone's expectations. Lucius' eyeballs nearly popped out of his eyes as he looked at the results. Then, he started remembering the days where he used to fight for territories along the borders. The Pino continent looked exactly like that of North America back on Earth. You could say that Arcadena was like Canada and Alaska combined, with Baymard located at the topmost part of Alaska. The Empire of Deiphorus and the Empire of Yodan both shared borders with Arcadena and could be considered as the United States and Mexico combined. From the east of Empire of Arcadena, a lot of cities trailed towards an extremely large island close to Baymard similar to how Mexico trails into the continent of South America back on Earth. Only this happens from Alaska in Canada. This massive island is Empire of Corona. Likewise, from the west of the Empire of Arcadena, a lot of countries trail towards an even bigger island. This is the Empire of Tariq. Arcadena and Deiphorus have always been in conflict with each other. This conflict led to a large scale war 200 years ago. 
The main issue was that, the Deiferous soldiers would sometimes conquer major cities along the Arcadina borders, brutally killing the people and soldiers stationed there. Once cities along the borders are conquered, the overall size of the empire would be reduced. If this continued, then sooner or later, they won't just be contented with cities at the borders. Hence in the past, Lucius had always been sent to the borders to fight and kill the Deiferous soldiers. Although all the leaders of each empire signed peace treaties with each other hundreds of years ago, humans were always greedy beings who want more than what they had. And since Arcadina was the biggest empire in Bino, they didn't mind taking some of its cities. Once new rulers ascended the throne, they always looked for more power and cities to conquer, so the treaty wasn't always applied. Even till this day, there are always wars around the borders. If Lucius had this kind of weapon, then most of his friends wouldn't have died in the battles. He had been involved in intense battles that went on for twelve days straight with each side sending back up every single day. He had even seen his friends being cut down before his eyes. Although they had succeeded in keeping their border cities, Lucius felt that there was nothing to be happy about. As Lucius looked at the cannon, although he was happy for the creation of this weapon, he felt sad at the thought of his lost friends. Sigh. Landon walked around and checked the animals. The one that was targeted was dead as its face was blown away into smithereens. The other four around it also died from the shockwave impact. The last two that were furthest away from the target, didn't die, but had their knees split open and blood gushing out of their ears. Excellent land and thought. The knights had cold sweat on their backs seeing the damage it caused. If they were faces with this kind of weapon, they would have no means or chance for survival. Tim and Chief Wiggins laughed and hugged each other like a bunch of five-year-old kids. Ha ha dot this is great, marvelous, dot dot genius Tim Mayers said excitedly. That basic chemistry book basically changes the game for alchemy. Ha 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 dot 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 what is matter? This is matter. Dot 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 his highness is a godly genius. Old Tim. Ill buy you a drink today, Chief Wiggins said while patting Tim Mayer's back. Pay. No way. I have to keep reading my basic chemistry book. I want to see and create more materials. Did you know that even iron itself has different temperatures for which it can be welded by? Damn dot dot there's even something called enthalpy and entropy. When we created glass for the first time, I almost lost it. Genius. Simply genius. Tim said. Oh. Don't forget about air my friend. What we are breathing has different elements in it dot 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 blah blah blah. As the two men spoke, their apprentices looked at each other and smiled. Today they had witnessed history. Although everyone was shocked silly, deep down, they knew that with this new weapon, Baymard would have a means of protecting itself. They couldn't help but looked at his highness with awe. Godly genius. Chapter 35 Fiancé After Cannon Testing Landon asked Lucius to ensure that the soldiers trained daily on how to use the cannons. Every week, Lucius would be in charge of drawing a schedule that allowed everyone to train and prepare on how to use the cannons. After all, it was impossible for 330 soldiers plus the added 150 recruits to practice daily. So a schedule was the best way forward for these 480 men. All in all, each soldier would have the opportunity to practice cannon firing at least three times a week, going from Lucius' drawn-up schedule. Landon held his mother's hand with his left hand and Lucy's hand with his other hand, as they walked around the barracks. Brother Landon, why don't we go to the castle? Lucy asked curiously. Little Landon, I'm also curious as well. Dot 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 aren't we done? Why aren't we going back home? Mother Kim asked suspiciously. Lucius and Landon looked at each other for a second and quickly averted their gazes. Something was fishy to both women, but they decided to brush it off. As they continued to stroll, Landon kept looking at the blushing Lucy and smiled. Mother Kim, as if feeling the weight of being a third wheel, held on to Lucius' arms, as well as Grace's arm and ushered them forward. Too bad she didn't see the intense blush on Lucia's cheeks. But Grace did. Grace in turn rushed up ahead with little Momo leaving the royal couples behind. She had to get to the castle quickly. Mother Kim felt awkward and blushed deeply. She looked at the handsome Lucius from the corner of her eyes, 
and was lost in thought for a while. When she and her son were banished, Lucius resigned and decided to offer his services as a knight and protect them towards their journey to Baymard. Kim had always known that Lucius took Landon as his son, and that Landon did the same with Lucius. She always thought it was natural and never thought anything about it. But when she was at her lowest, this man had always stood up for her and guarded her against any dangers and troubles. She didn't have any feelings for him before, because whether she liked it or not, she was King Barn's concubine at the time. But when she was freed from her hell, she decided to live her life anew. On the day they left the capital, she started noticing how handsome and manly Lucius was. As time went by, she realized that all this while, she had been in love with Lucius. She didn't even know when it started. Was it when Lucius helped her take care of her son in the capital, or when he resigned to follow her to Baymard? She didn't know and she didn't care. When he smiled at her, her world would stop and she would get confused and say the wrong things. Plus, she wasn't sure if he felt the same way. What if he didn't love her? Wouldn't she just be forcing her love onto him? What if she ruined her friendship with him because of love? Dot. She would never allow that to happen. No way. Lucius as if noticing her gaze, turned his head facing her. Your Highness, should we go back to the castle now? Lucius asked as he saw her flushed face. As he spoke, her face turned redder and redder. Dot 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 dot. Honestly, he thought that if her face got any redder, it would pop. He chuckled inwardly and smiled. Why dot dot yes let's do that dot 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 you may dot dot after you she stammered. Landon and Lucy who kept watching at the back almost couldn't hold it in. Was this the tiger mother that they knew? Who was this shy woman? As soon as Lucius and mother Kim disappeared from their view, they laughed out loud and almost fell over. As they were laughing, Landon sneakily pecked Lucy's left cheek. Now, it was her turn to blush. She placed her left hand on her cheek and pointed the other one at Landon. You. Dot. Landon took hold of her hands and smiled at her warmly. Is that all you have to say to me? My dear fiancé, Lucy almost choked at his words. Fiancé, since when? How come she wasn't aware of this? She was blushing even more now? and quickly pulled her face away from his gaze. Hey, why are you hiding from me? Dot. Brother Landon why are you teasing me like this? Dot dot I. I. Lucy stammered as she spoke. Come with me. Landon covered her face with a thick piece of cloth and led Lucy up the staircase off the castle. They moved for a while slowly, until they reached the throne room. Once Landon dropped the cloth, Lucy was shocked. There were a lot of people in front of her. Candles surrounding her and a lot of flower petals sprinkled all over the throne room arranged in a special way. Will you marry me Lucy? Was spelled out by the flower petals. Lucy turned around to look at Landon and was shocked. He was on bended knees. Was a king supposed to kneel to anyone? She asked herself worriedly. But that thought quickly left her brain when Landon gave his speech. Lucy Gustav, we've known each ever since we were little. You've always been there for me through thick and thin. When I was down, you stood up for me. When I needed someone to lean on, you were always there. As time went by, I slowly fell in love with you. I love your smile, your caring nature and your heart. Look. I guarantee that there'll be tough times. But no matter what troubles we face, I will fight for you and continue to love and cherish you. I promise you that no one will work harder to make you happy more than I will. Lucy, I want to marry you because when you love someone as much as I love you, getting married is the only thing left to do. So what do you say? Will you match me Lucy? Chapter 36 A great beginning everyone including, the knights, the maids, Tim and Chief Winds were shocked. What did they just see? The king was kneeling down. Is this how marriage proposals are supposed to be made? This was the first time they had seen such a thing. Usually women didn't have a choice. Their parents chose a strong reliable husband who could take care of them and that was that. Sometimes they would be lucky if it was the man that they took loved. Marriage usually involves politics and power for most nobles. But his highness bent down on one knee for his wife and even made such a grand gesture towards her. The women on the other hand were all in the spirit of romance, grace, 
Mother Kim and the maids felt like this was what a man should be. The men looked at the women and thought, is this what women want? They had to admit that this was pretty romantic. The flowers, the candles, the ring, those words. It all made sense somehow. They were almost gave a big thumbs up to his highness for his idea. From the moment Landon came into this world, he had noticed his uncontrollable feelings for Lucy, whether it was because of the old Landon or the current him. His emotions were strong. Every time during dinner, supper comma dot dot heck even breakfast, he would stare at her in a daze. As the days went by, he also began to notice her feelings towards him. Thera love was literally oozing out every time they met. Of course he didn't want to marry her immediately. They were just fifteen years old, after all. But in this era, most girls got engaged at the age of twelve and married at eighteen to twenty. Lucy being engaged now, was considered late in this era. Also, Landon didn't want people to think that there was something wrong with her or that she only good enough to be a concubine or a whore. No matter how times change, human beings were always the same. Back in Earth, if a woman passed the age of 30 and never got married, everyone would point fingers at her. Even at age 26, people would still talk bad about them. He had seen and noted all of Lucy's uncertainty. It was very clear that she had assumed that she would end up as a concubine, or worse just a sidekick. Bruh. He did this to reassure her that she would always be his queen. In his mind, they would get married when they were old enough to do so. For now, he just wanted her to know that she belonged to him. So within this period, he had asked Tim to create a ring made out of iron with a tiny green jade stone on it. Landon brought out the beautifully crafted ring and waited for her reply, while looking deep into her eyes. Ever since he started talking she had been crying. Of course she loved him. It was so obvious for everyone one to see. Yes brother Landon. I dot dot I dot dot till be your wife. Sob sob. Landon took her left hand and placed the ring on her middle finger. This ring is a symbol of my love as a man to you. It is also proof that you are my fiancé, the one I love and the one I will marry. Landon got up and held her in his embrace. If you should willingly remove or give me back this ring, it would mean that you no longer want to marry me or have me as a husband. Dot dot dot. Keep my ring safe and cherish it as well, Landon said while looking at her warmly. Everyone clapped and cheered for them. Josh looked at Grace and smiled. Grace, upon feeling some eons gaze on her, turned and locked gazes with Josh, who was standing directly behind her. She blushed and turned towards little Momo. Elder sister, are you still sick? Why is your face so red? Little Momo asked innocently upon seeing his sister's condition. Josh chuckled and Grace truly wished that the floor could open up and swallow her whole. How embarrassing, she thought. Even Grace felt like no one would ever marry her anymore. Her friends in the village were already engaged, while others married. She didn't want to marry young or be promised to anyone, because she had to take care of little Momo. But looking at Josh now, she started having hope that he would marry her as a concubine at least. Lucius on the other hand, was extremely happy. Landon had come to him last week and told him to man up and confess his feelings to his mother. In fact he himself had started to see the way she would always look at him. He was sure that she cared about him. Landon was right. What was he waiting for? Was it when he turned fifty, that he would confess? Hence he and Landon had worked out this whole scenario. They need to find a moment where both mother Kim and Lucy would not be around the castle a lot as well as have classes. Today was that day. They had been in cohorts with Grace, the knight, the maids and everyone else. On his way to the castle, he had brought Kim to the gardens and confessed to her. He did it the way Landon taught him. On bended knees. Heck he even rehearsed some other lines that Landon gave him. Mother Kim was so shocked that she too burst out into tears. She accepted his love kissed him and ran away from him like a five year old girl. He quickly chased after her and brought her here. The mighty tiger became a small kitten in his embrace. Lucius looked at Mother Kim's smiling face and whispered in her ears. When I propose to you, I will make you happier, because I love you. As he said that, 
he slowly used his left hand and held her right hand tightly. She looked at him and was stunned for a moment. Then she suddenly smiled. Their hearts were finally won. Landon climbed on his bed and thought about the day. Even at dinner, Lucy would look at the ring and smile at it. Even the way she waved had changed. She started waving using the back of her hands like how Julia Roberts did in the Princess Diaries. Himself, Grace, Lucius and the three major generals were trying to hold back their laughters every time she did it. Women. They were all the same no matter the era sigh. Landon smiled and looked his next mission. Cement Manufacturing. Chapter 37 Rewards System, Show me my stat and rewards Landon said as he lay on his bed. Host name, Landon Barn. Age, 15. Status, King of Baymard. Level, Beginner still level 1. Current Satoshian. Healthy. Host also received 120 BP for the creation of glass. Originally, Host had 82 DP and 50 BP. But since Host had previously used 71 DP points for buying space-time capsules and concentration pills, your DP dropped down to 11 points. Note, DP equals development points, TP equals technology points and BP equals bonus points. He looked at his mission status again and thought about how he should proceed in the future. Mission build cement block houses for all permanent residents in Baymard. Submission, since host has received 20 godly food recipes and 5 spice making recipes, host needs to create new palettes and spices for your people. Rewards, full knowledge on the human anatomy and beginner to intermediate knowledge in the medical field. So what if you can build a lot of warfare weapons? Host doesn't even have a single healer in your town. Shame on you. Host will also be given 5 random medical techniques for treating patients. Lastly, host will also receive 350 development points DP and 2000 technology points DP. Deadline, no specific time required. Landon sighed as he looked at his rewards towards his next mission. Where were was the outlay or mechanisms on guns? Dot. Honestly speaking, Landon majored in electrical engineering and also did a lot of hardware engineering as well. He only knew how to develop and design electrical appliances. It was unrealistic to think that just because he had come into a fantasy world, he would suddenly become a sage. Bruh. Yes, he was smart. But he only focused on electrical and hardware engineering. The rest of his time was focused on anime, manga and light novels. Although he had done military service for his country, that didn't mean that he would know how to create guns. He could quickly assemble some of them, but that was it. Each weapon had its own mechanism and important materials that needed to be used in order to successfully create them. If it was anything involving phones, laptops, TV sets, that comma dot dot he could do. But to suddenly tell him to create paper, Sai isn't that too much? Who could honestly say that if they were put in his situation? they would know more than he did. If a person knew everything, that meant that Hesh would have had to study all engineering types, gone to law school, while being a doctor part-time and maybe even ran his own company as a boss, as well as teach on the weekends. There are more than 200 industries on earth, if someone claimed to know everything, they were simply scammers. Also, there was no electricity in this era. So even if he made a printer or photocopier, where would he plug it? And even if he needed a battery wouldn't he need time to create it? Landon also realized another major problem that he was facing. Although the system had given him knowledge on cement making, it hadn't given him knowledge on house designing and construction. Landon wanted to build houses in a way that would take the future into account. Soon he would put water pipes throughout the city as well as other daily commodities. He had no idea where and how to place the pipes. All he knew about was how to place the cables and wires for electricity. He didn't even know how thick the various pipes should be. Landon had decided that every house would have two floors, the ground floor and the top floor. Each house would have a kitchen, two bathrooms, a parlor and four bedrooms at the top floor. It would also have a front and backyard as well as a mailbox and a garage. Oh yes dot 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 he was planning way ahead for when he would finally make cars. He also wanted to make the houses accessible to street roads, 
railways and bus stops. All this depended on how the houses were built and positioned in the city. He had noticed that all the houses were focused around the town square inches the central region. There were almost no houses close to the upper regions or lower regions. In future, all the schools would be located in the upper region, as well supermarkets, luxury hotels malls and so on. Landon knew that most people would eventually want to live close to the upper region. Hence he decided to start building the houses in the part of central region, that was closest to the upper region. Once the first houses were completed, he would start moving the citizens into them in an orderly fashion. Landon had a grand plan for Baymard. He decided to divide the upper region into four sections. District A, would obviously host himself the Knights and the Barracks, District B, would host fighter plane air forces and other airborne military weapons, District C would host justice courts, the main public police offices, the education bureau, government policy offices, all schools, banks and so on, District D would have, luxury hotels, amusement parks, car stores, banks and so on dot 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 basically good entertainment. Landon also decided to break the central parts into four parts. District T, would be the closest to the upper region housing all of the 1500 original citizens who had always stayed here. District F, would follow after District E it would host all the refugees and slaves. District G, would have all the regular hotels for visitors, as well as beautiful national parks, some banks, bars and so on. District H would be closer to the entranceeks at having other police stations and offices that determine whether or not someone could go into the city. It also had offices that issues ID cards, other important outposts and so on. As for the lower region, it would also be divided into four parts dot 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 but it would still be completely filled with factories, be it toothpaste, soap, whatever Baymard needed. Only those that worked there or had a tour pass, could enter the region. The coastal part would also have four parts. All in all, there would be a large dock for visiting ships, another area that would focus on military submarines, as well as military ships. The possibilities were endless. For now, Landon just had to focus on building some end houses. The point to note was that, Although there were 1,500 people present in Baymard, there were only about 1,000 houses here. People lived together as married couples, they had children and maybe even lived with their grandparents or parents. With 3,000 more people coming in, he could easily build the houses for 4,500 people fast. Once he succeeded in providing housing for everyone. He would then start building high-story buildings that would house future families and slaves who come into Baymard. These houses would come of massive car parks and other amenities. Of course, those that come later would have to pay rent for those places. For refugees and slaves who come in the future, he would give them a four months head start before he started collecting the rents. He hoped that before the time was up, they would have already gotten jobs around Baymard. The rents for these houses would be fairly cheap depending on the dust that they were built in. Each district in the central region would have sky-high buildings to rent, as well as normal villa houses for those who have made enough money to live lavishly. Also, all districts, be it the upper or lower regions, would have at least one police station and two gas stations. Landon thought about Baymard and Side. The population was really too small for the land mass. Take Toronto, Canada for example. That city alone had 95,000 privately owned housing units, over 100 hotels, several schools, about 80 malls, several airports and other buildings. Yet Toronto was smaller in land mass compared to Baymard. Was this some type of joke? Driving from one part of Toronto to the other could take up to 1030 minutes without traffic, so one could only imagine how huge Baymard really was. The more Landon thought about the future, the more Landon realized how much knowledge he lacked and how he little the population of Baymard was but he wasn't really in a rush. Building his dream world, would take a lot of time and a lot of effort. For now, he could buy knowledge on whatever he needed from the system. System, can I buy knowledge on house designing and house construction? As well as all knowledge involving handgun mechanisms, 
paper making and water supply for buildings. You can host for the guns. Would you like knowledge on the single action revolver, double action revolver or semi-automatic pistols? The system asked. The semi-automatic pistol would do. Host's first request will cost you either 120 DP. 300 technology points points or 100 bonus points. The second request will cost host either 100 DP, 250 TP or 80 BP. The third request will cost either 80 DP, 100 TP or 20 BP. And finally the fourth request will cost either 130 DP. 380 TP or 110 BP the system asked. Take out 120 BP points for the first request, 100 DP for the second request, 20 DP for the third request, and 130 DP for the final request. Also, show we my balance points again. Hosts overall points, 11 DP, 1000 TP and 50 BP. Does host want to receive these information now? Yes. As Landon laid on his bed receiving the long string of information that he had just bought, he couldn't help but feel that, tomorrow would be a very hectic day. Chapter 38 Arrangements Lower Region One and a half weeks ago, when Landon first produced the first cannon and gunpowder sample, he had already completed his mission. He needed tools that would aid in manufacturing cement, so he asked Tim to assign Department 4 to the task. Within the construction industry, Department 4 was in charge of building all equipments or tools needed by other departments or industries, be it industry tanks, pumps, screwdrivers, or even hammers. They would do it all. Landon asked them to create two large rotary kilns. 300 shovels, 40 wheelbarrows carriage wheels would be used instead of rubber, 30 iron buckets since rubber wasn't invented yet, 100 hose and 50 manual spice grinders. But now that he had just got information on how to construct houses, he found that he was lacking a lot more tools. Tim, it has been a week and a half. Since I asked you to make some tools for me. How many equipments have you made so far? Landon asked curiously. Your Highness, with 50 people working on the tools, we already made all the shovels, as they were even easier to make than swords. The iron buckets, hose, spice grinders, and the wheelbarrows were done as well. But we are only 23s done with the kilns. Excellent. Good job Tim. Have five people continue working with the kilns. I just remembered that there are more tools that we would need before the end of the month. I apologize in advance about my negligence on the matter, Landon said sincerely. The things he needed were too many to be made before the end of the month. There was only one week and four days left, before the slaves would arrive. This would definitely put pressure on them. Tim looked at Landon's pained expression and immediately understood what he was thinking about. It was rare for rulers to be this considerate towards their subjects. Tim smiled. Your Highness. No need to apologize. We would all be honored to do whatever job you request of us. You're only human Your Highness. It's normal for you to forget sometimes, Tim replied. Thank you Tim. But you know, your words make me more guilty. Hi 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 hi. Tim smiled and chucked as well. Don't worry your highness we won't hold it against you. All right. I'll bear that in mind. Dot 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 dot. Here's what I need. Dot 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 blah blah. Landon explained and drew diagrams on parchment papers, on how each equipment would look like. He needed two large manual cement mixing machines, two large manual making cement block machines, 40 wall screeds, 40 floor screeds, 40 tuman saws, 40 mini wood scroll saws, 40 hand rip saws and saws, 100 thick wooden measuring rulers and 1000 well cut plank boards of different sizes, 1000 nails, 50 door knobs with keys, 100 door hinges 50 paint rollers, 4000 reinforcing steel bars rebar and 200 long steel tying wires rebar wires to join the bars together. With the exception of the five who will work in making the kiln, the R45 workers available for the task. The first four projects should indeed have four people working on them. But for the fifth to eight hours projects we will consider them as one giant project. 
have 15 people create each sort type, and when they are done, get them to start creating the measuring rulers and the planks. The ninth project should have seven workers on it to make, mails, door knobs, hinges and paint brushes, while the other seven workers should focus on finishing the tenth project. Landon said, Your Highness, that would mean each worker would have to create eight screeds in a week and four days. Isn't that too little? No offense your highness. But from what you described, these saws would take less time to create than swords. A normal blacksmith would be able to make 34 swords a day my lord. These tools should be done within the next four days. What happens when they finish their task early? Do you want them to create more? Tim asked seriously. No. Those that finish early, should help out with the other projects. What we need now is enough tools to start the job. Once the slaves arrive, we can assign more people to create more tools. Tim nodded his head while listening. As for hammers, the department had always been making them for a long time. So far, Baymard has over 300 hammers within the construction industry. When Landon browsed through the knowledge he had acquired, he found out that the foundation of all houses were done with wood concrete and steel bars. Steel was used because it could expand and contrast in heat and cold, as much as concrete, which means that it won't crack the concrete that surrounds it. He also needed to cut down trees and make several planks neatly. If it wasn't done well, the foundation would not be sturdy. That's why he needed them to make saws. In this era, people used axes to cut their wood. That was a real waste of time just saw the wood open. Since there was no electricity, all the tools he made operated manually. The workers should use the two-man saw to fall the trees. When trying to get precise wood measurements, they could use the measuring rulers, chalk, wood scroll saws and rip saws to get the exact wood blocks needed for each part of the house. He also needed to make sure that the cabinets for the kitchen, bathrooms and so on, were done properly. In this era, People tied wood together with ropes, instead of using nails. Dot dot that's why he also requested for nails to be made a sap. Now, that we are done with Department 4, let's talk about Department 3, the Warfare Department. Landon also gave him a detailed understanding and sketch on how the handguns were to be manufactured. Also, put all the hose and spice grinders on a cart. He'll take them over to the food industry. Landon met Chief Wiggins and handed over all the tools to him. In this era, people used sticks, sharp stones, pickaxes and their hands to dig up the soil. The hoe was flatter compared to the pickaxes and wasn't as heavy as the pickaxe. Wiggins didn't know how this thing could help them. He looked at the tools in confusion. Landon decided that it was better to show him how it worked than explaining its functions. So he decided to head towards the farms. Once they arrived, Landon gave ten hoes to random workers and one how to Chief Wiggins, while holding another hoe in his hand. He rolled up his sleeves and turned towards them. Let's begin, follow my lead. Landon held the hole with both hands and swung frontwards towards the ground. After softening and smoothing the soil, he then started forming beds by digging up the surrounding soil and placing it on top of the area he smoothed. As everyone followed his movements, they realized how fast and easy, using this tool was. Less than three minutes, they had already formed a farm bed. Normally, it would take one person an hour to make a standard size bed. After using a pickaxe, stones or sticks to soften the soil, the farmers would use their hands to form the beds. Chief Wiggins looked at the tool in his hand and smiled. This was a game caner for him. Once the day is over, you all can return the tools back to your supervisor. Since the demonstration was over, Q went back to the food industry with Chief Wiggins. And on their way, Wiggins kept talking about how this tool was godly and so on. Landon looked at the excited man and chuckled. When Wiggins spoke about farming, he really looked like a kid. As they rode back. Landon kept thinking about spice making. Although he wanted to start now, he knew that he couldn't without more people. So he decided to wait for the slaves and pass the time assisting every department. As Landon thought about his situation, 
Someone far away was preparing for a stormy night. Chapter 39 An Unexpected Problem Benjamin Hamilton aka Santa, had already gathered 800 or more slaves and refugees from his city, on the first three days of arriving Corona. On the fourth day, he got an urgent massage from the ninth Prince of Yodan, Barry McLean. The ninth Prince was a funny one. He was kind, simple-minded loyal and hardworking. When his half-siblings fought over kingship, he only focused on learning how to run the two small cities under his control. His father, King Maclean, had six wives and two concubines. With this, Bari had twenty-three siblings. Actually, he was born a week after the eighth prince, while the tenth and eleventh princes were born four and six months after his birth. So in one year, King Maclean had welcomed four princes and one princess into the world. The workings of the inner harem was brutal. The main official wife, kept getting in her feelings and trying to control the other wives and concubines when she could. If she noticed that her husband favored anyone more than her, she would try killing them or setting them up. His mother was unfortunately one of these women. His mother had stayed in the king's chamber for an entire week which made the first wife drown in anger. She then made up a story about infidelity and hired witnesses to testify against his mother. There were over 100 witnesses. Of course the king would believe them. And what made matters worse was that, his mum never begged or belittled herself in front of him. She only said one sentence and that was it. Im innocent. Do what you want to do. It would have been better if she had screamed, begged or cried her eyes out. But the way she said it, made the king afraid that he had made a mistake. But since he had become a laughingstock in the entire capital, he had to follow through with the punishment. She had no proof, it was her word against hundreds. Even the some of the other wives had testified against her. Very quickly, those emotions left the king and anger took over his mind. How dare she act proudly when she was the one who was caught cheating? Did she take him for a fool? he thought, as he looking at the proud woman who stood before him, he decided to go ahead with the punishment, she would have to do the walk of shame, different empires had different rules, in Arcadina, cheating royals would be locked up shabby rooms for rest of their lives, or until their husbands forgave them, in Yodan, it was vastly different, the women would walk along distant completely nude while having food and rocks being thrown at them, after the walk, the cheating woman's marriage would be annulled. That year, the ninth prince had already turned sixteen and ran his cities independently. Once he got wind of his mum's situation, he rushed back to the capital and headed straight for the palace. H.D. looked at his hurt but prideful mother and anger rose within his heart. For a fact, he knew that his mother was innocent. But sometimes, he wished that she would at least talk or cry like other women did. Instead, she smiled at him and bottled up everything inside. That smile instantly brought him to tears. He loved her with all his heart and thought that if he became strong, he would easily protect her. But he was wrong. He looked at his weeping little sister of nine years old and hugged her tightly. Tomorrow was the day for the marriage annulment. Early the next morning, he held his mother's arm and led her towards the throne room. Within the continent of Pino, Different empires had their own beliefs and non-beliefs. The empire of Deiferous, believed in the goddess Serena. It was said that she was the one who created the stars, the moms and the land. She blessed the land as well as cursed it. So all marriages were blessed by her ministers. Arcadina for example, believed in the souls of their forefathers being gods. They would pray and call their ancestors gods. The empire of Tariq believed in the sea god. Corona believed in the god of fertility, and in Yodan, they believed in absolutely nothing. They thought it was ridiculous. If gods existed, where were they? Once they got to the throne room, the king said some rubbish mumbo jumbo and long story short, he annulled the marriage center packing. The king didn't even know his ninth son's name, he was only concerned with the first five. One of them would likely be the next ruler of the empire. He didn't choose a crown prince yet because he wanted his sons to prove themselves of being worthy to rule the empire. But this decision only made his harem more deadly and made his sons and wives plot to kill or assassinate each other. Even the princesses fought amongst themselves. 
His father looked at him coldly as he supported his mother's shoulders. Dot, 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 dot. He in turn, returned the gaze. As they locked eyes, the first wife whispered into the king's ears and sneered at him. You are to return all the knights under your care and work as an ordinary knight. I will give you fifty gold coins as your inheritance. Dot, dot, dot. Be lucky that I even had the heart to give you some. You can choose which town you would like to work in and he'll have you posted there immediately, his father said, the queen didn't want to allow him to have any knights for fear of revenge towards the disgrace she gave his mother, the look in the boy's eyes was strong, he would definitely kill her if he had the chance, I agree, but I also have one other request, I want to renounce my sister from being a royal, and I choose to be stationed within the city of Vienna, he replied, now that his mother had been sent away, he dared not keep his younger sister in the palace, those women would turn her into a slave or worse their punching bags. His father of course approved. The princess was his seventeenth child. He didn't even know her, talk less of caring about her. One less mouth to feed, he thought. Bari chose Vienna because ever since he ran the territory, everyone over there became his family and friends. He was sure that they would treat him kindly. And unlike most people within the empire, those in Vienna were very honest and somewhat pure, they had also been living far away from the capital, and didn't know much about the dark side of royalty, these people were a breathe of fresh air to him, it was the perfect place for the family of three, at that time, he failed to notice the evil twinkle within the queen's eyes, had he seen it, he wouldn't have been in this mess right now, as Santa looked at the message, he knew he had to rush over to Vienna, sigh, little brother Landon, it appears that he will come, bearing too many gifts this time around. Chapter 40 Late Comer Santa For the past one week, Landon had been waiting for the ship to come with the slaves. Landon had decided to use this period, to create more equipments for the new industries, that were about to be formed. And after waiting for another three days, he was informed that there were ten large ships sailing towards Baymard. From the system, Landon could identify the ships, they were Santa's ships. But why were there so many, just what was he thinking? Landon thought, on the shore, Landon looked at the ever smiling Santa and felt helpless, it was really hard to get angry with this jolly fellow, sigh, little bro, I've missed you, not seeing you all this while, has made my heart uneasy, little bro, I hope you're not mad at me for coming late dot 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 him, Santa said while giggling, everyone on the ship was surprised, isn't that the king, dot, why would he talk to a noble like that, before they had set sail to Baymard, Santa had explained to them the situation Baymard was in, he also assured them that the king of the newly independently established territory, would definitely treat them well, he had guaranteed them safety, shelter and food, back on the shore, Santu explained what happened and why he had brought ten ships of people with him. Long story short, once the ninth prince arrived Vienna, everything was going on fine at first. But a month later, there were sudden attacks and killings happening within the city. By the end of the next month, more than 11,000 people out of 96,000 people had died. When they had captured one of the attackers, it was revealed that the Queen had been sending a group of bandits called the Evergreen Bandits to harass the citizens, while trying to kill him. Once he was killed, it would be announced that him alongside the citizens, died from an attack from bandits. The Queen had to make sure that it wasn't traceable to her, so burning and killing other people was only their secondary mission. But when the bandits came, the prince alongside the city lord's knights fended them off bravely. At the end, their primary mission of killing Bari had failed. The queen became restless and ordered her secret knights and about 23 gangs with more than 5,000 people in each gang, to join forces and burn down the entire city. The city lord got wind of the plan early on and informed the prince. It was said that in the next three months, they would arrive Vienna and the attack would commence. So, they started evacuating the people from Vienna immediately. Once the Bari heard the news, he also sent a letter to Santa requesting for his help. Two months later, the city lord had evacuated all the barons, as well as over 71,650 people. The city lord of the next town was close friends with Basie as well. 
So Bari successfully settled these people to settle in his town with all their belongings. Four days after that, Sandhu arrived with ten giant sized ships. They boarded the ships and headed for Baymard. The city lord couldn't go with Bari because he was still an official in the empire. He took his family and his knights and headed back to the capital. Dot. Dot. Listening to the story, which felt like all those TV dramas he had watched, he was somewhat taken aback. He also felt pity for Bari, his family and the people. But basically, apart from the 800 slaves that Santu originally got, he still took 13,350 people from Vienna. So in total, they had 14,150 people on those ships. Although he felt sad for them, the amount of mud houses he built couldn't contain all of them. Forget it, he would just have to give them an estate in the upper region to live in. He decided to use the closest estate to the central region. Of course the prince and his family would live in the castle with him. Royalty was royalty. After all, Santa looked at Landon and smiled. Since you paid for 3,000 slaves, I will send the other 2,200 more. Remember, there are 800 slaves amongst the group, Santa said. How can I ask you for more? What kind of person do you think I am? You don't have to do that. It's because I know what kind of person you are that I'm willing to get more slaves for you. It would be good if you can save them from their salvory. These people are usually treated and treated even worse than animals. If they stay with you, I know that you would help them in every way possible. You're right. I agree with you. Since that's the case. I will pay you for your trip as well. And if you ever find refugees or people that need help, send them over as well, Landon said. After getting the gist, Landon sent 50 knights to call over all the overseers, supervisors, major generals, captains, his mother, Lucy, Grace, little Momo the head butler and maid to come over. He wanted to introduce them to everyone here. Once everyone arrived, Landon had them line up on the highest point of the ground. As he did that, he also had Santa gathered all the people along the sandy shores. System, can you amplify my voice? I want those at the back to hear me loud and clear. At the same time, I don't want those at the front to feel like I'm screaming. I want everyone to get the same volume or tune when I'm speaking. Host, yes I can. It will cost host 10 dp. 15 per 4 BP per hour. Why so expensive? Isn't it just amplification? Aren't you cheating me? If the host thinks that it's too expensive, then that is not the system's problem. The system is an almighty system and above petty arguments with host. Dot. Is host buying or not? Landon really thought that this system was a petty black bellied system. Above arguments? Please. Fine. He'll buy it then. Use my BP for one hour. My friends, I know that some of you feel helpless, scared and afraid. I assure you that Baymard will be a safe haven for you. You all had labored and toiled within Vienna, and had to face and witness death of your own friends and families. Yes, I'm talking about the 5,000 poor innocent souls that died from the first attack on your city. You all have been put through hell by those treacherous gangs who only feel pleasure from bloodshed. I promise you that within my territory, I will give you a new life and a new path, in which you all can proudly walk on. Whether you are slaves from Corona or citizens from Vienna, from this day forward, you all will be my friends and my family. Your pain will be my pain and your happiness will be mine as well. I hate that word slavery. It is vulgar and goes against my beliefs. In this land, there is no such thing as slavery. And there will never be. On my land, everyone has to go to school, and children are not allowed to work until they reach the age of 14, in which they can aptly or get what we call an internship for the time being until they finish school. With time, you all will come to understand and love Baymard, just as much as I love it. And if you face any issues within the territory, you can meet any of these people standing behind me, to aid or assist you. Once more dot 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 welcome to Baymard. Chapter 41 Prior Planning Prince Bari. What do you want to do now? Truth be told, when Bari looked at Landon, he didn't know how to react. After all, this was their first meeting. And Landon was younger than him. So, 
he was very confused on how to address him. He kept wondering whether Landon would feel threatened because he used to be a prince. Bari was an honest man, who would never take what didn't belong to him. When he was supposedly given cities to run, his father had let the city lords deal with politics and ruling the city, while he just fought and trained hard. As the ninth prince, he was brought up to basically never even dream of being ruler, because his father didn't want to give any sort of power to any of his other sons apart from the first five. The king asked the city lords to run the cities alongside his sons. This was the best way to spy or keep tabs on them. They were to report if any of his sons was planning or scheming to kill or even dream about killing himself or his five eldest sons. Initially, the city lords obeyed the king's orders, but when he got to know Bari, he changed his mind. In his opinion, Bari had never even thought of the throne for a single day, so there was nothing to report about. And as he got to know Bari, he began to form a strong bond with him as well. The queen would never allow any other child to rule the empire, other than her son. So she made sure that Bari and his other brothers were trained up as knights. They were brought up to only serve the real heir to the throne. That woman worked in the shadows. If any of the other children got more land or more followers, for sure they would have to die. With all this, as a prince, Bari was only trained with the way of the sword. In a way, he was similar to the old Landon. The old Landon, didn't give two Fs about running an empire or controlling a city. In fact, the old Landon was surprised that his father even gave him land at all. He honestly thought that when he would turn 15, he would move to a small village with his mom and Lucy, and then work as any other peasant. The money that they had saved was enough to take care of three mouths for the next 15 years, if they lived as peasants. The old Landon was also a humble quiet and simple-minded person. He never bit off more than what he could chew. As Bari looked at Landon, he became somewhat nervous. If Landon didn't like him, he might be thrown out of Baymard, along with his family. He didn't have a home anymore and was scared of rejection. To be honest, I want to be a knight. Bari answered nervously. Landon looked at him and smiled. Ha ha, why are you so stiff, since you are brothers with San? I mean Benjamin then I will be your brother, as well. Landon added hitting his back playfully, look over the elder bro, auntie is already smiling and laughing with my mom. Landon continued while pointing towards Barry's mother. Barry looked and was a little stunned. His mom would only ever laugh in front of him or his sister. No one, not even the king had seen her laugh. A deep and warm smile formed on his face. It seemed I worried for nothing he thought. Landon looked at him and sighed in relief. He didn't want Bari to feel any discomfort towards him. He knew that given Santa's personality, only those who were truly honest could be friends with Santa. Santa would never bring anyone one who wanted to harm or take his position as king to Baymard. And even if he did, for sure, Landon would kill the threat. If that's the case, once you complete your training under my army, I will make you a captain under my father Toby and your army general, Lucius. Once he was done, Landon stocked one of Santa's ships with a lot of feldspar and other air mineral laws. He also gave him more chalk and paint samples. At the end, he had made 1,200,000 gold coins from Santa. With 14,150 new people, Landon had more than enough workers to start his numerous projects. Landon had all the knights help everyone sign a non-disclosure agreement stating that within the next 20 years, whatever they learn can never be shared to those out of Baymard. He also read the rules and punishments that would follow if anyone disobeyed them, especially the disclosure form. The punishment was the death of the individual and his entire family. Everyone already swore in their hearts that they would keep whatever they had learnt in their hearts. Plus, they didn't know the Empire well and wasn't sure that any other nobles would care for them as Landon had promised. They weren't about to risk it at all. Amongst the group, 1,600 people volunteered to be knights, and were moved to the barracks. Landon decided to count Biri and his family of three, out of the work schedule as well. Lucky for him, there were some people who had professions while they were in Vienna. There were seven doctors, 14 nurses, six teachers, twenty blacksmiths and carpenters, 
nine alchemists and three people who used to work as government officials for the city lord of Vienna, making a total of 59 people. He also realized that there were 2,127 children from ages 014 within the group, presently, while the adults worked. The children would spend the entire day in one of the buildings on the school estate. They would play, eat and study sometimes. Landon had only assigned 28 caretakers for those children. Kinda like a preschool kindergarten vibe. They were divided according to the their ages and placed in separate rooms. He had made sure that for every age, there was someone to attend to them. There were those who were very young and still learning how to walk, while there were others who were 14 and liked running around and playing energetically in their classrooms. Little Momo, was also very lively in his classroom as well. Landon had made schedules that gave the children nap times, breaks, class time, play time, lunch, dinner and breakfast as well. And when the parents finished work, they would come over and take their children away. Many parents appreciated this system as it gave them time to do their own things without worrying about their kids. With this service, the adults who were at work, especially the women, felt very free and happy. These women felt liberated. They had always stayed at home, cooked, took care of the kids all day, while their husbands go out and come back whenever. They had always dreamt of trying out their husband's jobs or even doing something more with their lives. Some of them, even work alongside their husbands presently. How exciting! Generally, the daycare opens from 8am to 10pm. So for those with night shifts, when they finished their jobs at 9pm, they would still have time to pick up their kids. Landon was sure that if he ever stopped this daycare service, there would be riots and fights within the city. He had also built ten iron swings in the playground and cleared the fields for them to play in. In future, he would provide coloring books and toys for sure. Now that 2,127 more children were added to this number, Landon decided to add one more building towards daycare and also add 292 more caretakers, making a total of 2,428 children in Baymard. So each caretaker would be in charge of about 20 kids at once, while doing rotational shifts. Also, there were 369 elderly people who were between the age of 60 and above who had arrived Baymard as well. When Landon asked them what they wanted to do, all of them said that they wanted to stay at home with either their sons or daughters and look after the house while they were away. Landon agreed to their request and told them that if they needed anything, they should just tell any of the guards that they see. But there were also some people, who seriously surprised Landon as well. Chapter 42 The Three Musketeers There were three old men about the ages of 7,680, who said that they wanted to work in the mines, as fishermen or as hunters. Their families stood at their backs and surprisingly looked at Landon with an apologetic gaze. He didn't understand why they were looking at him in that manner. But after talking with these men for a while, he would fully understood the meaning behind those looks. All three, claimed to be as strong as an ox. One's name was Willow, while the other two were Herman and Pytus. Of course Landon would never allow these men to work in the mines, unless he was 99% sure that working there wouldn't affect their health in any way. As he looked at the three men he was even more convinced of his decision to say number. Landon literally thought that if they stood outside on a windy day, the wind would for sure blow them away. Kid, do you think that we are weaklings? Old man Herman asked. What? Pytus asked Herman as he didn't fully hear what Herman said. Pytus had hearing problems due to old age. He said that we are weaklings. Old man Willow repeated while shouting in Pytus' ear. Now Pytus got the gist. What? You dare say that we are weaklings? Landon didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. When did he say that they were weaklings? Or aren't they just twisting his words? Do you know who he is? Old man Pytus asked as he pointed at old man Willow. How the heck should I know? Landon thought. As Pytus spoke, old man Willow turned from side to side, as if posing in a male photo shoot. He started showing off his non-existent muscles as he flexed, 
Do you know who he is? Old man Herman exclaimed as well. This man here is the strongest man in the world. I beg to differ Landon thought as he looked at the flexing old man Willow. This guy here had once fought an assassin with a single finger. A real assassin. The most deadliest of them, old man Herman exclaimed while frantically waving his hands about. The fight was brutal I tell ya. Dot 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 he blocked a sword strike with his finger and used that same finger to slice off the man's ear. You think we are in a Uxia world? It's true. Dot 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 he cut the man's ear off with one finger, and reattached it back with another, while using his right leg to fend off the man's attacks. Old man Bitus said, that's biologically impossible. He was also, the only man to ever swim from Vienna to the continent of Corona without any boat. Dot. His limbs would have fallen out by now if it were true. He also caught a sea fish the size of an entire estate and beat it to a pulp. Old man Herman said, that would be a whale, and there's no way you could ever injure one. He once juggled five gigantic rocks using his right hand, while drinking wine with his left. What are you, Superman? Landon thought. Old man Willow looked at the unconvinced Landon and humped. Fine. If you don't believe it, then he'll prove it. Before Landon or any of the knights could stop him, old man Willow had already tried to lift up a large rock by his side. Crack. It's safe to say that he had failed woefully. Ah, my back. Dot dot you tricked me. Why didn't you tell me that the rock was heavy? You damn cheat, old man Willow said while wailing in agony, Landon hurriedly supported the man, so he cheated eh? How can you openly cheat like that? Old man Herman exclaimed, what? He cheated? Dot. It all makes sense. How could the strongest man loose to a tiny stone like this? Old man Bitus said as he nodded vigorously. How did it come to him cheating? And what did he mean by tiny? That stone is at least 200 kilograms all right. Landon turned around and saw Lucius and the knights trying to hold in their laughters. I request for a rematch. I'm not weak I tell ya. Dot. You probably bolted down the rock and cheated. Old man Willow said. Old man. Although I have the system, I would never use it in a fair competition all right. Dot. Wait, wait. Wait, what am I even saying, since when was this a competition? You clearly sprung this on me, and now you're claiming that I cheated? Look, no one is saying that any of you are weak. In fact, I think that you all are very strong, Landon said. So you think him stronger than you? Old man Willow asked. Absolutely, Landon replied. Landon felt truly helpless. How else was he supposed to answer him? Good. Just so long as you know that I'm the strongest man in the world old man Willow said while nodding his head. At the end, Landon talked the men into accepting jobs like gardening. Landon only wanted them to snip bushes or twigs within the royal garden. At first they denied, because they thought it was a job for sissies. He had spent the last 25 minutes trying to stroke their egos. These old men really made him feel like he was raising a child. They wanted to be coaxed and pampered. Everyone else called him your highness, but these men called him kid or brat. One can tell that they had always acted like this wherever they went. Dot. Dot. Landon looked at the large rock and decided to move it away from there. Who knew how many senior citizens would try to prove their strengths to him. He carried it up, and just when he was about to move with the stone, the three old men who were about leaving, saw him carrying the stone and ran back towards him. So you think you're better than us? You think you're stronger than me? Give the stone here, I will show you my strength. Looking at the old men running towards him. Landon finally understood why their families kept looking at him like that. F. Chapter 43 Oil Production After successfully running away from the old men, Landon continued his assessment. He soon realized that, he now had 9,700 adults who could work, out of the group of 14,125. Adding to the other 100 volunteers who built the mud houses previously, he now had a total of 9,800 workers. Landon didn't want to start building houses without a water and treatment plant, central heating plant and electricity. After browsing through his mind, 
he realized that the pipes needed to be connected through the walls of the house and so on. If he did it later, then he would have to break down the walls and floors, just to install these features. That was just double work. Landon had scheduled for home construction to be done four months later. That would be in September. Dot. Dot. He first started off with the crude oil refining process. To Landon, this section was the most important piece to the puzzle as it was essential for most departments. With oil, Landon could produce synthetic rubber, which could later be used to make tires, pipe insulation, rubber handle grips and other important tools. Also, he needed to use oil, as fuel for the electrically powered work machines that he was going to create. There was no way that the men could lift those gigantic heavy pipes that existed back on earth. They also had to put the pipes underground and move them from place to place. Hence, he needed heavy construction machines like dragline excavators, bulldozers and so on. System, can you locate the nearest underground crude oil reservoir? The system took a minute before answering him. Answering to host, there's one in the ocean, just 7.4 km from the shores. And another one. 3 kilometers away from the city wall. Landon didn't like those answers. He didn't have an oil drill ship, to go out into the sea. And his last option was out of the city itself. It was on the highway going to the next town. After thinking for a while, his eyes lit up. Didn't the system say that it was almighty? System, I want you to redirect the oil towards the lower region. Dot right. Here, Landon said while circling a certain area on his monitor. Not a problem host. Do you want it to be an oil seep or deep underground reservoir? For now, an oil seep would be the best option over underground oil reservoirs. Back on earth, there were a lot of oil industries that benefited because of oil seeps. In California USA, there are tiny lakes and ponds of pure crude oil floating on the earth's surface. These ponds, are the oil seeps. One doesn't necessarily have to dig the ground with a drill, to get the oil. The oils move upwards on their own. It's like all those cartoons that show when a man finds oil in the ground, the oil will squirt upwards, forcing itself out of the ground. Of course when Landon finally made his own drill, he would for sure dig up the ground and see oil. For now, the workers would have to use iron buckets and drums. Go scoop out the oil from the pond. Dot. It's safe to say that the system charged him for his request. At the end he had used, 280 technology points. Since, the other departments couldn't started without oil, Landon had all 9,800 workers help build a manually operated processing unit within the alchemy industry. He allocated one building for this process, and within three days, everything was built. They built three gravity tanks, five fractional distillation vessel that had an oven-like bottom, several storage tanks and a few mini heating systems. Landon wanted to use gravity to his advantage here, so he built the gravity tanks at a higher elevation level than that of the fractional distillation columns. Landon knew that when making oil products, it was necessary to drain the water in the oil first. He had requested for three tanks to be made so that when one is full and experiencing its wait time, the workers could fill the other two, as much as they liked. After two days, gravity had separated the water from the oil. The water was drained at the bottom and the oil was sent to the distillation column. Landon and Chief Wiggins watched as the oil flowed downwards towards the inlet of the distillation column. Your Highness. Are we in the distillation stage yet? Chief Wiggins asked as he looked at Landon all blue-eyed and bushy-tailed. Ever since Landon showed him the way, as he claims, Wiggins had become a five-year-old kid whenever he saw Landon. They would talk about math and chemistry, and Landon would solve any bumps or issues that he had along the way. Landon was sure that even on his wedding day, Chief Wiggins would still ask him a ton of questions. He was also sure that if he ever died, Chief Wiggins would probably slap his corpse wide awake. The man was obsessed with chemistry. The distillation process has just begun. He'll explain it to you, as the process continues. Wiggins nodded as he carefully followed Landon's explanation. There were five fractional distillation columns, but the process only needed three. The other two were backup, 
just in case any of the working columns need to undergo a routine maintenance check or gets damaged. A single column had six outlets and one inlet. These outlets were for the products, petroleum gas, gasoline, kerosene, diesel, lubricating oil, fuel oil and residue tar. Of course the crude oil was passed in through the inlet, the fire heated the oil, and the various products were formed due to vaporize at different temperatures. At this point Chief Wiggins was subconsciously holding Landon's wrist without him even knowing. Dude, it's just oil separation alright? Why the heck are you getting so excited? When I show you water purification in future, what are you going to do? Get a heart attack? Landon thought as he shook his head helplessly and continued to observe the process. Some of the products were passed through many heating systems, so as to remove any water, gases and unwanted carbons from them. From there, these oil products were sent on their way to their storage tanks. Since Landon didn't have a cooling system yet, he made the pipes connecting the products to the storage units extremely long. The pipes spiraled through what resembled a long aquarium filled with cold sea water. He then added mercury to the sea water, ensuring that the hot vapor in the pipes would be cooled down and turned into liquids, before reaching their storage tanks. Mercury was one of the coldest liquids in the world. At normal atmosphere pressure, mercury's state is that of an ice block. Chief Wiggins jumped around happily as he observed the final stages of the process. He had read of R. Diesel and the entire processing process from the book. But actually seeing the process made him a firm believer. Screw the ancestor gods that they had worshipped. Could they make this happen? Could they make oil? For him, Landon was God's sacred messenger, who was sent here to make them believe in the God of knowledge. If Landon knew what Chief Wiggins was thinking, he would definitely forbid him from spreading such beliefs. He didn't want to be worshipped at all. Although he had the system which was godly, Landon didn't truly believe that he was a messenger. For sure, he believed that some powerful being, maybe God even, created the system to move around developing countless worlds. It was just a job, nothing more. Plus how could he be a messenger, if he had never seen the person sending the message? Impossible. Dot. Dot. Just like that, the week had finally come to an end. Landon had successfully created the first batch of petroleum oil, as well as other oil based products like fuel and tar. Riverdale City. The wind howled against the trees and the sounds of crickets could be heard from afar. He accepted the job. Within two weeks, he should arrive, said a man with a cold tone. Excellent. Chapter 44 Military Rankings The Next Day. Dot. Dot. Today was the scheduled day for straightening and creating the rules and regulations for the army, as well as changing the various job descriptions. A while ago, he had twenty of the women who took care of the children, assist him in sewing material badges when the children had nap time or classes. He had also asked Department 4 to make a lot of safety pins for the badges. Those men who came a week ago, had to properly follow a rank system. Landon decided to follow the same military rank system that existed back on earth, the lowest rank being Private E1. For the enlisted soldiers to advance to the next grade, they needed to spend at least six months in each grade. Within the six months spent, they would have three physical and written exams. Those that pass will move to the next grade after six months. For higher personnel's ranks it was usually years. The ranks increases so, enlisted six months in rank to advance. Private E1 PV1 or recruits. Private E2 PV2. Private First Class E3 or PFC. Army Specialist E4. Corporal CPL. Sea Agent Sergeant. Staff Sergeant SSG. Sergeant First Class SFC. Master Sergeant Message. First Sergeant 1 SG. Sergeant Major SGM. Command Sergeant Major CSM. Sergeant Major of the Army SMA. Warrant Officers 1 Year Rank Advancement. Warrant Officer 1. Chief Warrant Officer 2. Chief Warrant Officer 3. Chief Warrant Officer 4. Chief Warrant Officer 5. Officer Ranks 2.5 Year Rank Advancement. 
First Lieutenant, Second Lieutenant, Caption, Major, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel, Brigadier General, Major General, Lieutenant General, General, General of the Army, Lucius. Of course, Lucius was presently in the position of General of the Army. He also adjusted the time spent in each grade. To fit this era, most knights who had originally come to Baymard with him, would be from warrant officers. They had been training since they were seven so they have at least ten years of experience under their belts. Within the new recruits, out of 1,200, only about 300 were previously knights. The rest were just ordinary people who volunteered to be in the army. Dot. Dot. Within this one week, the new recruits, both men and some women, were very happy with their choice. They studied trained and formed strong bonds with one another. Those that were slaves within the group, started opening up more and even joking around here and there. The military atmosphere was truly beautiful to them. Some were already orphans as it was. But now, they shared clean and spacious rooms with other roommates, had fun and during their breaks, they would run around Baymard happily. Those who were already knights were also grouped with Landon's original knights and trained. He wanted the men to change the way they called themselves. They were soldiers in the army, not knights in the barracks. Everywhere in the army estate, he had put wood and sign boards and written different words using paint. These signs showed different directions and the names of buildings, so that nobody would get lost. These signs would generally say, Baymard Army, Hospital or Baymard Army, Training Facilities, something like that. Landon's main point was that, once they saw this daily dot 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 eventually it would stick to their minds like glue, and soon, they would see themselves like soldiers in the army, and not knights. He also decided that he would make the military fort like a school. They would go to class, study war tactics, study their weapons, do physical training, shooting practices, first aid studies and so on. He also provided enough holiday time and pay for each individual, so that those who got married could leave and spend time with their wife and children, or husbands. Most of them were new, and fell in the private E1 category. So he had some of his warrant officers split them into groups and teach them during their scheduled class time and field trainings. They were to understand the safety measures involving each military weapon, as well as study the weapon intently. He also gave iron whistles to all those who were within the warrant officer class, officer ranks, and finally to Lucius. They were to train and mold the soldiers with the whistles. Dot. Dot. Today, he distributed the batches and posted the rules and regulations on a large notice board with pins. He also posted class schedules outside the regular Baymard class schedules and field training schedules dot 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 as well as the punishments for violating each law. Once he was done, he closed the board with a glass frame, so that no one would dirty the board or the paper. He placed all the boards alongside each other and stepped away. The boards were as wide as six chalkboards joined together. The first board showed clear white parchment papers detailing the military rules and regulations, as well as punishment for each rule. The second, third and fourth showed everyone's name and rank arranged alphabetically, depending on their ranks. The second showed those within the enlisted ranks. The third showed those who were warrant officers and the fourth showed those who had officer ranks. The fifth board showed the latest military news and exam schedules for each rank. And finally, the sixth board showed a gigantic map of the enter military fort. Landon had paid the system to create a detailed colorful map that even had the names of each building written down. Also, in all buildings, he had put building maps that showed where each room was and what direction they had to go to get there. Each floor was labeled floor G, A, B, C, and so on. Dot. All the new recruits were each given their schedules and a minimap of the extremely large military fort by their major generals and captains. There were about 27 large buildings in the estate. Landon wanted to make sure that they didn't get lost easily while staying and studying here. The recruits also received badges and safety pins each. Landon had informed them that when they were on duty, on within the fort or in training, 
they had to wear their badges. The badges had different colors and strips. All enlisted soldiers had green badges, but their stripes were different colors depending on your rank. Their warrant officers wore blue badges and again had different strip colors as their ranks increased. The officer ranks wore red badges, while Lucius as the highest authority within the fort, wore a silver badge. They only had to pin one a day. They were given a total six badges, should in case they lose them. Landon had also requested for Department 4 of the construction industry, to weld lockers, locks and keys for each soldier, as well as create proper obstacle courses for the soldiers. Dot. Dot. As the day came to an end, some people were excited over their ranks and badges within the army while others were pumped up about exploring the fort. Some of them didn't even know that there were so many buildings within the fort. It was all new and exciting to them. A 29-year-old lady, was being led by a soldier on duty, to where Landon was standing. Is it time? Yes my king. Chapter 45 The duties of a king ever since he created the daycare system. Landon had been visiting the children once a week. He would tell them stories that engulfed morality, compassion, loyalty, hope and all over basic qualities that made humans who they were. Landon thought that this era was completely bullshit. There were hardly any morals being taught here. To them, strength was everything, fighting, killing and so on. Landon wanted people to only do so if they were left with no choice. He didn't want the children to kill people just because they could. Death was normal to this people. If most of the people in power were somehow transported to earth, Landon was sure that they would be institutionalized. To many of the people in this world, loyalty was only relevant when money or power was involved. But not everyone was bad. The most corrupt places were those close to the capitals of most empires. The towns or cities at the outskirts usually had far less corruption involved. Every noble liked being close to the royal capital cities. Landon could understand their plight in this case. For example, back on earth, most people would leave the countryside to go to the big city where corrupt trained and violence prevailed. Country people were simple-minded. They had their farms. They were kind to their neighbors and so on. Coming back to the situation in this era, Earth was still a haven. Earth had rules that forbade open murder, and physical abuse. There were some 13 years old slaves, that were already used sex toys or house pets. What the heck? This was clearly child molestation. What was wrong with this people? Those bastards needed to be locked up and beaten to a pulp. Barons did it. Kings did it. Rich merchants did it. This whole world should be thrown in the trash can. Throw it away. Landon had told the caretakers to treat those who were abused with extreme care. He had realized that they didn't value their lives at all. They were just like empty vessels without a soul. This world was too cruel for those without power. That's why, a London had made up his mind to only take slaves or refugees into Baymard. He would build a paradise that, not even the so-called rich people could make. That was his vow to them. The children between the ages of 414, gathered around the largest room in the building. They sat down crossed-legged, and waited for the story to begin. Every week, they looked forward to Landon's stories. Dot. Dot. Thousands of years ago, in an ancient empire called China, there lived a beautiful young woman named Milan. As he told the story, the kids became very sad for Milan, as the matchmaker had confirmed that she would never be a bride. When they learned that her father was going out to war again, they became even more depressed. Landon looked at their jittery faces and smiled. Did you know what she did? The children shook their heads and leaned towards Landon in anticipation. Late that night, she made a big decision. The biggest of them all. So ooh ooh ooh. Big. The children felt extremely anxious at this point. Even the caretakers who were listening at the back, felt like they were about to die from the suspense. Your Highness, can you please get to the point? They thought. Landon continued his tale, all the while pretending not to see their anxious gazes. After saying a prayer to the ancestors, she used her father's old sword and cut her hair short. Then. She took her father's warrior clothes and dressed herself up like a man. Everyone gasped. A woman's hair in this era, 
signified her youth and her beauty. Only married women could cut their hair. A young unmarried woman could braid her hair, leave it free and unbound, or butt it in buns. Milan had just cut her hair, while she was unmarried, and the matchmaker didn't even approve of her to be a wife yet. How was she, to find a husband? Will she be unmarried forever? Plus was it okay? for a girl to be in the army, although they knew that his highness had recruited women to join Baymard's army, they couldn't fully understand why he did that, and now this Milan girl also joined the army, weren't women supposed to just cook, so, farm, clean the house and take care of their children? Dot. As her parents slept, Milan jumped onto her father's horse, Khan, and took off, as Landon recited the tale. The children would exclaim or get angry as they listened. Stupid Huns. Bad Huns bad Huns. Dot 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 sniff. Sniff poor Milan. She's so brave. Oh no. Theres are rounded. Go mush you. I like Uncle Emperor. Wah. She found a husband. And just like that, Landon had passed two hours giving a detailed version of Milan to the children. Dot. Dot. Auntie Beverly please sit dot 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 how are the children doing? An elderly woman smiled as she sat next to Landon. She was the wife of Chief Wiggins. The first time she met Landon, she was surprised by his manner of speech. He always called those older than him seniors, aunties or even grandpa. He was very respectful towards his seniors. People in power usually didn't care about age seniority. Money and power were the only way to show real seniority in this world. She very much, like this new king of theirs. Actually, the only people Landon never used those titles with, were his knights and the workers within the industries. Landon had formed a bond with them and didn't feel the need to call them so. He was a man from Earth after all and his family had raised him with high moral values. He couldn't just break these habits away, just because he was in a new world. Plus this was Chief Wiggins' wife. There was no way that he would ever disrespect her. Your Highness. The children are learning very fast and efficiently. We already have some bright ones in the groups as well. Some of them in class 7 7 years old can already recite the timetable and write letters clearly. Those in the younger classes also know the alphabets by heart as well she said, good dot dot good. What about the newcomers? Your highness dot 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 we did as you requested. Some of the slaves have already started to look fuller, compared to when they first got here. They now smile more and are starting to open up, bit by bit. Soon, they would know that they are safe here your highness. Landon smiled and nodded as he listened. You all have worked very hard. It's what we ought to do. Your Highness, she said while shaking her head. Oh yeah, I'm going back to the lower regions. Is there anything you want me to give Chief Wiggins? As soon as Beverly heard Landon, her eyes lit up and she quickly rushed to the kitchen and grabbed a basket of food. Sorry to trouble you Your Highness. Erm, um, this is his lunch, she said while handing over a large basket to Landon. Landon could smell the sweet aroma of baked bread. It must be nice to be married. Right auntie, dot 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 hi hi hi, Beverly turned all red, your highness why must you tease me so, she said while placing both hands on her hips, Landon giggled, and hurriedly walked out the door as fast as he could, honestly, this child, she said while smiling, in her eyes, Landon was still a 15 year old boy who was forced to act tough now and then, she smiled and looked out the window. Times have changed. Chapter 46 Queen of Isroth Yodan Empire Crash A clay vase ornament was thrown at the floor, nearly hitting the five shivering men, who were kneeling down quietly. In their hearts, the woman before them was the incarnation of the devil. You damn buffoons. Where are they? No one answered here as they nervously looked at the ground. She took an apple and threw it at them. Answer me goddamn it. She yelled, my queen. W. We tried our best dot 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 b dot dot but. One of the men finally spoke fearfully. But, 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 but what? Must I do all the work myself? Dot 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 answer me. She yelled. The men didn't know whether to speak or not. If they spoke she would get mad. And if they didn't, she would still get mad. My q dot dot queen. 
we were only able to confirm tha dot dot that they left the Empire on a ship, our subordinates. RTR. Trying their best another man said, so are you saying it's my fault? Dot. How dare you? She said angrily as she quickly grabbed a sword and sliced the man's left hand off. Slice. Good. Useless men don't need hands she said, she had meant to cut off his head. But when the man saw the blade, he leaned back with his hands up, and instead got his left one cleanly cut. Better hands than my head, he thought. The man felt a heart-wrenching pain dot 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 but he knew that if he made a sound, this maniac of a queen would kill, not just him, but his entire family as well. She looked at the blood on her shans and she became more pissed off. Just as she was about to vent her anger on another man, a maid walked in and whispered into her right ear. She dropped the sword and slowly sat down on her chair. The king was coming. You all can go. Use the back exit. The men praised whoever it was that had saved them, as they hurriedly got up from the floor. Dot 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 and just as they were about to leave, the devil intervened. Wait, I change my mind. Guards, take these men to the dark room and torture them to death. I believe that they are spies from my husband's enemies. The queen's command was simple torture these men under the excuse of them being spies for the king's enemies. The men who were previously kneeling, didn't even struggle, the color from their faces were completely drained, as she watched the men being dragged out, a gruesome smile was plastered on her face, it's only a matter of time, Baymard, over the past one week and five days, Landon had been shuttling between four different groups, of course, out of the group of slaves and refugees that arrived, Landon allocated, 1000 wood cutting, 1200 to rubber production, 1200 to pipe production, 6000 towards building construction machines like excavators and trenches, 800 towards building fuel based electrical systems for these heavy construction machines. Of course previously, he had already allocated 200 workers towards crude oil refining and added 300 workers to department 4. As for the wood cutting group, he basically needed them to fall down trees and make different plank sizes and shapes. Landon had noticed that when other companies needed wood, they would go and cut trees to get it. That wasted everybody's time. Plus in the future, Landon would also need a lot of wood to make molds as a foundation foot for construction. He needed wooden plank boards ready at all times, when any department wanted to build anything. The first thing he did, was show the workers how to use the two-man saw. He and Chris the newly appointed supervisor fell down a tree with the saw and used the other saw types, to cleanly cut the wood into several shapes and sizes. From then on, he gave different sketches to Chris showing the different measurements for different planks, as well as teach the workers how to use the measuring stick and other tools. Dot. Dot. As for the pipe making industry, Landon needed them to start producing them a sap, some of the pipes he needed were huge and ridiculously large, those pipes were typically the ones used in industries and all around the city, those pipes would carry water and sewage, all around Baymard. Of course he also needed to start making house pipes as well. He needed, industrial steel pipes, cast iron pipes, PVC pipes, and so on. During this period, Landon had also explained and aided another group of workers to create heavy construction machines. He explained to them where each part went, and the importance and function of the parts. Since he was basically an electrical engineer, he also taught a group of workers how to make cables and how to create an electric system for heavy construction machines and cars. The first thing they succeeded in building was a trencher. Once it was completed, Landon called over both the electrical, heavy machine building and rubber making teams, to witness and see how they were to install them. He called the rubber team over so they could see and understand why rubber was important, as well as witness their creation. Tim and a few supervisors also came as well. Everyone paid careful attention to what Landon was doing. He hooked up the tires and connected the electrical cables to the trencher. Then he explained where the fuel went, how water would be used to cool down the engine and every other thing involving the machine. He then went poured fuel into the engine, 
inserted the key, VRRMMMMM VRMMMMM, everyone was shocked, it's alive, it's alive, ha 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 did you see that, it's moving without a horse, honestly the workers admired Lankin's creativity and vision, in their minds, not anyone could come up with such things, he was simply a genius, they were really thanking God that they chose to come to Baymard, Landon drove forward and chose an empty spot for practice, he pulled down a gear stick and the machine instantly dug the ground as it moved, trenches were good for digging up the ground for installing underground pipes and electrical cables, ah, oh my god, did you see how it digs into the ground as it walks, what a godly carriage, and just like that, the curtains were closed, and it was finally, the end of the day, the night sky was dark and mysterious, its black beauty and mildness, crept through the world, engulfed with several fleets of stars, it was the biggest indicator for sleep, the kind of rest that puts one, in a steady and peaceful state of mind, its tenderest and warmth engrossed Landon's mind, as he laid on his bed, he needed some rest, and just when Landon was about to fly into dreamland, this sweet and gentle warmth, was interrupted, intruder alert, intruder alert, chapter 47 notice, chapter 47 notice, need to take time off, exam period, sorry guys. Thanks for the love. Chapter 48 Notice 2. Chapter 48 Notice 2. False alarm guys. My friend just told me. That it's not now. Dot 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 hi hi. Chapter 49 Assassination Attempt What? Dot it was already 11.30 pm. Who could be coming here at this time of the night? Dot dot and how far away are they from the gates? Answering host. The intruder seems to be carrying a lot of weapons and is filled with killing intent. He has just left his horse two kilometers away from the gate and will arrive the perimeter of Baymard within 26 minutes. So it's an assassin ha. Huh? Dumbo had been very annoyed this past few weeks. As a top assassin, his assassination prey were always important ministers, nobles, blood gangs knights and other noble figures. But to send him to kill a weak and disowned child, who didn't even have up to 400 knights under his command dot 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 was the height of disrespect, they even paid a hefty amount for the little brat's head, it's either they had too much money, or this was their first assassination request, at least that's what Dumba thought, just who did they think he was, he was the fifth best assassin in the empire, out of millions of people, he was the fifth, he had been trained and properly brought up by a former assassin, dot dot he knew all the tricks and ways to kill, torture and people, he had never failed at any mission assigned to him, for a city lord of a tiny city to call him, and dare insult him like this, dot. This was the highest form of disrespect he had ever gotten as an assassin, it was a rule of thumb, that he would only accept challenging and dangerous missions, just how was this one of those missions, he had used close to two months to rush down here, to get the job done, he didn't even put Landon in his eyes, that was why he decided that he would kill a patrol guard, switch clothes, so as to sneak into Baymard, but what Umbu didn't know was that in the eyes of Baron Rogers, his mission was a deadly one, if the king gets whim of what he had done while in Baymard, only death awaited him and his family, he had already made up his mind that after killing Landon, he would kill city lord Shannon and Baron Rogers as well, this was their punishment, heavily insulted his dignity, from the information they gave him and what what he had gathered, it was said that Baymard lacked any potential threat to him, he had heard that all the soldiers were the worst in the empire, and that Landon was bedridden with illness, many people testified that when he left the capital, his complexion was so pale and blue that one could death calling on to him, from what he gathered, his only threat would be Commander Lucius, nobody really knew why the commander had quite his position in the capital, some claimed that he was Landon's biological father, while others said he was fired due to illicit actions with Landon's mother, so overall, everything he knew about this mission really ticked him off, it seemed like a bore, what a waste of time, he thought, Dumbo was walking stealthily by the perimeter of the forest, as he didn't dare to move further into it, it would be funny if, he was suddenly attacked by wild animals while on a mission, only seven minutes left before he could reach the empty fields, in truth, 
At the front of the gate was a large empty field that resembled a large football field. The forest only began after the field, since the night was pitch black. Dumbo had planned to crawl across the field until he was close to one of the patrolling guards. Then, he would make his move. Suddenly, th -th 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 three blades attacked him from behind. With his training, he could easily sense the killing intent from the blades. He quickly dodged the first two, but the last one hit him on his left butt cheek. Ah, he seriously regretted dodging the way he did. How was he going to sit down now? And who the hell attacked him? Again, he heard no less than 50 weapons coming straight at him from all angles. He was shocked. Did the banished prince have a powerful force backing him? Dumbo tried to dodge them but it was to no avail. More than 12 of those knives pierced through his body violently. W dot 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 who are you? Dumbo asked. Who I am, is not important. What's important is that you're trying to take my prey. Once Dumbo heard that, he was stunned, and became angry that those idiot nobles actually hired another person as well. He closed his eyes and wished that he could strangle them to death. He swore in his heart that if he finally left this place, he would kill them and dance on their graves. Landon was talking through the system, as he lay down on his bed. Dumbo tried to find the location of the voice. And when he thought he had it, he threw knives towards the place, and Landon immediately pretended to be hurt. How dare you hit my knee and waist, Landon said to him, while pretending to be wounded. Ha 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 serves you right. Damn you dot 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 I will spare your life, and leave this mission to you then. I hope we never cross paths again. Or I will for sure take my revenge, Landon said while pretending to be heavily injured. He almost wanted to give himself an Oscar for his performance. As Dumbo concentrated on the man in the shadows, he failed to feel the tree branches slowly moving around his boots. When he wanted to finally move, he felt something tugging on his leg. The more he pulled, the stronger the vines held onto him. And finally, his body was all covered by the vines. After 45 minutes of struggling, he became fear crept into his heart and he decided to yell. The rate at which the plant was choking and binding him, was too scary. It was better to die by the hands of any man whether weak or strong, than by a plant. How could he be content with that kind of death as an assassin? At least if he got captured, there would be a chance that he might escape. 45 minutes later, Josh knocked on Landon's door. My king, we caught an assassin. Chapter 50 tortured the reason Landon didn't go and fight with the assassin previously, was because it would be too troublesome for him to explain how he knew of the attack beforehand. So he decided to act out in the shadows, and let the guards accidentally catch the so-called assassin. And if he was to use the system to teleport out of the gates, how was he supposed to explain how he had suddenly passed the guards, who by the way, were guarding the gates all day and night? It was just too bothersome, Landon's castle dungeon. Aren't you going to remove these vines from my body? Dumbo asked with an annoyed and prideful tone. Landon looked at him, and whispered something into Lucius' ear. Lucius was confused but still decided to do as he was told. Dumbo couldn't care less about what kind of torture they gave him. He wouldn't break that easy. As assassin, when while training, he had been tortured by his teacher daily, just to get used to the idea of pain. What could a useless brat like Landon know? Or so he thought. Landon knew what he was thinking, not all torture had to involve whipping, boxing and so on. For a man like Dumbo, that kind of torture would only make him smile. Once Lucius brought the stuff, Landon cut his clothes off carefully avoiding the old vines roped around his ankle waist and upper arms. He also threw oil on him, and poured salt all over Dumbo's body. He then soaked Dumbo's feet in salty water. Lucius, Bari, the Major Generals and even Dumbo the Assassin were confused. Did he plan on cooking him? What kind of torture was this? Back on Earth, when Landon had been forced to take world history as a non-elective course in the university, he had come across an interesting fact. In the 17th century, the tickle torture was invented and used in Europe, China, Egypt, Rome and other countries. Later on, by World War II, P. 
people said they had witnessed the Nazi prison guards, using this method to torture and kill people. Landon wanted to test out the effectiveness of this method for himself. Three minutes later, Captain Thray brought four goats into the room. Once the goats came in, they immediately ran towards Dumbo and started licking him aggressively. Slurp slurp slurp. Twelve minutes into the torture, Dumbo was laughing his lungs out while crying. Continuous laughter can cause the body to go into cardiac arrest or asphyxia. Cardiac arrest equals sudden loss of blood flow. Asphyxia equals lack of sufficient oxygen to be body due to abnormal breathing. As the torture went on, Dumbo felt it hard to breath and his body kept aching with pain all over. Please. Ha ha. Please. Ha 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 dot dot street dot street. Ha ha. Stop. I'll tell you. Ha ha. Whatever ha ha. You want to know Dumbo begged while crying. Everyone in the room was confused. Was it really that painful? He looked like he was laughing his life out. When did Landon actually torture him? Dumbo on the other hand, swore that if he had the chance, he would for kill Landon. This disgrace and humiliation was too much. Landon felt his killing intent and smiled. He had the men hold the hungry goats, while he walked closer to Dumbo. Speak. Who are they? Free me first, then he'll tell you Dumbo said, while struggling to breathe. Do you really think that I don't know who is trying to kill me? Wasn't it the Baron? In truth, Landon had no clue of who it could be. But after accessing the situation more, he had cancelled out his entire royal family. After they had successfully poisoned him with the poison, there was no way that they would still hire an assassin all the way from the capital, just so they could kill him. His siblings would definitely feel that, it would be wasteful to use an assassin on him. They saw him as trash, dirt, vermin. To them, he wasn't even worthy of having their attention. But the city lord and barons were a different matter. He was sure that it was one of the barons because on his way here, he had heard that the king had ordered the city lord to move back to the capital. He knew that this assassination attempt could only stem from greed. Right now. Landon was just probing Dumbo, to see if he would show any reaction to it being a baron. Dumbo was shocked and eyed Landon to see whether he was lying or not. Dot 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 After observing for a while, he realized that this little bastard actually knew his enemies. But you don't know who he is working with, from behind the shadows. If you agree to untie me, I can tell you. Everyone else in the room thought it was a bad idea. Landon smiled moved closer and freed him. Once he was freed, he quickly tried to snap Landon's neck, with his bare hands. Landon pulled out his waist knife and immediately poked his acupuncture points. Dumbo froze and Landon made a clean cut through his throat, instantly killing him. Fatality. Landon wins. All this happened in less than a minute. Everyone started at Landon, as they opened their eyes widely. My king. Did you really know who it was? Gary asked. No I didn't. But I could come up with a suspect based on our time in Baymard. My family is too conceited and will never stoop so low as to use an assassin on me. At least not presently. But if they find out that I became strong, then for sure they would definitely send one. But presently they still think him still sick. And since the former city lord left for the capital, only the barons would do this. But why? We've never even met them my lord Thray asked confusedly. Greed. My guess is, they still want to make money from the mines. Maybe they were transferred to a terrible place or many they want more money to increase their power. Who knows. They all nodded their heads, as they listened to what Landon said. But the question is, which baron? Thray asked. I think we should send some men to scout and find his horse and his belongings. It was unlikely that he walked all the way from wherever he came from, Lucius replied. Excellent. I couldn't have said it better myself. Dot 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 tonight you all did great. Now. Free the goats, so they can keep feasting on their food. And when they are done, dispose of the body. Everyone was stunned by what Landon said. He's already dead. Why let his corpse suffer this sort of humiliation? Those that come after my life, family, friends and my people, shall never be forgiven. I will never let my enemies off. Even after death, 
Landon said with an intimidating aura. The men couldn't help but felt sorry for the people who tried to provoke His Highness Landon. They almost wanted to make a short prayer to their ancestors for them. Their king was too scary towards people who attacked him and those that he loved. But it was this method of taking action that made them stand firm behind him. They looked at him proudly. His aura was that of a man who ruled several nations. This was their ruler. This was their king. Chapter 51 Safety First Syntheric Rubber Previously, Landon had allocated all the new workers towards the construction industry. He had made up his mind that, the next batch of slaves that Santa brought would be sent over to the other two industries. But right now, he needed people who could build. Today, he wanted to make synthetic rubber, every week. Landon had to give first aid to treat the workers in the mines. Although he had made them mine carts that were on rails, they still injured themselves. When they had to carry the stones and load the cart, some of them would accidentally drop them on their feet. This had been happening for a while now. Even the working gloves in this era was trash. It could only block 60% of the injuries they were getting on their palms. The gloves were not effective. They would wrap a lot of clothes around their palms. And then wear normal thin material gloves over them. What could that do? That's why the first thing Landon had thought about was safety. Hence the manufacturing of rubber. Back on Earth 90% of products had rubber in them. From bicycle handles to housing and pipe insulation. School stamps. Heck. Even toothbrushes were made from rubber, there was no way that he would allow the scientist the lab to keep working without gloves or other protective gear. For now, they hadn't touched any corrosive substances. But what about the future? Was he going to let their skin burn? He needed to make thick rubber boots, rubber gloves, earmuffs, eye shields and even helmets. In fact, Landon didn't believe that anyone could start building an advanced empire without any safety gear. F this shit. This wasn't a Uxian novel. They were real people who could die at any time. Plus, previously, there was no doctor or nurse available. The people used to just wash the wounds with water and tie it with a piece of clothing. Landon took up the duty as an industry nurse and gave them first aid treatment whenever they were injured. Due to the system's first reward about farming and crops, Landon knew what herbs were medicinal to their injuries. Now, that there were seven doctors and fourteen nurses, Landon had assigned each doctor with two nurses. He assigned each doctor to different stations. Three for the three industries in the lower region, one for the military, one for the school and two would remain at a new estate which Landon had given as a hospital. While they were on duty, they read the chemistry and mathematics textbooks that His Highness gave them. Landon wanted them to start understanding things like matter, reactions and so on. Chemistry and math were used in every profession. They needed to know about ions, protons and so on. The human body has over a hundred chemical reactions happening at once. They needed to know about reversible and irreversible reactions, metabolism and so on. Even drug making and pharmaceuticals dealt with a lot of chemistry and math. He wanted to prepare them for when he would finally teach them new techniques and give them biology textbooks. That would be once he got his reward from the system. Even if he was rewarded today by the system. Landon wouldn't teach them anything unless they studied these ones first. With other departments, they could learn on the job quickly. But this one dealt with human life and health. He wasn't going to teach them how to perform surgeries if they couldn't understand the basics. The nurses also have to learn as well. They should be able to identify drugs in medicine, as well as administer the treatment with syringes and so on. They could also do surgeries as well. They assisted the doctors within the surgery room. So they too had to know what was being done. What if the doctor was a quack and was about to inject poison into Samion's bloodstream? Were they just supposed to watch? Nah, it was their bound duty to know whatever is done to the patient. In fact Landon had made up his mind that, when he finally taught them everything, they would have to make an oath towards their profession and Baymard. He wasn't taking any chances. Oaths in this era were sacred and holy. It was the highest form of loyalty one could place. With the help of the doctors, Landon was able to let go of nursing duties for the lower region and around Baymard. Dot. Dot. Tim, 
are all the equipments and vessels built. It had been a week and three days since Landon had asked Tim to create these vessels. On the same day that he had asked the system to get crude oil, he had asked Tim to start construction immediately. Yes your highness, it's completed. Good. Get 1,200 people from the new workers in department 4 and let them fill the first tank with petroleum oil. No problem your highness, Tim replied and made his way out. Once they had filled up the tank, Landon decided to start. Landon and the assigned workers, refined a mixture of petroleum oil, coal and the solvent hexane. They piped the ingredients through three columns, to boil off any residual water, essentially purifying them. Then, they combined and refined them with a catalyst. And after a while, synthetic rubber was produced. Tim and the workers looked at the white milky product and wondered what could be made from them. Once the first set was produced, Landon showed them how to store and handle the products. Tim, all 2000 workers will stay here to make these products, Landon said as he handed over the a ton of papers to Tim. I will show you what to do and how to use the other equipments to produce the products. Different rubber products needed different chemicals to be added to them. There were five major chemicals needed for all different rubber products. So Landon had the storage tank of the milky liquid rubber, connected to five outlet pipes as well. The outlets would lead to different stations within the rubber department. Landon decided to start with one of the most difficult products. Rubber tires. Preferably construction machine tires. Landon manually opened the valve, for the pipeline between his station and the storage tank. Soon, the creamy liquid rubber and headed towards the tank next to him. Once he felt like he had enough, he closed the valve. Landon then added, silica, bistreth oxypropyl and carbon black to the creamy rubber. Landon had built a steam water mixer tank, that would constantly mix anything, provided water is used as its fuel. He then added water to the mixer engine, and after a while, it started stirring the materials in the tank vigorously. The mixer head resembled egg beaters. These mixers should never be turned off unless there was nothing in the tank. So Landon decided to have the men pour water every three hours. Once the mixture was uniform, Landon opened another valve that allowed the creamy mixture, to flow towards another boiler tank, where another solvent mixture and water were added. As he boiled off the solvent, the rubber starting forming tiny balls that were the size of beans. Once the solvent had completely evaporated, all that was left was water and bean size white balls. He then sent the products to another vessel, which acted as a filter. And finally the rubber was sent to a steam compressor to completely dry down. Now the rubber looked like soft rice balls. Landon had the men form bales of tire synthetic rubber. He then took out one of those bales, reheated it, and used polychloropene and other chemicals to completely vulcanize it. After creating a mold for the tire, he poured the vulcanized rubber into mold and allowed it to cool down for four hours. While it was cooling down, he showed them how to make other rubber materials. And by the end of the day, Landon had made four pair of gloves, a pair of rubber boots and one gigantic tire. He had also made a lot of dried bales for each rubber product. Dot. Dot. Now he could progress he could safely progress with his plans. Chapter 52 Carrie Barn Carrie took the letter from her most trusted knight, Killian, and opened it slowly. The dark haired knight stood at her side, waiting for further instructions. Carrie looked at the document and smiled. Everything was going according to plan. Carrie was Elis' blood sister. She and her mom had been working hard to keep her brother as the crown prince. She had been given a large estate in the capital with 5,000 knights under her command. Lately, her half-brothers had been trying to push their father, into choosing one of them in Elis' place. She had also been fighting with her sister on the low. That bitch was too cunning. Jeanette had been her biggest nemesis ever since she could remember. The bitch would badmouth her to her father, while using the whole white lotus act to garner pity. Everyone always thought that she, was the one who always bullied Jeanette. That bitch had turned her into a villain in front of the entire empire. Jeanette was her second mother's daughter. She as the first wife's daughter, 
had more access and privileges than Jeanette. This led to a power struggle between the two. And now, the bitch joined hands with her other half-siblings to kill Eli. When her brother had informed her of the assassination attempt and the Jeanette's sudden visit, she was fuming mad. How dare they? Since they wanted to do things the hard way, then she would just have to play along with them. Wasn't she a villain? Dot 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 in that case, it was time for her to act her part, so as not to disappoint them. Killian. Yes princess. Let's go see our dear ministers, shall we? Carrie followed her guards and stepped into her estate dungeon. There were two badly bruised men, who were tied up and stretched wide with chains. These men were the ministers supporting Connor and James Barn. Wake them up, she said. Killian and another guard, took iron buckets of cold water and threw it on their faces. Splash! The water hit their faces and instantly woke them up. Ah! The men yelled. The knights started boxing them violently, until blood spat out of their mouths. My dear ministers, do you know how much trouble you have caused me? Dot. Do you know how much money I have lost trying to quiet people down? Dot. Do you? She yelled while hitting them with a large iron rod. Peng. Peng. Ah. Dot. Please so. Dot dot stop. Dot. We won't do it aga dot dot ain. One cried out. The rod had accidentally hit his manhood, when she swung it at his waist. That kind of pain was one that no man should face. F the second prince, he was trying to live. You coward. Dot. Just this much and you're already giving up. Are you a man? The another one said while catching his breath. Carrie looked at him and smiled. She gently put down her rod and walked over to him. Then she held his chin with her palms and massaged it. Men like you are air. You're loyal, strong and so dot dot so. Manly. Too bad you chose the wrong side. Killian, bring the tools. Carrie walked to the other one and smiled. He's right you know. Just this much and you want to give up on your prince? Dot. Tsk tsk tsk. Dot. You know. What I hate the most are cowards. Dot. The man's face was completely pale now, and he was shaking like a leaf. I'm going to enjoy killing you, she said with a seductive smile on her face. When everything was brought, she started cutting their fingers and toes, one by one. Ah. Please dot 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 I'm begging you. Stop. Comma the first man cried. He had tears, snot and swear all over his face. Truly pathetic. Honestly, Carrie admired the second one. No matter what she did, he didn't even let out a sound. Too bad he was the enemy. She later continued by dislocating their arms and legs. At this point, the first man died. The pain was too unbearable for him and his heart gave out. The only thing he thought about in his last moments, were his wife and son. The second man was still alive, but barely holding on. When Carrie was finally about to cut his head off, he mustered up all the saliva left within him, and spat it on her eyes. Puh, go to hell bitch. She screamed and finally chopped off his head. That bastard, Carrie thought. Carrie cleaned up herself and left the dungeon. On her way back, a young knight ran towards her and gave her a salute. My princess, He's here. Good. Lead the way. Dot. Dot. Once Carrie arrived her audience room, she was met with a hooded man, who wore a reddish mask. The red mask only covered his eyes, leaving the rest of his face visible for all to see. The man was presently being entertained with food and wine. I apologize for my late arrival Sir Death. I hope that Sir Death will not hold it against me. Carrie said as she bowed. Death as he was known in the empire, was the number one skilled assassin in Arcadine. His skills and fame were even known to those in other empires. It's no problem princess. After all, you were quite busy as well. Was it your first time? Carrie was shocked. How did he know? Was he talking about her torturing the ministers? She sized him up again and started to wonder if any information about the ministers was leaked. He looked at her and immediately guessed what she was thinking. Your fingernails still carry traces of blood in them. Your left ear and the sole of your shoes have tiny spots of blood on them as well. And your palms are still read from holding your torture device he said while chewing on an apple. How are you sure it wasn't a sword? She asked curiously. Swords leave a different, 
well-balanced palm print. If it were a sword, then your entire palm would be red. What about the torture? I figured that, it's either you were involved in a brutal fight, or you were torturing some poor bastards. But since you're in your own estate, the chances of the first one occurring are very slim he concluded. I'm impressed Mr. Death, your skills are as they say, legendary. You were right, I was torturing some bastards in there. But now I'm finally here, so let's get on with business shall we? She said as she walked over to her seat. For the next three months, I need you to work strictly for me. And within that time, I need your absolute loyalty. Death was stunned at first and then surprised. It had been a long time since someone had the guts to request for his loyalty. Princess, I hope you know that my services don't come cheap. And just so you know, I never accept boring jobs he said with a charming smile on his face. Trust me, I know. Whatever your price is, or whatever you require, I guarantee that it shall be done. As for boring? he he he, I assure you that you will have the thrill of your life, death looked at her and smiled, what an interesting little girl, chapter 53 sugar, spice and everything nice and just like that, the month of May had finally come to an end, May was a very fulfilling month to London, he had successfully made heavy machines, oil and also rubber, finally, he felt like he was going somewhere with his mission, today was the first day of June, although Santa didn't come personally, he had still sent his subordinates to bring 4,619 people to Baymard. Again, there were 254 children between ages 014, and 413 people who volunteered to be soldiers. There were also 16 senior citizens amongst the group. Now, Landon was left with 3,936 able workers. He then selected 536 people out of the group and appointed them as cooks, they were to be added, to all cooking sectors within Baymard, from the school to the industries, army, castle. In short, everywhere within Baymard, Landon also sent 900 workers to the construction industry, 1,500 to the alchemy chemical industry, and another 1,000 to the food industry. Landon received money for his mineral ores, and also bought more planting seeds. Landon made 419,000 gold coins from Santa's subordinates, minus the cost for the slaves and the seeds. This time Landon was happy with the seeds he got. There were cocoa bins and sugar cane seeds among the bags. Great. Soon he would be able to make chocolate and granulated sugar. Dot. Dot. Now, it was time to make spices seasonings, cooking oil and vinegar. Out of the 1,000 workers given to the food industry, Landon allocated, Department 1 working on the farms, 300, Department 2 storage plus distribution, 100, Department 3 spice making, 200, Department 4 cooking oil, 200, Department 5 vinegar, 200, for the three new departments. Lyor appointed three farmers from Department 1 as the supervisors. Today, Landon had decided to start making various kinds of spices. Landon had the workers tie their hair with rubber bands and hair wraps, as well as wear gloves, safety shoes, mouth and nose masks, eye goggles and clean aprons. They started by cutting the peppers, garlics, gingers, onions, turmeric and so on into tiny pieces. When they were done, they opened up the kiln and filled all 20 layers, with 13 trays of the all-cut pieces in each layer. A kiln was just a giant industrial oven. Since there were over five kilns available, Landon asked the workers to continue cutting, until they fill the other kilns. Your Highness, so one batch would take two days to dry on low heat? Lie or asked while looking at all the papers that Landon had given him. They showed the detailed procedures for making different spices, as well as how to mix and create the seasonings, vinegar and cooking oil. Correct. You and the workers would have to continue the process, three days later, as well as creating different seasonings, vinegar and cooking oil. If you come across any issues, you can always look for me. Rest assured our highness, 
it shall be done Lior said while nodding his head proudly. I trust your capabilities Landon said with a smile. Lior pursed his lips and looked at Landon eagerly. Your Highness. I just have one question Lior said. Landon was also curious as to what could have brought about the immediate change to his personality. Chief Lior. You can ask me anything, no matter what it is. Landon said with a reassuring smile. Do you know how to build a house made entirely of food? Landon was taken aback and didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. Actually, Lior was a simple man. At the age of seven, he had always been dedicated to helping his father out in the farms. He would always dream of building huts made of corn, bread, honey and other delicacies. He even dreamt about using wine as his daily water supply. He was a farmer and all he really thought about was how to make food grow and taste better. If he ever built a house of food, he could die happily. Landon looked at his enlivened overseer and sighed. Landon could literally see the happiness and rainbows all over him. Why were all his overseers like this? He smiled and shook his head. Better like this than greedy. He too couldn't wait to finally season his food. The food in this era was disgusting to Landon. No spices. Nothing except pepper, some vegetable leaves and salt. Cooking oil was also super expensive, so people usually boiled or roasted food over large fires. It looked like a witch's concoction. It was terrible. No ketchup, no mayonnaise, no dressings, no seasonings. What kind of life was this? Plus he really missed burgers fries and a well-grilled and seasoned juicy steak, as well as pizza. Just thinking about it made him salivate. What a sad life, he thought. Dot. Dot. Landon sat across Mother Kim, Lucy, Grace and Beerus Mother Winnie and six other teachers. Since Mother Winnie already knew mathematics like addition and subtraction, she volunteered to teach alongside with Mother Kim. During May, she tagged along Mother Kim and learned how the students were being taught in Baymard. He had also given her a mathematics textbook and guidelines on how to test and teach the students effectively. Today, she had her first class. She and Mother Kim both taught math too in separate classes. The other six teachers who came with Mother Winnie in May, also began teaching as well. The first two teachers taught Pyre on one language class, the other two taught Math 1 while the rest taught math too. Landon wanted to know their feedback from their first day of teaching. So he held a teacher conference meeting to discuss about the possible issues they might have faced today. Your Highness, the timetable method is truly genius. On my first day, there was already a girl who could say the entire two times table off by heart. One said, I agree, I this way, they should learn faster. The conversations went on and everyone raised their opinions and points. Mother Winnie and the girls also gave their take on the matter. Once the meeting was over, the six teachers left, leaving only Landon, Grace, Lucy, Mother Kim and Mother Winnie in the room. Auntie Winnie, did you like your first day? Landon asked cheekily. Winnie looked at the little cheeky brat and pinched his nose. In her eyes, Landon was still a baby. Naturally, he's just 15 years old. Of course I did silly. It was so exciting. And that chalkboard method was great as well. People right at the back of the class could see what I was doing. Teaching is really exhilarating. There was even this one student who came late, and tried to sneak into the class. Dot 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 you should have seen the look on his face when I caught him. Winnie replied excitedly. Ha 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 everyone laughed. Sister, I also faced some of them as well. The students are really funny sometimes. Mother Kim as she started recalling another funny incident in her class. Auntie Winnie, come on dot dot tell us in detail what happened dot dot Lucy said while anxiously waiting for the story. Yeah yeah auntie. Tell us, Grace added. Landon smiled as he watched and listened to Winnie's hilarious narration. As he looked at all the women laughing and sharing their stories. He truly felt blessed, from an orphan to a man with a loving family. Now he understood what Drake meant. Started from the bottom, now we're here. Chapter 54 Driving Classes Currently Baymard had a lot of heavy construction machines available. With 6,000 workers making these machines on a daily basis, Baymard presently had 388 different machines ready for use, at least for now. 
Landon was satisfied with the number they had made, and as time went on, this number would surely increase by an even larger amount. For construction and mining, Baymard had 26 bulldozers, 14 track type bulldozers, 43 excavators types including trenches, 40 loading trucks dump trucks, 14 road graders, 16 scrappers, 11 low boys, 13 forklifts, 37 pipe layer vehicles drain layer. 29 road pavers, 8 slip form pavers, 8 lift cables, 2 cranes, 7 street sweepers, 3 reach stackers, 6 tunnel boring machines, for wood cutting, 12 feller bunches, 7 wheel forwarders, and finally, for agriculture, Baymard had, 11 harvesters, 15 farm trucks. 10 balers, 16 reapers, 4 agricultural roller machines, 9 planters, 9 manure spreaders, 8 sprayers, 7 swathers, 3 grain trucks, 8 farmer loaders, 4 telescopic handlers. Landon had created the farming machines because he didn't want the workers to be out on the fields by winter time. Back on earth, farmers would use tractors and other machines to harvest and roll the soil. During winter, the farmland in Baymard was too big and wide to cover up. It was bigger than most plantations back on earth. During winter, he wanted the workers to sit in the machines and work. He couldn't afford for them to go out in that weather and start picking up food or fruits with their hands. That was just wrong. That's why he made harvesters, planters and so. Some of those machines could work on up to 24 farm beds in one sweep. The same thought process went for the miners. Now that he had built these heavy machines, they could use the excavators and other machines to dig out the ores from the mines. He couldn't possibly allow them to continue using pickaxes during the winter. And some of these equipments could be shared with other departments, like excavators, which is used for digging. Some of these machines could also be used by both the food and construction industry, the chemistry alchemy industry, also needed trucks, loaders and so on to move their products and chemicals from place to place, these equipments were for everyone, that's also why he decided to use this month, to start driving lessons, for the entire month of June, Landon had decided to make a schedule to teach two times a day, of course, they still had to attend their math and language classes daily. That's why he made two sessions a day. Plus, it wasn't compulsory. Expect on their days off. People could attend it once a week or twice a week if they liked. Those who have evening shifts, can join any of the morning shift sessions, and vice versa, for those with morning schedules. Those that have their off days, could come and spend an entire day learning and driving. It was really up to them. Landon had decided to have 15 people for one session. So in a day, he would be teaching 30 people. He also decided that those who were proficient enough in driving, could come to class and teach new people as well. This way, everyone would learn how to use the machines faster. The overseers and the supervisors, would also join him in teaching the workers. Landon didn't want all the overseers and supervisors to be out at once, so he created a teaching schedule for them. Basically, nine people including himself, would teach the workers how to drive, on a daily basis. So a day, the workers would have access to 18 driving classes. Once the first trencher was made last month, Landon had been teaching the overseers and supervisors how to use the machines designated for their departments. To make things easier, Landon decided that each of the overseers and supervisors, would only teach those within their departments. He couldn't very well tell the alchemy supervisors, to teach the construction workers how to use a paver, could he? As for him, he would teach all departments. On day one, he could teach the construction industry. Day two would be food industry. And so on. This way, he wouldn't have to move up and down the place a lot. If today was the day for teaching the food industry workers, Landon would take the machines to the farms for an entire day. He would spend time there, showing them how it's done. If he were teaching the construction workers, he would take them to a site, and show them how to use the machines for digging and so on. He also decided to give the mining and woodcutting department separate days as well. The same thought process went for the alchemy industry. 
Today was his first driving lesson aimed at teaching the construction workers. Dot. Dot. Randy was a slave that had come from Corona, a while back. Ever since he came to Baymard, he had been so shocked and impressed by how many things they had built. He now got a better understanding of what chemistry was about and now knew how to properly measure lengths and other dimensions. Last month, their new king had assisted them in creating this gigantic carriages. No. 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 They were not carriages but heavy machines. All the machines were painted yellow and had a name printed on them. All the machines started with the name Baymard. Today, he was going to take driving classes for the Baymard Bulldozer A23, or Bull A23 for short. After Landon had explained the basic safety functions involved with the machine, he showed them what each panel, wheel gears and buttons did. Now, it was time to drive. Randy jumped in the large wheel, just like Landon did previously, and opened the clear see-through glass door. Once he strapped his waist seat belt and inserted the key and turned the ignition key beyond the on position. Peep. A very low sound came from the interior of the car. Randy started getting really excited. He remembered that Landon said that the engine would need time to start. Thirty seconds later, he was good to go. He looked outside his window and also saw all his driving classmates in their own bulldozers. How exciting, everyone thought. He looked at his full fuel tank and nodded. His Highness said that it was important to always make sure that it never went below 30% full. There were two gear joysticks at each of his sides and one lever slightly at the back of his right gear. There were also a lot of buttons around him that had different labels on them. All the machine cars were placed at a distance between each other. Landon had given them different areas to work on. Landon had hoped that while they worked, they would get better at using the machines. Randy used his right joystick to go forward gear. VRMMMMMM. It's moving. It's moving, he thought. He quickly moved around a barrel and started pushing a pile of dirt that Landon had previously placed. Randy's goal was to level the ground. Randy was pumped up and ready to learn. Dot. Dot. The lessons went on for a while, and finally, it was time for the show to end. The workers didn't tend to leave and kept sighing helplessly. Landon could understand their plight. This was their first time driving or even using such machines to dig and what not. For them, this experience was the same as using sports cars or a Lamborghini. Who wouldn't want to at least go for a test drive? Randy looked at his machine, and decided that he would sign up for the next available class. In his mind. He had already started calling the Bull A23 his baby. Ah. Dot. I must register for the next class. My baby, wait for me. Chapter 55 William Barnstein a handsome man of 20, sat in his private quarters, as he read the letters sent by his subordinates. The man had blue eyes, black hair, and a finely chiseled jawline. This man was William Barnstein aka, the ghostly prince. His mother, Mona Ferris had been a caring and woman, who showered him with love daily. Mona used to be was from the Nobel family of Ferris. She was actually first engaged to King Barn's younger brother at the time. She loved it and Barn dearly. He was the second prince at the time, and the chosen crown prince by his father. He truly cared about the people, and wasn't power hungry like his other brothers. Kindness and empathy is a good trait, but can also have its downsides. One day, Mona had come to visit her beloved, only to see him in a pool of blood. There were three men in the room with daggers in their hands. It was the now present King Barn whose name is Alec, and his two subordinates. She immediately pushed them aside and ran towards Eden. Why? Dot. What kind of person kills their own blood? She couldn't wrap her head round it. King Barn had always been lusting over her. So he asked his two guards to stand guard whole he tried to rape her. She struggled and fought with all her might, and in the midst of her struggling, Alec Barn got angry and used his dagger to cut her face. He gave her two long stripes in the form of an X on her face. Suddenly, the door burst open and her personal guards successfully rescued her from King Barn's grasps. They knocked Alec Barn unconscious and rushed to their lady's side. Luckily, she wasn't raped. She looked at Adam's body and realized that he was still breathing. He was alive. 
the guards quickly carried his body and they all escape, once she got back at the Ferris estate, her parents quickly sent her, all her siblings and their families, as well as their knights, into hiding, they escaped that very night and traveled for four and a half months to their secret base, at the same time, her parents freed all the slaves and maids, and sat alone in their private quarters, she knew that this would be the last time that she saw her parents, the next day, the entire empire was in an uproar, it was said that Mona killed Adon and Maid was with his body in the dead of night, what made people believe the rumors was the fact that Mona, her siblings and all the guards and servants, were nowhere to be found, what surprised people the more was that the current king, Augustus Barn, had also passed away mysteriously that same night, Mona's parents were tied up and burnt alive in front of the citizens, they were charged for both deaths and weren't even given a trial. Two days later, Alec Barn took over the throne as ruled of Arcadina, and with this, the Ferris family was no more. Five months later, Mona heard the news about her parents and her dear father-in-law King Augustus. She swore that she would get her revenge for what that beast did to her loved ones. But for the past two months, she had been feeling sick and constant been throwing up. Her brother's wives had told her that it might be due to pregnancy, but she immediately rejected the thought, since concluded it was probably due to all the trauma she had faced. She had and had only slept with each other once. How could a baby come out just from that one time? But seven months later, she looked at her petruding belly and felt helpless, Adam was still receiving treatment and was still very weak, she decided that she would try her best to raise her child with all the love in the world, she had to be strong for both the child and Adam, when William was born, Mona looked at him and cried, he resembled her late father, and when he smiled or laughed, he also had the splitting image of her late father-in-law Augustus, she named him William in remembrance of her loving father, and Barn's tin, to remind him that his came from a great barn, and the tin was for cover up, so that even if he walked about the town, no one would be curious about why his name was Barn. Little William grew up in a loving him with his many uncles, his father, his mother and a few maids. But as he grew up, curiosity got the best of him, who gave his mother those scars. Why did his mother often mention someone called Augustus? Why were they always in hiding? And more importantly, who was responsible for heavily injuring his father? When he turned twelve, he had overheard his uncles having conversations about their past, and he was able to put one and two together. He now truly felt bad for his mother and he swore to make that bastard Uncle Alec of his pay. He became more vigilant with his sword and more eager on learning military tactics. When he was fifteen, he walked up to his father, mother and uncles, requesting for the truth. Adam and Mona had given up on revenge long ago because of William. This kind of burden was too great for him to carry alone. This was the current king they were talking about. It wasn't going to be easy to kill him, father. Mother, I will do this whether you all like it or not. I want you all, and everyone to be free. I want you all to be able to walk about without disguising or hiding yourselves. I know that you all gave up on revenge because of me, but if I'm truly part of this family, then treat me like a man by allowing me to share your burdens. I will not fail. Eden, Mona, her brothers and the knights were taken aback. Our young prince had finally grown up they thought, Adon and Mona knew that they couldn't reject his offer, they never wanted him to go down the road of bloodshed, but they also knew that it wasn't a realistic dream at all, no one could live out their entire life in hiding, it's either you bring the battle to your enemies or they bring the battle to you, although they had meant to give up on revenge, a tiny part of them wasn't willing to, so they both trained in secret daily, in hopes that they would one day have the courage to kill that bastard without their son's knowledge. But their little bundle of joy had also became a man, and wanted them to rely on him more. Everyone knew that his mind was made up, and no one could change it. Everyone waited for it and answer anxiously, especially Mana's brothers. I will tell you everything, and I will allow you to make your own decisions on the path that you want to choose. But no matter what path it is, I hope that you will never do things recklessly or without a backup plan, if you do choose to aid us in our quest, 
Then I too have a request for you Adan said, What is it father? You must always cover your face whenever you leave the base, no matter who you are with, you must always wear a mask. Chapter 56 A Little Fish in a Big Pond Secret Hideout dot. William's door opened and his father, mother and his uncles came in. How did it go little Willie? Dot. Were you hurt? Are you okay? Dot. Haven't I told you never to do anything reckless? Mona said while frantically rushing over to him. Mona, William is a man now. He should have to face some challenges on his own said Uncle Mural. But the mission this time was difficult. What if? What if he got captured? Mona said while sitting very closely to her son. He won't. Little Willie isn't easy to hunt. With his brains and prowess. It would be extremely difficult for anyone to find him or trap him, said Uncle Powin. Honey, the boy has grown. There is no one who could defeat our son, Adam said while rubbing William's hair. William looked at his overly protective mother and smiled. Mom, I'm fine. Have you forgotten who I am? Dot. It would take a miracle for them to find me. That's right little sister, since the boy has been trained by us. There's no way that anyone would be able to find him right now, Uncle Mural added. Mona looked at her husband, her elder brothers and her son, who were anxiously trying to lighten her worries. She knew that what they said was true, but she still wasn't comfortable letting her son go for such difficult missions. Mona decided to calm down and focus on the situation at hand. Over the past one months, Slither and Cord had been targeting and trying out find out all her son's moves. A while ago, he had attempted to find William, but for some reason, he decided to stop his search. Now, he resurfaced again with the same goal. With her spies all over the Empire, Mona was finally able to get facts about who he was and who he was actually working with. Mona knew that William wanted to sit on the throne so she and the family could finally be able to live freely. She knew that it would likely be her son, that took King Barnes' head. But the information she got about King Barnes' children, were all shocking. All of them wanted their father dead. Ha ha ha. Karma was a bee. That's what he deserves for all the wrongs that he had done. The only person who didn't seem to care about the Empire, was his last son Landon. At first, Mona thought that maybe Landon hid pretty well. But after reading Landon's information properly, she could clearly understand the thought process of both Landon the old Landon and Mother Kim. She had discovered that both individuals, seemed to want a quiet and peaceful life. Far away from the capital, they had been longing for a life filled with easiness and happiness. Although they were treated poorly, they never truly had deep hate for the royal family, so they were likely not interested in taking up kingship. Mona couldn't see Landon as a ruler at all. Throughout the years they were in the capital, Mona had been sending her spies to integrate with those in the palace. One was even a maid who asked the old Landon what he truly wanted, and Landon's only answer was a peaceful life. Far away from the capital, the child just wanted to take care of his mother in a safe place. To make sure, she herself had disguised as a common cook and sneaked into the palace to observe all the children. It was as they said. He didn't give a damn about any kingship, and he also didn't have much hate for anyone as well. When she saw Mother Kim, she was also reminded of her past self. When she and her spies had stayed in the palace, they easily knew which children were vicious and which ones would pose a threat to William. Finally, when Landon was fifteen, her spies had reported that he was poisoned by the Nilat Wisp. She knew that the poor child would die, since there was no cure for that. So she stopped sending her knights to spy on him. She decided to let his remaining days or months in this world free and peaceful. Plus it would be such a hassle to get her spies over to Baymard. Although she had a lot of spies, most of them worked only in the south, west AMD central of the Arcadena. She had no spies towards the east or north. Mana's base was in the west, while Baymard was in the east. It would take eight months in good weather and over one year in bad weather for her or her people to get there from the west. It was such a hassle. 
and they needed more men in the central region monitoring the royal family. All the cities given to the princes, were either around south or central Arcadine. The south was closer to the Deiferous borders. So in case of any wars with those people, the princes could make their way over there and fight. Now, she realized that Prince Eli might have gotten information about William from Slyther and Cord. Damn. Dot. The funny thing was that Eli had not released any information on William. He had instead put a cap on William's identity. After torturing one of Slytherin's men, Mona found out that the little prince planned to kill her son in silence, so on one would ever know about his existence. He felt threatened by William. Since he wanted to kill her son, there was no way that she would let him live. But she didn't want to kill him just yet. Since he and his siblings had planned to kill each other and King Barn, she decided to watch the play unfold from her hiding place. She knew that it was only a matter of time before that bastard of a king dies. She truly wished that she would be there to watch him fall into despair. She really wanted to watch the whole ordeal and spit on his face. For Augustus, her parents, her son, her brothers, her knights and herself. But she also knew that one impulsive move from her side, would ruin the future for all her loved ones. Right now, she was just waiting patiently, to see who could make it to the finish line. Whoever it was would die if they didn't concede the throne to William. Adam was really hurt by his brother. He had always loved his brother and thought that his brother loved him too. He never saw that betrayal coming. And to top it all off. Alec had the guts to kill their father too. How could he kill their father? Their father had worked hard for the empire and was seen as a fair and just ruler to all. Adon's revenge was for his father, his wife and her family, and most importantly his freedom. The reason he demanded that William wore a mask was because William looked exactly like him. He looked like a barn. Anyone who got a glimpse of him would be able to guess who he was. But the funny thing was that those who saw him thought that he was Alec Barnes' bastard son. Eden had always made sure that William had at least three spare masks within his possessions, whenever he was on the move. Dot. Dot. Has that bastard taken their bait? Eden asked. Naturally, from what we gathered. This Slytherin fellow is making his way to Bing Kong City as we speak Uncle Pao En replied with a smile on his face. Good. Truly a little fish in a big pond. Chapter 57 Plastic, Ink and Paper Now, it was time to head on over to the chemistry industry. This was mid-second week of June. On the first day of June, Landon had given the alchemy department several tasks to complete on their own. Today was the deadline for him to inspect the products. Landon had created new departments that had a mixture of both new and old workers. With the work experience of the old workers, Landon was sure that the new workers would easily learn and complete the projects given to them. He had previously opened three departments within the alchemy industry. Plastic, Manufacturing. 100. Plastic Molding, 400. Ink. Production, 100. Ink Eating Material Production, 300. Paper, Manufacturing, 200. Exercise Book Making, 300. Up until now, Landon had always been there in every major production process. Landon knew that for his overseers, supervisors and workers to grow, they needed to do things on their own. This way, they could better their skills and increase their knowledge steadily. If they made mistakes during the process, they could just try again later. Landon had given them a detailed descriptions of the entire process, as well as all the safety hazards involved with the process. He had also reminded them that no one was allowed to work without his or her safety equipments. Of course he was going to tell them how to make all these products. What he wanted was for them to make errors and see why they had failed. For example, back on Earth, even if someone gave Landon a detailed description on cake making, he was still sure that his first try, wouldn't come out okay. Heck, he might even burn the entire cake while it was still in the oven. Some people even forget to add baking soda sometimes. Only by practicing, would one perfect their skills. No matter how many YouTube videos one watches, it was no guarantee that anyone would be able to pull anything off, just by watching. Landon remembered how he had watched countless hair tutorials on YouTube, back on Earth. No matter what he did, 
his hair never came out like JB from GOT7, life was just not fair. Sigh. Anyway, it was the same with this case. Hence he approved for them to finally have the go ahead to start all these projects without him. Now, he wanted to see the products and get their feedbacks. In front of him were three plastic cups, eight pens and three exercise books. He looked at the products and smiled. Dot. Dot. Since Landon advised him to start with plastic making first, he did just that. On that very first day of June, that Landon gave Chief Wiggins the project, he had failed woefully. The time when the naphtha was being cracked, Wiggins and the workers removed the naphtha a bit too early, which didn't allow the ethane to properly formed. The chemical reaction became incomplete. Other times, he forgot to add other catalysts to the production process. And on the third day, he began screaming like a maniac within the department. The workers also joined him, in the madness as well. They were finally successful. They felt like that day was the best day of their lives. Ink on the other hand, was a different matter. They learned the hard way that ink had too many different types, that also had different uses. Aqueous example, pictures from cameras, paste ink textile and paper printing, ball pens, liquid inks also used for printing, UV cured inks electrical printers, latex ink wallpapers vehicle graphics. The list goes on. Each ink type could only work with certain chemicals, agents, resins and additives that were different from each other. Once, they had accidentally used a solvent which was used for aqueous ink towards that used for past like ink. It was a complete catastrophe. They truly felt like crying. What sort of joke was this? Chief Wiggins now understood why Landon had suggested for him to start with plastic first. The casing for the pens, as His Highness puts it, were made from plastic, the cork and the tiny inner tube. Also, because there were no automatic ink filling machines available now, Landon had asked them to create needle syringes which are made from plastic as well and feed the ink to the tiny tube. The needles of the syringes, were the only things that were tiny enough to fit in the tube. They were perfect for filling the pens. Paper was by far their best to produce. The production process was cleaner and easier to accomplish than the rest. Now was the 10th of June, time to show some results to their king. Now that everything was good with the alchemy department, Landon decided to check on the assignment he had given to Tim previously. Dot. Dot. How was the experience to you all? He asked the entire room, and Chief Wiggins as well. Your Highness, before, we didn't understand the reasons why you did things at high temperatures. One worker said excitedly, or low temperatures. Another added, dot. But now we do. Your Highness, we made so many mistakes these last few days. One time. We used too much additives, a dot 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 and that messed up the product big time. Don't forget about the time that we added too much solvents to the ink. Ah. Dot. That's so true. There were also times where we didn't put enough resins during the process. Every day, we would have at least 12 different trials. Your Highness. My brain is saturated right now. Ah. I correctly used the word saturated. Did you hear it? Dot 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 I'm now a genius. Look at you. Just saturation? Dot. I can now use the word homogenized. In a sentence. Ha ha ha. They laughed, as they recounted their experience to Landon. Landon looked at his silly workers and smiled. They were truly happy over their accomplishments. Dot 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 now. They too felt smart. Only like this, could people grow. In fact, Wiggins had also understood how difficult it was to do the things without Landon's help. When Landon did them, there were no mistakes or errors involved. He would do it perfectly in one go. Was he even human at this point? Before, they thought it would be easy, since His Highness could do it just like that. But when they started doing it, they literally started sweating every time they messed up. They had produced so many funny looking products that came as a result of their numerous errors. One time, they poured the wrong chemicals into the process, and the products fizzled like soda, 
overflowing out of the tank. Wiggins and the workers were intrigued by that reaction. Wiggins in particular made a mention note of it and decided that he would research that particular reaction later. Some of the workers were now more diligent and started reading and asking more questions about the process. They wanted to know the hows, the whys, the whens and the whats. They were now cautious about how much they should put in as raw materials. This was the effect that Landon was going for. He wanted them to think on their own. Dot. Riverdale City. Dot. What do we do now? Baron Rogers asked nervously, while hysterically pacing around the room. Damn. Dot. How could this happen? Dot. Are there any strong forces around him? City Lord Shannon asked. Impossible. Baron Rogers yelled. City Lord Shannon nodded his head in agreement. You're right, I'm guessing that Commander Lucius killed Dumbo. He was after all, one of the strongest men in the Empire. With that much experience under his belt, it was no wonder that Dumbo wasn't his match. City Lord Shannon said. Ah, s. Didn't you guarantee me that this would work? Dot 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 F. Calm down. Dot dot dot. Do you really think that hiring Dumbo was my only plan? City Lord Shannon said, with a spine chilling smile on his face. Baron Rogers looked at City Lord Shannon and also took two paces back. The man's smile could make anyone shriek. This time, there will be no mistake. Chapter 58 Baymard's First Battle Landon looked at the finely grey cement particles and was pleased. He had also noticed that there were over 2,000 blocks of cement that were already made. At the beginning of the month, Landon had created a cement making department, and allocated 900 workers towards it. Landon broke them into two groups, cement production colon 100, cement block molding. 800. Landon was happy that everything was going according to plan. For this month of June, he had given every department new tasks to complete. The food industry made spices, vinegar and oil, while the alchemist industry made plastic, ink and paper. And finally, the construction industry focused on cement making. Landon decided that for now, each industry should just focus on their given tasks. Your Highness. Do you think we should start construction now? Tim asked curiously. Not yet. At least until July. Plus we need more people for that. And there are other things that I need you all to create before we can fully start. Landon already knew he was lacking some basic needs for housing. So he decided to put it off, until he had more people. And until he made all that he needed for his mission to be complete, Landon needed to build houses for all the original 1,500 people in Baymard. Once he housed them all, there he could finally pass this phase and unlock the medical rewards from the system. He also knew that he needed to build these houses at most before mid-November which was winter. He had already made up his mind that before September, he would build a water switch treatment plant, electrical plant and central heating plant. Since he was only supplying all these within Bay Mud, the plant size didn't need to be extremely large. Back on Earth, the plants that were large usually supplied water or electricity to more than three cities at once. Landon was working with one city so he didn't need it to be extremely large. As Landon kept talking with Tim, he spotted one of his soldiers running frantically towards him. Your Highness. A warm messenger has arrived. Dot. Dot. Landon had already been alerted by system of his arrival, but he chose to wait, since the system had notified him that only one person was riding towards Baymard. Plus it was broad daylight. What could one man do during the day? Heck, it was only 11 a.m. Landon had absolute trust that his men at the gates would, would be able to handle the situation no matter what. The men didn't allow the man to step into Baymard as per Landon's request. For now. Landon didn't want anyone to see any changes that had taken place within Baymard so far. So he had the men refuse access to anyone who wasn't in dire need of help from entering Baymard. But Landon was really surprised by this sudden declaration of war. In this era where there were knights and nobility, one would always get a notice of any incoming battles. Before they were fought, knights were very proud people. They believed in proving their strengths rather than sneaking around and killing people. 
it was just not honorable. Gangs and assassins on the other hand were a different matter. Those ones wouldn't give you any prior notices, and instantly attacked you in the dark. Knights didn't believe in killing the women and children, when fighting over territory. That's why they sent the messengers tell their prey that if they don't surrender, their women and children may be killed in the process. Landon knew that for their enemy to inform them, that would mean that it's either the attackers are entirely knights or are a group of knights and gangs. Either way, no knight would fight without ensuring that a letter had been delivered to their enemies. As that was also the rules between most empires. Dot. Bowman had been standing there for over 30 minutes now and was getting effing pissed. Who the heck did they think they were? Wasn't this place just some deserted area? Dot. To think that they would keep him the second official messenger of the great city Lord Shannon under the sun for so long. How dare they? Bowman was now itching to tear them to shreds. But something confused Bowman greatly. When he left Riverdale, city Lord Shannon had told him to go to Green Gold City and take his assignment. The Green Gold City was the next city after Riverdale, in the direction of the capital. Why go to Green Gold City? only to reverse and go towards Baymard. It made no sense to him. Couldn't he just have left Riverdale and rode his horse towards Baymard? Bowman couldn't understand City Lord Shannon's sneakiness, so he chose to forget about it. After all, he was just a messenger and a soldier for the man. Dot. Dot. He sat on his horse and saw three men riding towards him. There were two knights riding at the back of a young boy, who looked no younger than fifteen. The boy rode his black stallion majestically towards him. Bowman scrutinized the young boy and a sense of displeasure arose in his heart. How dare this bastard make me wait. Dot HMMP. Just you wait. Dot. My lord would surely make you drink your own blood later Bowman thought as he grumbled inwardly. Once Landon arrived, both he and Bowman got off their horses and walked towards each other. Bowman didn't even wait for him to speak before throwing a letter towards Landon rudely. Here, hurry up and read it. I don't have all day so I suggest you hurry up. Bowman said as he sneered at Landon. The knights who were watching around the gate were almost angered to death. How dare this nobody talk to their king like this? Dot. Damn. What's that to read? Just surrender. Do you really think you have a choice with just 330 knights? If you surrender, who knows? You and your people could live happily as slaves for our city lord. No one can help you win this war. Hurry up. Landon lifted his brow and immediately threw the piece of paper back. There's no need for me to look any further. I refuse Landon said with a cold tone. Bowman was taken aback and looked at Landon as if he was a fool. He who eh? I had heard that the little banished prince of ours was a little foolish. But I didn't think that you would be stupid too. In three hours time, my lord will arrive and behead you all if you don't hurry up. Don't you care about that mother of yours? Dot. If you want to save her, you better sign that paper quickly. Or else no one can blame us for what would happen to the whore. Thew. Lucius who was standing by Landon's side, had wanted to kill the damn bastard. But before he could do anything. Landon had immediately punched Bowman throwing him to the ground. Bowman held his jaw and was shocked. His lips quivered and he quickly got up from the ground, instantly turning into a mad dog. You dare hit me? Dot bastard. Dot. Am I lying? Dot. So what if you were once royalty? Dot you're just a piece of trash now. And so is that homo. Phew. Landon had hit him again. Bowman was so mad that he almost fainted from anger. Landon's eyes became colder and his frown deepened. Bowman looked at Landon's eyes and became scared. W dot 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 what are you trying to do? Dot. You can't kill the messenger. It's against the Empire's laws. Bowman said while taking two paces back. Landon smiled coldly. I would like to remind you that Baymard isn't part of the Empire. Is it? Landon said while closing in on him. You. You. You better not be rash. Better sign that paper fast before Lord Shannon gets here. No one can help you. Landon's killing intent increased. And Bowman started sweating heavily. So you want me to allow my people to become your lord's slaves? 
Dot. Ha 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 ha. I wasn't betting on anyone helping me. Dot. Tell your lord that I refuse. My 330 men will win this war against you all. Now. Get out. Chapter 59 Battle Preparations Gong, Gong, Gong. The bells within the army fort rang loudly. All the soldiers knew the meaning of the continuous bell sounds. During their training, they had learnt that if the bell was rang for more than five minutes, it would be a signal for every soldier to assemble in front of the gate posts. Those who were training instantly dropped their iron weights and ran towards the central region. Those that were sleeping immediately opened their eyes and jumped out of their beds. Those that were reading, closed their books and hurriedly put them in their locker space. The giant iron bell rang very loudly, and everyone could hear it. Everyone ran quickly towards the city gates. It was time for war. Dot. Dot. Everybody gathered around the gate post, waiting for the urgent news. Landon looked at his men, and was impressed. They had all assembled quietly, in lines of thirty. If a pin dropped at this moment, Landon was sure that everyone would hear it. Today, an enemy is trying to attack Baymard. I don't know if I should call them brave, or just plain stupid. You all have been training both night and day to become exemplary soldiers. You're all stronger than many soldiers in this world, and in confident in your skills so far. No matter how many knights the enemy has under its regime, they would still lose today's battle. I will show you all the true difference between knights and soldiers. I will show you why you can be confident and why you are better than knights. Today, I will show you the might of Baymard's army. Now, it's time to win our first battle. For Baymard. For Baymard the soldiers yelled back. Landon had planned that for this war, he would only use his original 330 soldiers to win. He would assign them to all the cannons on the walls and have them deal with the enemies. Some of the men were excited while others were curious about how they were going to win the war. The rest of the men decoded to watch the battle unfold from the city walls. Last time that Landon did a cannon test, 90% of the new recruits weren't present. Also they had seen some of the warrant soldiers practice, they still weren't sure if a cannon could actually cause heavy damage to their enemies. Landon wanted to use this opportunity to prove the strength and damage cannons could cause. While they were waiting, Landon had the men bring out sacks of gunpowder and place by the sides of every cannon. Landon also explained the battle formation and tactics they were going to use for the war. He showed them where each cannon should be pointed to and where their focus should be on. He didn't want the men to just fire aimlessly at their enemies. That's why cannon battle formations were very important. Dot. Dot. City Lord Shannon had gathered 11,500 knights from his territory, as his plan B. With 11,500 knights, there was no way that they would lose to a mere 330 knights. No matter whether Commander Lucius intervened or not, everyone knew how many knights Landon had under his command. To Shannon, this war was nothing more than a one-sided slaughter. Even if Landon surrendered peacefully, he would still kill him. He had also planned on killing all the people within the town. He was sure that if Tim Meyer knew about the mines, then the workers would definitely know as well. It was better to deal with problems from the roots. Kill them all. Dead men could never tell any tales. As the city lord, he was only entitled to 6,000 knights. But over the past few years, he had been poaching knights from the barons in his territory. And now, he secretly had 12,000 knights under his command. He had kept 500 men back at Riverdale City and informed the rest that they were heading out towards the capital. The 500 men, the barons and everyone else, didn't know where the 11,500 were going to. Most people thought that maybe the city lord had received an urgent message from the capital. A month ago, he had gotten a letter from King Barn, about an upcoming war with the Empire of Deiferes. He was tasked with bringing his troops towards the capital, for the assignment briefing. He decided that he would use this opportunity to strike Landon, so that no one would be suspicious of him. It was the perfect plan. How could anyone suspect him for Landon's demise, if he was already on his way to the capital? It was now or never. When the 11,500 knights were leaving the city, they were extremely confused as well. They left towards the direction of Green Gold City, 
but had to sneak back towards Baymard by passing through the swamps. Once they were closer to Baymard, they quickly moved back on the road and continued their journey. At this point, the men were sure that their lord wanted to keep everything under wraps. So this was for sure a secret mission. City Lord Shannon had them swear oaths, that said that if they were to release any information about this war, their families would be burnt alive. When the men finished swearing, they had cold sweat on their backs. Most of them already had daughters, sons of wives, and don't want to risk their families' lives. Those that weren't married, were still threatened with their parents, siblings and other loved ones. They knew how cruel their lord could be, so they had already vowed to keep everything a secret. Dot. Dot. City Lord Shannon, Baron Rogers and the Knights, saw a badly bruised Bowman riding towards them and stopped. My lord, my lord. You must seek justice for me. Bowman cried out and he approached them. Everyone looked at his papillish cheeks and could guess what he had gone through. Tell me what happened in detail City Lord Shannon said. My lord, they were totally not putting you in their eyes. That brat refused to sign anything. It looks like they would rather die than be your slaves my lord. Bowman exclaimed. As Bowman rated his own made up version of the story, the knights now had the will to fight. As knights, they wouldn't have lifted their swords up, without Bowman's story. They needed to make sure that the city they were attacking, knew of their attack. That way they could fight with all their mights. The empire's rules were strict. No knight was willing to bear the consequences for not following the rules. This was exactly the reason why city lord Shannon had sent Bowman over, so he could convince the men to fight. Once they won, it would make the perfect excuse to kill everyone within the city. After all, he had given Landon a choice of saving both the women and children. But Landon refused. This was perfect for City Lord Shannon. He's a fool. Since he wants to do things the hard way, we will play along with him. Chapter 60 Painting the Fields Red Part 1 As City Lord Shannon looked at his knight, a murderous smile formed on his face. Just with one glance, anyone could tell that these knights had years of experience and training under their belts. Their muscles were massive and their appearance seemed like they had just crawled out of the pits of hell. They were prepared for battle. City Lord Shannon had fought several battles with his men. They had expanded the city of Riverdale, and had also fought several border battles throughout the years. His knights were strong, proud, very sturdy and most of all, extremely loyal and fearful towards him. They knew what their lord could do, and never ever thought of crossing their lord for one second. Their lord was a brutal and frightening man, who ruled Riverdale with iron hands. Thirty percent of his men were as good as the top knights within the capital. He had secretly spent most of his resources and time, training these men to be one of the best in the empire. Of course he did all these away from the watchful eyes of King Barn. Every time that he went to the capital, he would take only 40% of his men with him. He would mix both the weakest and the strongest in the group, so as to hide any suspicions towards him. As he looked at his knights, he was confident that his indestructible team, would easily conquer Baymard. How could a lion compare to an ant? The knights carried hard iron shields and long sharp swords, as they steadily made their way towards Baymard. My lord, we should be arriving Baymard in an hour's time, should we make camp and attack first thing tomorrow morning? Asked his second in command, do we have to sleep outside to defeat such a puny city? We will be arriving at 2 p.m. Once we arrive, Get the men will rest for 30 minutes, before we start. Dot. Tonight, I want to lay in my bed back in Riverdale. City Lord Shannon commanded. I think we should be extra careful just in case that brat has more tricks up his sleeves. Baron Rogers advised. HMMP. No matter how many tricks he has, there is no way that he can win against my men. He had just 330 knights. How is that even a possibility? City Lord Shannon sneered. Baron Rogers also thought that what City Lord Shannon said made sense. Indeed, it was not a possibility. From here, are you heading back to the capital? With the border wars getting more and more fierce, the king had called me in to assist in the wars this time. After, I finish up here, 
I will leave half of my men with you in Baymard. Do what you must to keep anyone out of Baymard for the time being. After the border battle, I will come back to further assist you. City Lord Shannon said. The message he had received did not mention the progress of the war, but described the need for extra hands at some of the border posts. Deiferous was getting more and more daring with their actions. The Empire of Arcadina was the largest empire within the continent. One could say that it was almost double the size of Deiferous. Greed, jealousy and envy had led to this never-ending war. But for King Barn to send more troops as backup, meant that the war was probably not going as he planned. King Barn could never allow a tiny empire to insult him by taking part of his land. It would have to be over his dead body. Even if he had to use all the men in his empire, he would gladly make that sacrifice. Provided no part his land got reduced. There was another reason why City Lord Shannon was excited about participating in the border war. If he did extremely well, the king would reward him with anything that he required. He himself had always wanted to control the entire west region of the empire. It was perfect. None of the princes were located in the west. And with no major power constantly breathing down his throat he would easily become a mini king within the empire. Who knows? Maybe he could get enough forces to be break the west region away from the empire itself. City Lord Shannon had been King Barn's trusted friend ever since his days within the Knight Academy. He had always been a lackey for King Barn and had always despised the fact that King Barn could have everything he wanted. He had been gathering his forces for years in hopes that he would one day break the West Region away from the capital. The West Region had more than 12 cities and other villages within it. He had planned that when he performed exceptionally well, he would ask for just two more cities to control. Once he successfully conquered the barons of those cities, he would further move on the shadows to conquer the entire west region. Who didn't like power? Originally, Riverdale was just a tiny city. But as time went on, City Lord Shannon had attacked the villages around the territory, making the city grow. But he was still not satisfied. He had watched King Barn shine for too long. Even if he couldn't fulfill his dream, he hoped that one of his sons would do what he always dreamt of accomplishing. He wanted his family to have a noble bloodline. That was also why he kept pushing his sons towards the royal princesses. Right now, his sons were studying in the Knight Academy in the capital. He had made up his mind that even if this plan failed, he would get the king to at least bethrow one of his sons to any of the princesses fast. As he thought about his plans, he couldn't help but smile happily he rode on ahead. Dot. Dot. Once they exited the forest, they saw several hazy figures standing on the city walls. The soldiers tensed up, as they stood on the enormous clear fields. The second in command had the men rest, while observing Baymard. My lord, it seems that they were waiting for our arrival. But there's something strange about this dot 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 why aren't they standing outside the city gates, but instead observing from the city walls? Dot. Are they already prepared to surrender? His second in command asked. Everyone looked at the situation and couldn't make heads or tails over what these Baymard knights were planning. I have always heard that this bastard prince was a fool. Better I never thought that it would be this bad. What sort of battle tactic is this? Dot. Even if the prince had never experienced war before, isn't this just plain stupidity? Dot. Why didn't his knights advise him on what to do? Another knight asked confusedly. Who knows? Maybe he's just arrogant, and didn't want to heed to their advice. Do you think that they plan to trap up when we succeed in getting into Baymart? Baron Rogers asked. City Lord Shannon looked at the hazy silhouettes and frowned, what difference would it make? Dot you go tell the prince that this is his last chance. He either surrenders to me now, or all the citizens would die with him after the battle. Once the messenger left, the men started assembling in formation, as they waited for the messenger's return. City Lord Shannon sent the messenger so that the knights would again be reassured that Landon indeed had no thoughts of surrendering Baymard to them. He too wanted to make sure, as he was thoroughly confused by whatever stunt Landon was pulling. As they saw the messenger coming back, City Lord Shannon sneered as he looked at Landon's silhouette. It was finally show time. Men. 
leave no one alive. Dot. Kill all, even the women and children. Now, charge. Chapter 61 Painting the Fields Red Part 2 Abraham was one of the warrant soldiers who came with Landon to Baymard. As Abraham listened to Landon's battle speech, his blood became hot. When he was in the capital, he would get humiliated on a daily basis by stronger knights. He had always thought that he was inferior to everyone else. But coming to Baymard made him feel like he was wrong. He wasn't inferior, he just lacked the proper guidance to become one of the best. Ever since he came here, he had gotten a lot stronger and had somehow become smarter. Even though he had never experienced any war before, he now understood war tactics and several fighting techniques. He also realized that his king was unlike all the other nobles. Ever since they came to Baymard, the people had a lot of food and were now independent on their own. He could easily see the joy in all their hearts. He clearly remembered that when he got here, the people were no different from street beggars in the capital. They looked haggard and went out. When he remembered that scene, something tugged in his heart, as he didn't want Baymard to go back to the way it used to be. Abraham had come with his sister and his father on his journey to Baymard. His father used to be a chimney cleaner in the capital. But now he worked at the food industry and earns a lot more than what he used to get in the capital. His sister who used to stay at home all day cleaning and cooking, now worked as a caretaker for the children. She too was happy with her job and her income. With everyone satisfied, how could Abraham not be angry with this so-called threat? Baymard was their paradise their home and their happiness. By now. Some scheming noble wanted to take all this away because of greed. Abraham knew that once that noble took over, all that they had worked for would be lost. There was no way that these nobles cared about the people or the soldiers. That's why Abraham decided to fight. To fight for his king, his sister, his father, his friends, his self, the people and the land, Baymard. In fact not only Abraham, all the soldiers felt that way. Some had come with their families, while others had made friends and found their happiness within the city. There was no way that they would give it up. As Abraham looked at the messenger ride away from Baymard for the second time, he knew that the show was about to begin. He could feel his hands getting sweatier as he held on to the large cannon. He began to feel agitated and honestly felt like his heart was going to fly out of his chest any time soon. This feeling. Was this how war felt like? It was frightening, nerve-wrecking. But at the same time exciting. It felt like he had the whole weight of Baymard on his shoulders. This was what responsibility felt like. Once their enemies were 900 meters within the fields, Landon began to give his commands. Steady. Steady fire. Boom, boom. Several cannons were shot and now the men began to reload them for their next shots. Dot. Dot. On the battlefield, the enemy was thoroughly confused. Wasn't that the sound of thunder? How could the sky make that sound on a hot sunny day? And why was the sky lighting up? They saw several flashes of flames go off and they couldn't understand what the gods of their ancestors were thinking. City Lord Shannon frowned at the scene before him just what was going on, as a rule of thumb, the fighters would first charge forward before the archers, so city lord Shannon had let the warriors run forward with their horses, but before they could make heads or tails of what was going on, the horses started panicking and running frantically, they doubled their speeds as if running for their lives, were they also excited about the war, suddenly, Something flew past some of the horses and instantly hit the floor. Boom. The floor scattered and the next thing the knights knew, the ground shook violently. Rumb. Rumble. Then, dirt and some stones flew about the place haphazardly. Those ahead turned their heads to look at the situation, while those behind were in constant shock. There were no less than 100 men lying on the ground with their horses. Some men had blood coming out of their ears and nostrils. Others lost body parts, some fell from their horses and were badly trampled. While others just stayed there, with no signs of waking up. Instantly, panic spread throughout the battlefield. Although these men were experienced in battles, human beings would always fear what they didn't understand. Some even thought that the gods of their ancestors were truly angry with them. They had never heard or seen such attacks in their lives. 
where the heavens were truly angry at them, just what was happening here, but before they could beg their ancestors for mercy, they were bombarded again with rains of cannon balls. Dot. Although Lucius and the Warrant soldiers had seen the cannon ball effects during practice, seeing it work on an actual human being was completely frightening. As for the new recruits on the city walls, they were shocked silly at what they were witnessing. So this was the destructive impact of a cannon? Biri had his eyes and mouth wide open. This. This. Just how were people supposed to fight against this? The scene was indeed gruesome, in some cases, the cannon balls would directly hit the animal's legs, instantly cutting all four limbs at once. Let's not even talk about the rider. His body parts were instantly opened up as if he were a flower. Was this the shockwave effect that they had learnt in class? The cannon ball clearly didn't hit all the men, but they still had injuries, while others lost their lives. In some cases, the rider's inner organs were scattered around making the scene truly horrifying. So this was what their king meant when he said that he didn't know if the enemy was brave or just plain stupid. They had to admit that what their king said was true. But they knew that, this was necessary for Baymard to remain safe. Weren't these people talking about murdering them and taking the women and children as slaves? Although they felt pity for the men, they knew that if the situation was reversed, they would lose their lives and their family member as well. Such is war. Everyone in Baymard had worked hard for peace and happiness. No one wanted to see that peace ruined. To keep Baymard safe, they would have to give it their all. Plus Baymard was truly one of a kind. When they were in the military, they felt truly accomplished and their mindsets began to change. They had also seen new and exciting things that made them want to spend the rest of their lives here. Their pay was generous the people were good and the lifestyle was comfortable. And now someone wanted to take it all away, as their king always says, hasta la vista. Dot. City Lord Shannon on the other hand, had different ideas. Wasn't this the sort of weapon he needed to conquer the western territories, and maybe even the whole Arcadine? He had never seen anything like it before. The more he thought, the more greed filled his heart. No matter what, he had to get his hands on those weapons. He turned to his men who were already retreating and frowned. I will kill the families of those who desert this war. It's either you fight, or your family dies. He looked at Baymard and a sharp light glistened in his eyes. Soon, it will be all mine. Chapter 62 Painting the Fields Red Part 3 As the battle progressed. City Lord Shannon became more and more obsessed. I must have them. Comma he thought. He looked at the city walls and his eyes lit up. I'm sure these are thick metal arrow tubes, he thought. At this point, he was losing his mind. As a war veteran, he thought that his guess was probably right. So he had his archers run up on the scene and try to hit the flying objects with their tiny metal arrows. Boom. It was safe to say that his idea was a total flop. No. Dot. You morons. Can't you do anything right? As he looked at the scene, the color on his face slowly drained out. His archers had been blown away by the strange flying objects. After a moment of silence, he began pulling his hair out of his head while laughing. Ha ha ha. Brilliant. I must have them, he yelled like a madman. At this point, it was hard for his knights to keep watching him. He looked like a murderous lunatic in their eyes. He honestly looked like he had been possessed by a demon from hell. Was this still their lord that they swore allegiance to? Dot. It had been a little over two hours now. The new recruits were really amazed by how the war was going. They felt that their king had ushered in a new age of war. This kind of power was indeed terrifying as they felt that no one could ever successfully conquer Baymard so easily. 85% of their enemies had died, while 5% suffered from heavy injuries. As for the other 10%, they were still seriously fighting for their lives. Back on the battlefield, the enemy's formation was completely destroyed, and the knights running around, were even more pathetic. They screamed and yelled, as they became even more confused. Boom. Another cannon had just landed very close to Baron Rogers. Ah. Dot. I can't hear. I can't hear. Help me. Please, help me. What is happening? Baron Rogers cried as he ran around in circles. The shock force from the cannon, 
had led to his current situation. As blood constantly oozed out of his ears, Baron Rogers tried to turn around and retreat. But when City Lord Shannon saw this, he rushed over and quickly shoved his sword into Baron Rogers. You. Dot 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 you. Dot 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 why dot dot you dot 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 you. Brain Rogers would not believe that he had been killed by City Lord Shannon. Although he couldn't hear, he knew that City Lord Shannon had said something spiteful to him. He finally closed his eyes, as he slowly lost consciousness. And just like that, Baron Rogers had died. Coward City Lord Shannon said, while spitting over the Baron Rogers' body. The knights who were still alive shivered, as they looked upon the scene. In their minds, they were very clear that death was their only way out. The soldiers who saw this from the walls, felt disgusted by the city lord. Now they understood why it was important to have a one-for-all mindset. Has the world always been like this? They wondered. Dot. As Landon looked at the mad crazed city lord Shannon, he decided to change his strategy. At this point, it was clear that these enemy knights had wanted to retreat, but couldn't. They were no different from hostages. They had to fight, or else if City Lord Shannon successfully escaped, their families would definitely die. Landon decided to aim most of the cannons towards City Lord Shannon. It was time to end this. Previously while the war had been going on, Landon had wanted to change his strategy, but couldn't. He had asked the system about erasing their memories and had found out that he didn't have enough points to buy memory erase spells for that many nights. It was important that he removed all information concerning this battle. Landon's fear was that once they left this place, they would spill the bins about Baymard and being more trouble over here. Looking at City Lord Shannon's crazed look, Landon realized that these greedy nobles would definitely want to have these weapons under their control, if they found out, he couldn't allow the knowledge of his weapons to get out, unless he was sure that he could completely protect Baymard. For now, Baymard was still weak, hence, he needed build his territory safely and quietly, although he felt pity for these knights, at least 98% of them had to die, for Baymard Row remain safe, it was either they died, or Landon and his people die. Since Landon was only willing to use at most 10% of his points to erase their memories, he needed their numbers to completely dwindle down. As Landon looked at the horses, his heart also went out. These creatures were even more innocent than the knights, yet they had to be killed and dissected because of war. Some horses had their brains splattered out, while others had their tummies opened up. Sigh. It was truly sad. But animals had sharper senses than humans. Landon had seen when the animals would throw their riders away and run into hiding, before the attacks had landed. Presently, there were over 4,000 horses that survived without any injuries, as compared to the 200 knights that survived. Dot. City Lord Shannon was in a state of bewilderment. Group by group, his men began to fall down like flies. Why? Dot why? Dot. Why can't I win? I don't believe that I will lose to this brat. As he raved like a deranged dog, he felt something approaching him very fast. He looked up and anger filled his heart. Come. Dot. Let me see how tough this thing is. Dot dot dot. I am the king of the Western Territory. No one can. Boom. Before he finished his speech, two cannonball had already hit his chest and his legs instantly scattering his body parts around the area. Immediately all attacks ceased, and the remaining 86 men felt like crying, were saved. Comma they cried out, as they tried to support each other. They had long wanted to leave the battlefield, so now that City Lord Shannon was dead, they truly felt that. Their prayers to their ancestors were not in vain. Those that were fine, supported those that were badly injured and decided to escape for their lives. As they ran away, Landon erased their memories with fake ones. In their minds, their lord had an urgent matter to attend to in the capital, and on their way the 15,000 mercenaries attacked them, killing their lord. Before city lord Shannon died. Landon had requested for the system to search his body for any useful information that could assist Landon. The system had discovered the letter that the king had sent, requesting for them to go to the capital for their new memories. 
the men were to say that they were attacked three cities ahead of Riverdale. Baymard was in the opposite direction to the capital, so no one would even consider the possibility that Landon attacked City Lord Shannon. Plus where would he get the money to pay 15,000 mercenaries? Dot. No one would ever believe that he was that rich him. Dot. As the war came to an end, Landon looked at the reddish fields, that used to give off a vibrant greenish color. This was his first time experiencing war. What a cruel world. Was this what war veterans meant by painting the fields red? Chapter 63 Santa's predicaments While the soldiers of Baymard were celebrating their first victory, things went a little downhill for Santa. Keedon City the Empire of Corona, young master, are the first, second and third princes still asking you to pick a side? Santa looked at the three opened letters on his desk and smirked. The present king of Corona wished to step down from his throne and appoint one of his sons as the new king. In Corona, there was no such thing as crown prince. All the princes had a somewhat fair shot of being king, provided they had enough support from the nobles and knights. It was just the male nobles and all knights within the empire that were allowed to vote. Ordinary folks and peasants were not allowed to vote, talk less of women. There were three parts to the process, voting, court trials and oaths. After the standard voting period, all male nobles above the age of 15 were to go to court on a particular day, and sit behind the prince that chose to support. Once seated, all the princes would try to win over more people with their speeches and what not. If anyone felt moved by another prince, they could go and sit on the chairs under that prince's side. During the trials, the king would ask the princes questions like what they would do for Corona, how they would handle threats from other empires, and so on. As for the knights, since they voted the first time, they wouldn't need to do it again. After the trials, all the princes were to swear an oath, ensuring that everything they had said and promised, would be made possible if they were to be king. At the end, the total number of people seated under each prince would be summed up and recorded down again. Within the next two days, the king would discuss the result with his ministers. The king would look at the potential and morality of all his sons as well as the number of votes that they had gotten. All the questions asked during the trails were to test their potentials and their hearts. The king didn't want anyone who didn't have the interest of the people to rule, irrespective of how many votes they got. He also needed someone who could also be somewhat cruel to their enemies. Their potential could also be evaluated from how many people they had gathered from their speeches. To make people change their minds was not an easy feat. So the king wanted to see how many nobles left, or added on to each prince's side. Being a leader is knowing how to sway and control the opinions of the masses. A weak-willed king could easily lead to a revolt from the people or worse. There were always nobles who secretly opposed the idea of having one family rule forever. A weak-willed king would give these people the opportunity to rally up the masses against he royals. The king had to also make sure that the future king was not cowardly greedy or short-sighted. He definitely didn't need a prince who would sell out his empire because of greed, or one that would run away cowardly in the face of anger. He needed a prince that would die for the empire, even if the enemy had successfully invaded the empire. In fact, within these two days, the king would evaluate all his sons, and the best candidate would be chosen. And on the third day, the new ruler of Corona would be announced. Even though the previous kings and the present king had Corona at heart, Santa knew that none of the present candidates were up to the task. They were all proud, greedy and selfish. Although the trails and votings all seemed like a fair deal, it was actually still filled with a lot of bloodshed and violence. Nobles were bribed or threatened to vote by these princes. Most noble families would vote for all the princes, just to be safe. The father would vote for the first prince, one of his sons would vote for the second prince, and so on. Those with only daughters, could only pray and wish that they made the same choice, or else. Sigh. What if the prince they had chosen didn't win, then wouldn't their entire families face the consequences forever? Santa didn't want to vote because his father and brothers had already covered all the princes, so he was good for now. But for some reason, these princes wouldn't let him go. For over a month now, they had been harassing him and other nobles here and there, 
to show their support to one of them. If Santa really saw someone that was capable, he would definitely vote for them. But it was too bad that none of the princes had taken after their father. These stupid princes started hiring people to cause trouble for his stores and businesses over Corona. Over the past two weeks, three of his shops had caught fire while some were either robbed clean or had their workers harassed daily. Since his stores were made of stone externally, these people knocked out the guards and burnt the goods, wooden structures and other items within the store. Luckily, 95% of his goods were kept in his estates. He would only supply enough provisions to each store, that would last for no more than a week. This was to prevent theft and other minor issues. Even if people broke in, they wouldn't be able to steal much from him. And at the end of every business day, the money made was recorded and brought back to his estates. His twelve chief assistants each had an office in his estates, and were the primary accountants for all his stores. Santa had over nine estates all around Corona. He made sure that the workers came to the estates to get paid, and so in. The streets of Corona were not safe even during the day. When Santa first started business way back, he had been robbed of all his money and goods in broad daylight. If not for his mother secretly loaning him money to restart again, Santa was sure that he would still be crying over all the money he had lost. His mother had actually been daring enough to steal money from her father's estate and give it to him. He had eventually paid back the entire debt without his father even knowing. Mothers were truly a blessing. That experience taught him that just because the sun was shining brightly, didn't mean that it couldn't rain all day. Since then, he became more vigilant and observing. These princes might have thought that they had crippled his businesses, but they were so wrong. How would a puny fire outbreak, robbery or business disturbances harm him? Dot please. He was an proper businessman. He had traveled and traded with the other empires within the Pino continent. He also had various stores all over the continent as well. Corona only gave him 20% of his wealth, so he was sure that he would still be somewhat rich. Although these disturbances still affected his cash flow, he knew that they would only be temporal. Once a king was selected and crowned, all these childish stunts would stop. But recently, these princes have really been getting out of hand with him. He needed to deal with all these issues, before leaving Corona. This was the reason why he didn't travel to see land and all his other customers. This time, he could only send his subordinates to the high seas in his place. There were only five days left before the trail started. Although he wasn't attending, the sooner it ended the better for everyone in Corona. Dot. Dot. How bad was the damage this time? Santu asked. Young master, they had gotten some gang members to cause trouble and beat up our staff. His most trusted assistant, Wayne answered with a panicked tone. Have you sent the injured men to the apothecary? I did young master. But there might be some other problems as well. Go on. What exactly happened? Young master dot 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 woo woo. Three young men came over saying that they wanted to see what products we had. Then one paid for something and ate it. He later started coughing and acting as if he was dying. A lot of people crowded around him, while trying to help him up. Then out of nowhere, people from the Juba gang came and said that we were selling poisonous products to the people. From there, they took it upon themselves to beat up our staff. Now, People think that we are selling poisonous products. Our reputation is almost ruined now. Dot dot woo woo. Young master, we need to address the issue immediately. Wayne exclaimed. Santa looked at the overdramatic Wayne and couldn't help giggling. Young master. This isn't funny. What do we do? Why can't the young master be serious for once? Wayne thought as he looked at Santa helplessly. Ha ha ha. Wayne calmed down Santa said while trying to hold in his laughter. The sight of an anxious Wayne always made him laugh. Wayne would always panic over any major or minor issues Santa had. Sometimes, Wayne would even go as far as losing sleep over these problems. Santa just didn't like to worry over things that he couldn't change or things that had already happened. He only cared about moving forward. Santa was the kind of person that was always one step ahead of his enemies. Wayne, how long have you known me? 
Dot. Do you think that these trivial issues would affect me? But, Wayne paused and his eyes immediately lit up. Young master. Do you have a plan? What do you think? Chapter 64 King Barnes Decision The Royal Barn Palace, R.K. Dean. Dot. Alec Barn looked at his ministers, and was truly disappointed in them. He knew that they had been bribed by his second and third sons to do this, but how dare they disregard his orders. He himself was a scheming and conniving person, so he could easily spot the craftiness in those two sons of his. In his mind, his only good son was Eli. No matter what troubles Connor and James caused for him, Eli had never responded to them. Eli was always calm, kind and looked rather innocent in Alex's eyes. But what Alec didn't know was that, his supposedly innocent son, was just too good at hiding his emotions and his schemes. Eli was no doubt the worst of his brothers. Eli was the male version of a female white lotus. Alec was also sure that since Eli was already the crown prince, he wouldn't need to go about looking for trouble aimlessly. Hence he trusted Eli more than his other two sons. Deep down. Alec was truly happy that his younger sons had openly challenged his authority, rather than trying to assassinate their brother. They were still his sons, so he still wanted them to live in harmony. He believed that none of his children would be as daring as he was back in his days. He was sure that none of them would ever try to assassinate the other. Did he regret what he did to his family? Dot. Absolutely not. As the first prince, it was his given rights to be the crown prince of Arcadine. But his father gave the position to his younger brother, Eden. How could he take this? He despised Eden ever since they were little. Why was Eden so intelligent? Dot. Were the gods of his ancestors really against him that much? Eden excelled in both academics and knighthood. To make matters worse, all the people loved him like crazy. Alec thought that Eden was a fool. Eden would often go about in the market area helping those disgusting peasants in doing manual labor. Sometimes, Eden would also go to the healer's mansions and help out in treating ordinary people's injuries. Effing disgusting. How can a prince touch the wounds of a low-life dog? How was he fit to be the crown prince? Alec knew that even till now. His people only feared him and never truly approved of him as ruler. Dot. Even till this day, his brother had still won their hearts. Why couldn't his brother's memory just die and fade away? Dot if he was so smart, how come he died so easily? Alec didn't regret anything at all. The strong had always prevailed. That was the way of the world. Who asked him to be so weak-hearted? Dot. TSK. Serves him right. Alec still remembered the day that he killed his father and Eden. He had slipped poison in Augustus' wine just before he headed out to kill Eden. After killing Eden, he headed back home to see his dying father. He looked at his father's dying face and spat on it. He confessed to the old man and even offered to ease the old fool's pain, by stabbing a knife in his throat. Augustus was so shocked that he became speechless. Once he heard Alex say that he had just killed Eden, Augustus closed his teary eyes and died with regret. Alex sneered as he looked at his father's face. In the end, he had won. He would be the new ruler of Arcadine. What gods of his ancestors? Dot. If they were truly against him, they would have protected Adon and Augustus from dying. But since they let his father and brother die so easily, that meant that it was the will of his ancestors for him to rule Arcadine. And with that mindset, he began his killing spree. Ever since that day, he had killed all the nobles that opposed him and firmly ruled over Arcadino as a true dictator. His words were always the law, and no one dared to question them. But now, his ministers were trying to make him change his mind about Eli. Dream on, so to say, they were disagreeing with his choice on who was to be the next ruler. Dot he he he. He had to say, they had really gotten a lot ballsy over the last month. He had a nagging feeling that his second and third wives, as well as his sons, had a hand in this mess. He had to really applaud his first wife for her calm attitude about the whole charade. Although his love for her had died ages ago, she was still Eli's mother. Hence he decided to show her support, because of Eli. Now that King Barn had aged, he had also added three young harlots in his palace. In this era, prostitution was allowed, 
because it was believed that it helped prevent the greater evils of rape, sodomy and masturbation. Since these girls were too low in class to be taken in as wives of a king, he had the apothecary make drugs that would make them barren with time. Of course these women were ignorant of King Bran's schemes. So of them even dreamed of having a son to the king, but who would have thought that King Barn would be one step ahead of them? King Barn would often ask the stewards and cooks to place these drugs in their foods and drinks. How could he, the all-powerful King Barn have a child with a mere harlot? DSK it would be an even bigger disgrace than what he faced with Landon's mom, because of their young and seductive looks, King Barn had been disgusted with the appearances of his first and second wives, as for the third wife, she was still very slim and very sexy, so she was the only one that still enjoyed love making with King Barn, after giving birth to their children, his first and second wives had lost their flat bellies and their slender figures, they became larger, and had added lot of weight on their buttocks. Where was the thin and slender women that he had married? Actually, his wives weren't fat, they were just curvier. But in this era, being thin was in vogue, and curvier, heavier women were seen as unattractive. When he compared the slim harlots to his wives, he began to wonder what he ever saw in them. A woman's place was in her husband's kitchen, house and bedroom. As his wives, since they never worked a day in their lives, what was the point of keeping them if they became repulsive in his eyes? Pui, he couldn't even stand talking to them. That was why he had given them courtyards far away from his. I'd rather never make love again than to sleep with those fat pigs. So disgusting. Dot. Dot. My king, I truly think that Prince Connor is the best choice for the throne. One of his ministers said, He's right your highness. Prince Connor is an excellent choice. Nonsense. Everyone knows that Prince James is the best choice for kingship. That's right. He might be young, but he has proven himself time and time again. No, it's Prince Connor. Prince James. Alex sat in his chair and held the urge to jump up and smack all his ministers in the head. Proven themselves time and time again? Dot. How come he never witnessed these miracles of his other sons? So no one is supporting my son Eli? King Barn asked coldly, as looked at his ministers who had their faces towards the ground. Your Majesty, it's n dot dot not that we don't want to support Prince Eli. B dot dot but the people want another prince as the crown prince. That's right your highness. The other day there were thousands of people gathered in the black market who wanted Prince Eli removed as crown prince. Your Highness, Prince James in particular cares about the people very much. He gave them gave food and money, for them to take care of themselves. Your Highness, Prince Connor also visited the hospitals and and the poor around the capital. I think it would be good to give him a chance. Bang! Alec hit his hand on the arm of his chair, violently. So you all are telling me that the prince that I, King Alec Barn shows, is not good enough to rule? Alec said with a bone-chilling tone. The ministers shivered with fear at the sight of their angry king. No matter what you all say, my choice will always be Prince Eli. Dot. So I suggest you all think things through thoroughly. Dot 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 he he he. Anyone who doesn't agree, can hand over his life to me. Dot. Everyone quickly shivering while bowing their heads in fear. Their king was truly scary when he was angry. Alec looked at his ministers and sneered. A bunch of cowards. Dot 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 fear was, and had always been the only way that he could control them. Now, let's talk about the upcoming assignments. How do you all plan to divide the work? M. My lord. So far, we have lost five cities around the border. So we propose that since there are three princes, let each prince head over to each city and try to take them back. A brave minister answered instantly. Yes my lord. As for the other two cities, we had already sent letters to City Lord Shannon of the West, and City Lord Barang of the South, telling them about their mission. Another minister added, actually, the ministers did this so that if one of the other princes did well in the battle, 
their king would be impressed and willingly change Eli as the crown prince. This was their plan B. Good, let each prince and the two city lords be the main leaders in charge of securing the cities. But it still won't be enough. Have four other city lords and their armies aid each leader to take back the cities. But let me be clear, if they can't succeed in taking back our territories, they should just die there and never come back. I will not allow useless men to live and thrive in my empire. Chapter 65 Clean up It had been three days after that unpleasant war at Baymard. The soldiers now took their military lessons more seriously. They wanted to further understand all the side effects and injuries one could get from cannons, should in case they were one day attacked with these kinds of weapons. They also started taking their first aid classes more seriously as well. When they remembered the gruesome sight of their enemies, they couldn't help but shudder a bit. It was better to be prepared, than to be sorry. After that battle, the soldiers had gathered all the swords and armor together and sent them to the construction company. The weapons were to be melted and used any way that deemed fit. Landon thought that, it was better to completely destroy all the evidence of war at once. In this era, Shields and other weapons were marked depending on their territories. If the men one day left with these weapons, people would start wondering how they got access to Riverdale weapons. Within these three days, Landon and the soldiers went out to the fields and clean up all the dead body parts lying around. They had picked up ears, eyes and other body parts. Even an entire leg was seen lying about on the fields. Landon had the men pile up all the body parts and burn them in a huge bonfire. Since they were enemy knights, it was a taboo for them to be buried here. In this era people believed that burying your enemy on your land would curse and bring bad fortune to the land. Since they believed in the fact that their ancestors were gods. They also believed that the dead men would one day turn into powerful ancestors that would hinder Baymard's growth. It was also believed if they were buried here, these men would even have the power to block their wives from childbirth, give their families terrible illnesses, and so on. After all, this men were their enemies, so they would never spare their children and families for many generations to come. Of course Landon didn't believe in all that hocus pocus, but since his men believed in it, he had no choice but to burn all the enemy knights. Once they were burned, their ashes were gathered and taken far away from Baymard by carriage and dumped closer to Riverdale City. The men had secretly dug out a large hole in the forest closest to Riverdale, and buried the ashes into the ground. Before leaving, they also burned the wagon, and also buried the ashes of the wagon in the ground. This was done because they were afraid that someone might actually use this wagon to enter Baymard one day. Also, since some traces of the dead knight's ashes were still on the wagon, the only choice was to burn down the mother fur. They had buried the ashes, because they were afraid that the wind might successfully blow these ashes miles away back to Baymard. The men had said that it was better for the dead knights to haunt Riverdale, than Baymard. Landon was speechless. His soldiers had really pulled a James Bond stunt just because of this. Dot. Can't they use their skills for something better? The funny thing was that when they came back, they looked so proud of themselves, and even went as far as saying mission accomplished. Who the heck gave you that kind of mission? Did I tell you guys to go about sneakily into the enemy's forest region? Dot. And how the heck would the wind blow ashes two and a half hours away from Baymard? Dot. Aren't you guys being a little too paranoid? As he looked at the proud expressions on their faces, he didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. All this because of the ancestors? Really? His soldiers didn't even want to throw the ashes into the sea, because they feared that the waves would bring the ashes back to the surface. And there was another ridiculous story about enemy ashes that touched the sea, which Landon was fed up with. At this point, Landon couldn't even be bothered with them anymore. Once the dead bodies had been successfully removed, the areas on the field that that holds, were filled with ground, crushed stones and grass. As for the blood, Landon had mixed a lot of luminol chemicals, with some water and sprayed the mixture all over the fields. Luminol was always used back on earth for crime investigations. It was the perfect chemical to remove all blood stains thoroughly. The thick reddish fields that once looked like someone sprayed a giant bottle of ketchup on them, were now looking green again. 
all the evidence of what had been successfully removed. Luckily, no one ever visited Baymard, so they easily completed all the work without the fear of being caught. During the cleanup process, the men had recovered a lot of coins from the pockets of the knights underground. The coins came up to the equivalent of 21,000 gold coins. Landon distributed the coins between those warrant soldiers who participated in the war, and those that assisted in cleanup duties. Landon felt like that was for the best. The money was theirs to begin with, as they did all the work in the end. As for the horses, those that were dead, were sent to the food industry to be cleaned up and sold as meat to the citizens. Of course, he sent some meat to the military and the schools for free, on account of the war that the soldiers had just fought. And heck! Why should children have to pay for anything? They had also recovered 4,319 horses, which they quickly sent to the stables in the upper region. Landon had already made a mental note to add more stable boys or animal caretakers in future. These caretakers would take care of other animals other than horses, so it was a good idea to increase their numbers. Right now, since there were just 12 stable boys, they were really understaffed. With the addition of 4,319 horses, Baymard now had 6,890 horses. Landon told the stable boys to hang on until the next month, before he added more people to aid them. Just one more week, the stable boys thought. Since he was gone with cleanup, Landon decided to go prepare for his date. He was supposed to have a date with Lucy three days ago, but this damn war ruined his plans. When Lucy found out about the war that day, she was so shocked that she forgot about the date. When did the war happen? How come she didn't know anything about it? Normally, the citizens in the central regions, would hear the cannon shots regularly, so they thought that it was just for practice reasons. Those in the lower regions couldn't even hear a single thing, so they were fine. As or Lucy who was in the upper region, normally, the knights would practice in the upper regions, but since the war happened at the gate on the central region, she almost couldn't hear a single thing. She had spent her day teaching peacefully, so how would she know about any war? Lucy began to feel uneasy. Would the enemies come back for revenge? Would they want to destroy her happiness just like that? Dot what should she do? What if those men that Landon let go come back with reinforcements? Landon had painstakingly explained the situation to her explaining over and over again that Baymard would be fine. It was only after being reassured for at least ten times, did Lucy calm down. Normally, Landon would see Lucy at breakfast or when he got back at night. They would spend twenty-three hours daily talking and laughing merrily. There are also times where he would see her around Baymard as well. Landon understood that she too had a job to do. Sometimes, when he was free, she would be busy with lectures. He felt like he was getting married to a university lecturer. She would come to school early, teach, do research, read, and sometimes stay till 8 or 9 p.m. in school. Even when Landon asked if Lucy wanted her classes reduced, she strongly refused, saying that she would feel empty without it. It had become a part and parcel of her now. Her students looked up to her, and when they saw her around Baymard, they would greet her and tell her how much they appreciated her classes. There was no way she would give up this feeling of accomplishment. Furthermore, it's not like teachers teach all year round. The school break was coming up, so Lucy knew that she would be somewhat free during that time. Dot. Dot. Since it was already 8.30 p.m., Landon was sure that Lucy was done with her lectures. He waited outside her classroom with a bunch of tulips, which he stole from his own castle garden. Landon meant stole because, every time he wanted to pluck any flower from the garden, the three musketeers, Old Man Willow and his friends, would harass him here and there. They kept saying that he had no right to touch the flowers without their permission. Landon was really helpless against those three old grandpas. How could he not not have the right to touch flowers in his own garden? Did that make any sense? Funny enough, they had stopped calling him Rat, and started calling him Sunny Boy. Landon has waited for her class to finish. He peeked at her and smiled. Finally, the class was over. Once Landon was sure that there were no more students in her classroom, 
he walked in while holding the bouquet of tulips, instantly taking her by surprise. Ah, brother Landon when did you get here, does it matter, he replied, while handing the flowers over to her. These are lovely dot 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 how did you know that they are my favorite, it's my duty to know, whiff I Landon said while smiling lovingly at her. As usual, her face was flushed as a tomato again, sigh. Young love, let's go. I have a surprise for you. Chapter 66 School Examinations This was the last week of June. It was time for the end of the first school semester. This meant exams. The students were already used to their notebooks and pens. It was way better and cleaner than using slate boards and chalk. Landon had given all the children below ages 15, four empty notebooks, three eraser pencils and seven pens two blue, two black, two red and one green. If they needed more, their parents were to buy it for them, and those who were orphans, could take them free of charge from the school canteen. The adults who took classes were required to buy their own textbooks as well. After all, they all worked and the books and pens were cheap. Nine pens cost five copper coins, nine pencils cost five copper, while one book cost three copper coins. The teachers still used chalk of course. With these books, the students could go home and revise their lessons. For those that came to school in the middle of the semester, they would only be given tests on what they know so far. But within the one month break, it was compulsory for them to take makeup classes so as to catch up with the rest for the next semester. Those that couldn't catch up would repeat their classes on the next semester, while those that passed would move on ahead to the next phase. All they had been learning so far were language and math. Now, it was time to introduce them into the world of chemistry. Of course it wasn't intense chemistry, just the basics. With the basics, they could go about and have assignments like science projects and so on. Those that passed and did well, would advance and take math 3, language 2 and chemistry 1. Today, the little princess Linda, from Yodan Empire was taking the final exam for the semester. Back at Yodan, nine-year-old Linda was ignored and bullied most of the time. Since she wasn't a favored princess, the maids, servants and even her teachers looked down on her. The only people who cared for her were her mother Winnie and brother Biri. She would cry daily and sometimes even feel like she was trapped, with nowhere to go. But ever since she came to Bay Mud, the people were nice and she could finally go to school with other children who were very humble. And for some reason, the food tasted better here as well. Landon would come to her school and read amazing stories to her and the other children. She even played on the metal swing in something called a slide. The little princess was very happy. She loved everyone, even the funny Grandpa Willow. He would always put flowers on her hair and push her on the garden swing yet. He gave trouble to Landon for plucking tulips. Dot. Dot. Linda sat in the large classroom nervously. Although she had math teachers and language teachers back in Yodan, she had realized that Baymard's educational system was different. It was way better and more detailed. Plus she loved her rainbow painted exercise books, pencils and pens, which were much better and simpler to use. For the tests, she liked that they were evenly spaced throughout the week, giving her more time to read at home. The moment of truth had come. The teacher placed a sheet of paper face down in front of her. Today, she was taking her first exam. Math 1. Once all the papers were shared, Grace signaled for them to start. Somewhere in another classroom, Linda's mother Winnie, Kim and Lucy, were also giving out the same exam. Today was meant for Math 1. So even if they weren't teaching it, they had to help supervise the exams as well. All tests had different sections within them. Some of the sections in Math 1 and Math 2 were similar to one another, but not actually the same. Math 1 had 7-7 seven, seven sections. 15% additions, 15% subtractions, 15% playing with operations using plus or, 10% number writing, 15% word problems using only plus or, 15% measuring length using only plus or 15% measuring time using only plus or Linda looked through the section titled edition and began first question 
145 plus 74 equals show rough work. She immediately started using her fingers and even showed the carryover process on the paper. The more she answered, the more confident she became. Time went on and she arrived at the playing with operations using only plus or part. Question, achieve the result 20, by using the numbers, 2, 6 and 4, as many times as you like. He looked at the question and her eyes lit up. 6 plus 4 is 10, 10 plus 4 is 15 dot 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 no no no. It's 14. She thought, just like that. She completed that section. Now, it was time for word problems. Question, there are 67 bird families living near the mountain. If 32 bird families flew away for winter, how many are left near the mountain? She immediately started writing the main points, as she was taught in class. 67 bird families flew away. 32 bird families. Ah! This is a subtraction. This is taking away she exclaimed inwardly as she immediately did the subtractions. When she was at the last section, Grace kindly reminded them to drop their pens, pencils and papers. She was currently in the last section and had three questions left to answer. She couldn't help but curse the sixth section for slowing her down. All in all, she felt like she was going to do very well in the exam. After the exam, she discussed her answer with some of her friends. Did you guys succeed in finishing the exam? Ah, I only had one question left, and then they took away for paper. Woo woo, I'm not sure I did well. Don't cry, who can say that we will all pass? Yeah plus theas still make up classes during the break. Don't forget that if you do well in math 2 and pyron 1, you will still advance. We have to study hard for the next tests. Ah, question 5 in section 4 was very confusing. It was definitely a trap. Dot. Dot. And just like that, the math 1 exam had officially come to an end. Two days later, the exam for math 2 began. The exam had 8 sections. 12%, multiplication tables. 12%, multiplication. 12%, divisions, 12%, playing with operations using times or divided by, 10%, number writing, 14%, measuring length using only times or divided by, 14%, measuring weight using only times or divided by, 14%, measuring time, using only times or divided by, under, the section titled, multiplication tables, Linda moved like lighting question, 3 times 7 equals, and under the multiplication section, Linda still felt it was easy, question, 727 times 4 equals, moving forward, Linda realized that she had spent too much time with the section number writing, question, write 9416 in numbers, thousand dot dot thousand, ah, dot, it's 1000. But since it's 9, then it's 9000. She also spent time doing the measuring length, weight and time sections. Question, 2 meters equals? Cm. Question, 20 kilograms equals? G. Question, 9 hours 45 minutes equals? Minutes. Dot. Dot. Once again, she was unable to finish her exam on time. Was it a curse for her to never to finish on time? She quickly went home and started practicing her pretenses, present tenses and so on, for her Pyron exam. All the people in Pino spoke one language, so the language spoken in Yodan was the same as that in Arcadina. Another two days passed and it was time for her final exam. Pyron 1 was divided into sections. 18% Nouns, Verbs adjectives and pronouns, 18%, all tenses, present, past, simple, etc., 9%, writing numbers into words, 15%, prepositions, 20%, choose correct incorrect sentences, 20%, choose complete incomplete sentences. Linda kept seeing questions like, question, Choose whether the following sentence is a simple or compound sentence. Question, which sentence shows the proper use of a noun? Question, write 109 in words. Question, 
which is not a complete sentence. Question, identify the adverb in the sentence. For her, language was easy compared to math. So for the first time ever, she had successfully finished all the questions for the exam. She even had 10 minutes to spare, so she decided to go over her work once more. Once the exam papers were collected, she truly felt free as a bird. She had never had this type of feeling before. She began discussing with her friend on what they would do with this one month vacation. She had been told that the exams would be posted on the 12th day of July. Also, the next semester was going to start in August. So for the entire month of July, she would hopefully have no school. To be honest, she didn't want to spend the entire July doing makeup classes. That's why she earnestly prayed that her results would be at least alright to take her to the next stage. She had been so stressed during this exam period, that she didn't even care how her hair looked like when she left the house early this morning. Her mom wanted to fix it, but she refused as she needed to use all her time for studying. She looked at her mom as if saying, Mom? My holiday is at stake here and you're worried about my hair? Right now, she didn't even want to see a single book, at least until August. Finally, no more exams. Chapter 67 What Was Going On? Part 1 Kedon City. The Empire of Corona was... Dot. Over at Corona, there were celebratory banners everywhere. The food stalls were crowded and busy while the inns were also full to the brim. Children were running about happily with their parents, while making their way to the side of the palace. Santa stood with his family outside the palace, facing a giant terrace, while waiting for the king to appear. All the citizens were waiting as well. Today was the day that they had all been waiting for. Who would be king? The three princes who were already standing on the terrace, displayed arrogant demeanors as they watched the people beneath them, the only princess were also there as well. Suddenly the trumpets were played and the royal message relay uh, walked on to the giant terrace. Then the royal announcer rushed out to the terrace and took out an iron funnel-like object, which was called a speaking trumpet also called a loud hailer or megaphone. In this era, the speeches from royalty were made by the royal announcer. These announcers worked like how the White Rabbit in Alice in Wonderland worked. Their biggest asset was the voice. Since a king was beneath yelling, the royal announcer would use these instruments and read out any document or announcements from the king. The king was just present to indicate that whatever was read out, was true. Announcing, His Royal Majesty King Carmelo, the first queen, Queen Megara and the second queen, Queen Nathana. Following them is King Adrian and Duchess Veronica, Duke Samuel and Duchess Kate, and finally, Duchess Mina and Duke Crouchard. The royal announcer yelled out, Twelve knights first went ahead and stationed themselves along every main corner of the terrace. Then, King Carmelo stepped out with two knights in front of him, and his two wives, Queen Megara and Queen Nathana by his sides. Behind him were the former King Adrian Carmelo's father, his own queen, Duchess Veronica Carmelo's mother, Duke Samuel Carmelo's brother and his own wife Duchess Kate. Following them were, Duchess Mina Carmelo's sister and her own husband Duke Richard, as well as another twelve other guards behind them. The children of King Carmelo's siblings were also on the terrace as well. Duke Adrian had only married one woman his entire life. This woman was Duchess Veronica who gave birth to Carmelo and his younger siblings. The siblings really didn't have any issues with each other since they were blood siblings. Plus, they kind of liked pushing all the work for Carmelo to do. Duke Samuel used to say that he would rather have Carmelo do all the work, while he just sat there and ate all the money. He was really lazy and didn't like work at all. He just enjoyed having night battles. Who had time to do all the paperwork and maintaining all the peace and order within the empire? It was such a drag. Back in their days, when it was time for their own trial, Samuel had faked illness just so that he could miss out on the trials. But King Adrian wasn't having it, and rescheduled another trial session. Then Samuel knelt and begged Adrian to pass it over to Carmelo. Samuel had seen all the work his father had put into Corona, who would like to have such responsibilities. Although he was a good person at heart, he knew that he didn't like ruling the empire. When he was younger, 
all the royal tutors had headaches because of him. He would skip out on classes and always complain about some illness that didn't exist. In fact the entire empire knew of Samuel's antics, but they also knew that he was a good person as well, he was, sadly, just too lazy to be king. Because of this, Kamlo had won without even fighting for the position. In all honesty, Kamlo also didn't care who took over the throne. The royal family had money, so he got the same pay as his siblings. Even till this day. So in essence he was just doing all the work, while they still got their pay. Now he began to understand Damuel's point, it really was a drag. Kruna's way of ruling and allocating funds, was completely different from most parts in the continent. You couldn't just take money just because you were king. And if you insulted, bullied or stole from the people, you would be removed from the throne immediately. But what people feared was that the next kings, would change these rules. Rules were made by people and could also be broken by people. That's why one needed to be careful over who they gave the throne to. All the citizens cheered, clapped and waved their hands at the sight of their king, whom they deeply respected. Once the king had gotten to his normal position on the terrace, he began waving at them with a smile on his face. The queens and the other royals, also began waving as well. The people even cheered more loudly, and some people even raised their children in the air, to have a better look at the king. Look, look! He waved at us. Ah! Dot! Did he just twink at us? The king has a very warm smile. He is still charming after all these years. I couldn't agree with you more. Look look, King Carmelo waved at my son just now. Daddy daddy, King Adrian also looked at me. As the people talked and smiled, some people even began crying at the sight of their king. He had done a lot of humanitarian jobs for the people and everyone knew of his boundless kindness within his heart. Such a king was definitely the best within the entire Pino continent. The people had heard of the ridiculous things that other kings did, and were truly shocked. They knew how fortunate they were to have such a king. Even the previous king was the same as their present king. The people knew that it was due to their practice of choosing an heir to the throne that made them feel safe. But now, they couldn't help but feel that their happy days were coming to an end. Who didn't know the real nature of these princes? They had been going about bullying and treating people like garbage because their father was king. They felt that they deserved everything just because they were royalty, left to the people. They would rather have their present king stay on the throne till he died. After a while, the king raised his right hand straight up to the sky, and the tune of the trumpets changed, indicating that the citizens should quiet down. Now, it was time to get down the business. King Carmelo handed over a parchment letter to the royal announcer in the presence of everyone, and the royal announcer knelt down and accepted it. This was to tell everyone that the message or paper had not switched hands and had indeed been from King Carmelo. The royal announcer opened it and was stunned. Just what was going on? Chapter 68 What was going on? Part 2 The royal announcer opened the letter and reread it again. He then looked at King Carmelo and was lost for words. The people were also wondering what was so shocking about the message. The royal announcer cleared his throat loudly. Wasn't their king being too daring right now? Although he approved of what was written down, it didn't change the fact that it was still groundbreaking. Was their king trying to give him a heart attack? The hearts of the citizens started beating loudly, as they waited for the results anxiously. Mr. Announcer, can you hurry up? Do you want to kill us with anxiety? The announcer took in a big gulp of air and exhaled loudly. It was better to get it over with. From today onwards, King Carmelo has willing stepped down the throne as the ruler of Corona. Within these years, he has enjoyed fulfilling his numerous duties as ruler of Corona, as well as spending time with his people. Because he was close to you all, he has decided to leave the best parting gift as a former ruler of Corona. He decided to leave the empire with someone whom you all can wholeheartedly rely on. But don't worry, just as King Adrian, he too will look over the ruling party as a counselor for the empire. Although he has left the throne, he will still be here as you all move towards the future. Today, we are all here to welcome a new king to the empire. From today onwards, 
Princess Penelope will be the next ruler of Corona. The coronation day will be scheduled on the 5th of July. This is the final verdict of King Carmelo. Everyone was stunned. Did they just hear correctly? Princess Penelope? Haha. <laughs> she was the most perfect one to take on the job. Very quickly the citizens all cheered. Unlike her brothers, she was very kind smart and knew how to make wise decisions. She had also proven herself time and time again within the empire. At the age of seven, the first time that she saw her brother train with the sword, she would sneak out and hide in the pushes to listen to his trainers. At night, she would then sneak back out of her courtyard with a stolen sword in her hand, as she made her way to the practice field. For over a month, no one noticed her movements. But one day, her grandfather, King Adrian noticed her sneaking away and followed. At first he was fuming mad at the fact that she wanted to learn sword fighting. How could a woman have the aptitude for battle? When he was about to stop her, she perfectly executed a move that would take a regular page at least six months to learn. His eyes lit up. She clearly had talent for the sword. From then on, he began observing her quietly every night. After a while, her father King Carmelo and her uncle Duke Samuel, discovered it as well. The three men started sneaking about at night to observe her movements. They were all utterly stunned by her quick reflexes, and aptitude. Then four months later, they saw her sneaking into the royal library, where she would read a ton of books on different subjects. They looked at her and decided that they would assist this little cute bunny. Once she was found out, she didn't even flinch under her father grandfather and uncle's auras. They had realized their terrifying auras when questioning her because they wanted to see what she would do. She stood there, steady as the water and smiled at them. The reason why she wasn't afraid was because, to her, they were her family. She had spent enough time with them, for her to believe that they would hurt her. Their powerful auras in her eyes were the same as how the three musketeers kept disturbing Landon. She found it extremely cute. But what she didn't know was that, these cute auras had made a lot of people wet the pants before. These men were war veterans for heaven's sake. She was just a curious child and didn't understand why women couldn't do certain things. They had told her that she couldn't wield a sword, but didn't she successfully do it? Dot. Doesn't that mean that everyone was lying to her? She really didn't get what the big deal was. She hated doing needlework and all those other things, so what she was doing right now, was trying to find things that she loved doing. She had also seen her father read a book, so she thought that maybe reading was also fun. Hence she started making her way towards the Royal Library at night. When she took the first manual on war tactics, she was intrigued and completely lost herself in it. Reading seemed to be something that she liked as well. Plus she also realized that she could remember and understand things a little better than others. Once Carmelo and the rest understood her reasoning, they realized that this child of theirs was a gifted one. From them on, she became the only woman accepted as a night page as well as the only one who would go on missions and aid the poor. Maybe it was because she was a woman, but most people noticed that she would give it her all to help those in need. She never did anything half-heartedly. If she said she would do it, she would either do it perfectly, or die trying. She also helped in state affairs and aided her father, uncle and grandfather whenever she could. To them, her ideas were genius. At the age of 14, she was already going on missions with her father to fight pirates and bandits that came to Corona. No one wanted her to go, but this little woman snuck into the supple wagon, and when they were already six hours away from the capital, they finally discovered her. Or rather, she revealed herself. She was pressed and wanted to relieve herself, so she popped out of the wagon and shocked everyone silly. Princess? Can you not do this? Do you think that we are here for fun? The knights all thought. Everyone took her as their little sister, so they were worried for the little bunny. Even after her father reprimanded her, she still didn't know what she did wrong. As a knight wasn't it her duty to fight for Corona? It was then and there that Carmelo and the others realized that although the princess was the smartest person they knew, she was really dense in personal relationships. At this point in time, she was already daddy's girl, so could he not panic after finding out that she had come over on his mission. But what surprised him was that when they were on their way to save a village from bandits, 
The little princess came up with a clever plan, which was even better than his original one. She also fought bravely and rescued two of his knights from the bandits. When they got back to the capital, Grandpa Adrian and Samuel who had been looking for her for over two months, became excited. Her mother Queen Megara, who was on the verge of collapse came back to life and cried while hugging her. Why was mommy crying? Did someone bully her mother while she was away? She didn't get it as well. Without even knowing it, these everyone, including the knight, had taken her as their precious treasures. They all reprimanded her, but it was no use. Nothing got into that head of hers. When they heard of her bravery, they hosted a feast in her honor as the savior of the village. The little princess thought it was bothersome. All she wanted to do was sleep and train. What was the point if this? After that, she had been unexpectedly groomed for the position of king. Or should we say queen? Of course at that time, none of the men thought that they were grooming her for that position. They just thought that since their little bunny was good at all these things, she should do them. So what if she was a woman? What was wrong with that? Chapter 69 What was going on? Part 3 Because of Penelope, over the years, Corona had accepted over 200 female knights into their ranks. It wasn't a lot, but it was still progress for women all around the empire. She was a heroine to all. Actually anyone from earth would say that she looked like Akame in Akame Gakil. She was extremely beautiful and her dark black hair made her look like a moon goddess. She was brave, loyal and the most shocking thing was that her sword skills could put 90% of the knights to shame. The funny thing about her was that, she didn't get relationships between men and women at all. Once, a knight told her that when they look at her, they have a love heartache. All she understood in that sentence was look and heartache. Since then, she would carry the knight to any healer's mansion every time she saw him. She would carry him princess style while requesting for the healer to check his pulse. Ha <laughs> ha. All the other knights in training would always laugh at the scene. For them, she was a total badass. It was at this point that most knights started realizing that they were attracted to strong women. Who liked all those girls who always waited for you to rescue them. They realized that a woman doesn't necessarily had to fight. But she needed to have standards. She needed to be able to use her brain and not depend on a man to always use his brain for her. Penelope had really changed the game in Corona. Women wanted to do other jobs now because of her. And now, she had become the first female ruler in the history of the world. Hurtfilia. If Princess Jeanette Bunn knew about this, she would definitely want to split Penelope's head from her neck. How dare Penelope take her dream as the first female ruler? and her shine, Penelope was deeply respected by the knights and was considered as their little princess as well. She had a whole knight fan club, and if any boy even tried to ask her out again, those knights would send eye daggers towards their way. The funny thing was that she was completely unaware of these occurrences. Seeing the people cheer even louder, Kamlo was sure that he had made the right choice. After the trials were done, Kamlo, Adrian, Samuel and some other ministers, had gathered around and review all the answers his sons had given them. Also, prior to the noble trials, he had requested for his secret guards to monitor their actions. What pained him the most was that they went about threatening the citizens and nobles go vote for them. How could he give all his hard work to those arrogant brats? They would just crumble down all his and Adrian's hard work over the years. And their answers to his questions were also infuriating. Their answers all showed that they were either too greedy, selfish or too arrogant. That same day, he called Penelope to come over. She answered the questions excellently in front of them all and even swore an oath on it. She herself was clueless as to why they would ask her such obvious questions. Wasn't it the duty of a knight to fight for their empire? Wasn't it the duty of a knight to give their heart and soul for the people? As the men listened to her explanation for an obvious answer, they almost puked blood. Can you not continue to disgrace your brothers even further? It might be easy to you but they all failed woefully. In fact, even if an examiner multiplied any number to their scores, the result wouldn't change. Zero, times anything would still give you zero. What a utter disgrace. Actually, Penelope didn't know about the trials, as she simply didn't pay attention to anything else other than her duties. Before she left the room, they had told her that she would be ruler, 
which shocked her for the first time in her life. But after ten seconds, so he shrugged it off and went on about her duties. As everyone cheered on, the three princes were fuming inside. Weren't they princes? Wasn't the throne supposed to go to them? How was this fair? Penelope came forward with her sword on her hips and knelt down in front of her father. You may rise, Carmelo said. He then stepped to the side and allowed her to take his place on the terrace. She took the megaphone from the royal announcer, which stunned everyone as well. Princess, speaking is the announcer's job all right? They were truly helpless against her but they didn't really mind. They all knew that their princess was the densest of them all. I am honored to be appointed as the new ruler of Corona. I promise that I will give my all in ruling Corona fairly, and with the same competence, strength and willpower that I have when training with my sword. I will protect you all, and will continue to ensure that peace and prosperity reign within the empire. With my father, uncle and grandfather guiding me through, I know that I will be able to fulfill my duties as your queen. As she spoke, she knelt down like a knight, and gave them her solemn oath. The people were deeply touched by her speech, one needed to know that she took her sword training far more seriously, than her life. For her to say that she would put them at the same level as her training, truly touching. Hail Queen Penelope! Hail Queen Penelope! As the people cheered, the ministers and nobles who had previously voted for the princes, were truly happy. After all the threats and warnings they had gotten from those troublemakers, they felt like justice had been served. Those that only had daughters, had been worried sick that they had not made the right choice. Who knew if one of these princes would come for revenge? They had heard of all the cruel things that royals of other empires did, so who could say that these princes, who threatened them wouldn't do the same. They had watched these princes grow up and knew their bad personalities. As nobles, thy children could attend the same night classes as the princes, so how could they not know? Some of their sons had been beaten up blue-black because they disagreed with any of the princes. But now, they could finally put their minds to rest. It was truly a good day in Corona. Santa smiled as he looked at the turn of events. The winds of change were blowing in Corona. And now, he could finally begin traveling again after the coronation next month. Chapter 70 July It was finally July 2nd, and Santa's subordinates had brought 6,800 people to Baymard, as well as 1,000 cows, 600 sheep, 400 chickens, 100 goats and 400 Angora goats, as well as several planting seeds for sale. Previously, Landon had requested for these animals because he didn't want his people to go around buying them from the neighboring cities. With all the craziness going on in the empire, it would be better to lessen people's suspicions about what was really happening in Baymard. People still thought that the place was extremely poor, and that the people still looked like street beggars. They still had this ridiculous imagination that the people here could fight, and kill tourists over a single loaf of bread. Back in the capital, the old Landon had heard numerous ridiculous tales about Baymard. But the present him, knew that there was no logic to them. If the people were really that vicious, how come they never formed gangs and attacked different cities or even other tiny villages? They would have resulted into thievery, if they really had no way out. Plus there were wild animals in the forest and fish in the sea. Although they were starving, since their population wasn't much to begin with, they could still manage to pull through. There were probably a handful of people who tried robbery, but Landon couldn't put all the citizens into one category and call them thieves. But in this era, everything idea or story became reality by word of mouth. So in the eyes of most people in the empire, the people of Baymard were wild carnivores that could even eat your entire leg out, due to extreme hunger. I mean, Landon really couldn't blame them for thinking that way too. Back on Earth, Landon had heard of different cultures and rules that scared the SH out of him. He didn't even want to go to those countries and verify if those stories were true or not. Better safe than sorry. Another reason why no traders, merchants, or even people came over, was mainly because Baymard had been exiled from the Empire, who wanted to risk getting King Barnes wrath by coming over here. And why would people travel over for hours, 
just to witness the sight of extreme poverty. This wasn't a theme park attraction. This was an abandoned territory. It wasn't a wise move for merchants and traders. Even ordinary citizens wouldn't leave their towns, villages and cities miles away just to come here, except they were running or hiding from someone. That's why if anyone ever came towards the city gates, Landon had a 99% hunch that it was an enemy. Although he knew all this, Landon still had no desire to change the Empire's misconception about Baymard. Lastly, Landon didn't want the citizens to be killed while venturing out by either assassins or knights who planned to kill him and seize his land. One could never be sure if more people were coming to get him anytime soon. Hell, they could be on their way right at this very moment. Looking at the animals leave the boat, like how they did in the Bible, Landon became thrilled. He needed milk from the cows, sheep and goats to make butter. In addition, he also needed to teach the food industry workers how to raise the animals and how to incubate the eggs while waiting for them to hatch. He decided that 50% of the eggs would be sold, and the other half would be hatched to chicks. In fact for all the animals, he would adapt that same philosophy. Yes, killing animals was cruel. But bruh dot 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 people had to eat. These were dark times, alright? Since the people needed meat. He would only kill 5% of each animal type for now. There were no fridges to store the meat, so it was better to start with a low percentage. And if the people needed more, then he would gradually increase the percentage steadily. But he would never go above 50% of each animal type. Of course he would never kill baby animals as well. He also needed the wolf from the sheeps for making blankets, carpets and several clothing items. Sheep had very fast wool growth. So Landon needed to teach the men how to take care of these animals. It was very essential for their wool to be cut, because if it overgrew, the sheep would have several complications. Excess wool would impede the sheep's ability to regulate their body temperatures, making them die from overheat. The urine and feces would also get trapped on the wool, attracting flies, which in turn causes infections and hence endangering their health. They would also have difficulty moving or seeing. As for Angora goats, their fur was needed for making mohair yarn. Angora goats looked exactly like sheep, but their fur was very stringy compared to that of sheep. Mohair yarn was needed to make good winter scarves, coats, hats, suits, socks, carpets, sweaters and other clothing items as well. Funny enough, because its texture resembled fine human hair, it was also used to make doll wings and so on. Of course for now, he didn't want to go into textile just yet. He wanted to first use his time to breed the animals properly. He had noticed that Baymard really lacked a lot of pasture around. Sure. There were a few goats and rabbits within the territory, but it wasn't enough for farming seeds. This time Landon bought cotton seeds and all the other seeds that he had previously gotten. Landon also sold several laws to Santa's subordinate at his normal discounted price of course. At the end, Landon only made 275,000 coins this time. This was his lowest amount so far. He really couldn't help but felt that he had really gone overboard with his spending this time. He had really lost a lot of coins paying for all those animals, seeds and slaves from Santa. Although he knew that they were all essential to Baymard, it still hurt spending that huge sum of money at once. Chapter 71 Another Wild Bunch Landon became curious as to why Santa hadn't showed up in Baymard for the past two months now. Was he sick? Did any impending crises befall him? Your Highness, the young master is fine. Actually, King Carmelo of Corona should have stepped down from the throne by now. That's why the young master wasn't here personally. Landon was shocked. He willingly stepped down from the throne in this era. Landon couldn't help but give two thumbs up to the old man. After finding out about the traditions and customs of Corona from Santa's subordinate, he had to admit that it was way better than what his bastard father was doing. Landon could also somehow understand why Santa's father would be disappointed in his son not wanting to serve as a knight. Who wouldn't want to serve such a king? But to some extent, he also understood Santa's own way of thinking. Santa just hated rules, 
and from the looks of it, Santa's own father was even stricter than King Carmelo when it came to rules. If King Carmelo helped the poor out, they would say it's an act of charity. But when Santa worked in the bakery, he became a laughing stock in his city. From what Landon understood, no one really laughed at Santa in a mocking way. They were just teasing him. But in Santa's father's eyes, it seemed like real insult, so the problem only lied in Santa's family. He was also curious to know which son would take over the throne from King Carmlo. But too bad that Santa's subordinate had no clue as well, since he left two weeks before the trials had even begun. Once the ships headed out to sea, Landon decided to settle all the newly arrived citizens. Dot. Dot. Amongst the group of people, there were 312 children, 183 seniors, and 527 people who volunteered for the army. Again, Landon had received seven eccentric senior citizens that also wanted to prove their worth to him. As soon as Landon saw them walking hurriedly towards him, he knew. He just knew that they were cousins to the three musketeers. After spending more time with the three old men, how could he not recognize their cousins the Fantastic Seven? Before they even got closer to him, Landon immediately ordered the knights to carry all surrounding stones around the area and dump far away from the beach. And his guess was right. As soon as they arrived, they stared yelling out very loudly. Where are you taking those stones to? Hey, didn't you hear us? Underscore. Among the seven, were two women who kept telling Landon about how they used to wrestle men in their cities. According to their story, they had even wrestled and won against their city lord and all his knights. Of course he believed that women could actually win if they trained hard as well, but for some reason, he felt that these particular women were lying to him. He would rather believe that human beings can chew molten lava than to believe their stories. They also bragged about having enough strength to take down his entire army in a single day. Bravo Hercules, bravo. Landon kept trying to stop himself from rolling his eyes at them. Did they really think that he was foolish enough to believe their tales? Sure he looked like a 15 year old kid, but still. Come on. He also succeeded in convincing them to join the three musketeers in gardening. It was better to let the two groups compete with each other on who was stronger than whom. Actually, he was looking forward to it as well. He might have to buy popcorn from the system and watch through his system monitors. If he was being honest, Grandpa Willow and his friends made for a hilarious reality TV show. He had been watching them whenever he got bored. Truly entertaining. It looked like the palace would be even rowdier than before. There were also 11 senior citizens who couldn't walk well due to either leg injuries or other health problems. Immediately, Landon requested for five open roof loading trucks to come to the coastline region. He needed five because he figured that since he was going to carry the injured people in them, might as well carry all the other seniors too. Once the trucks arrived, the new citizens were shocked. What was this? Why was this carriage so cool? The children were all so excited, as their eyes shot wide open. The Fantastic Seven, started bothering Landon about the trucks. Brat. Dot dot better speak up now. Are we going to have our own carriages in future? If you give me one, I will immediately engage you and my daughter together. Sure, she's 42, a widow and older than you, but what matters is love. And that carriage, Pui. Comma don't listen to him. I have a younger daughter who is 39 years old, way younger than 42. Don't try to cheat us. Dot. Will we really have one? H-M-M-P. Dot. He'll tell you what, I used to ride these types of carriages when I was younger. Dot 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 him not that easy to impress. Landon could really feel a headache coming on. Why would I want your daughters? Do I look like a man who's into women older than my mother? Landon quickly looked at the soldiers who were gently aiding the other senior citizens board the trucks. As they were boarding, Landon told the driver to go slow and steady when on the roads. There were several stones on the roads, so it was better to go at a pace that wouldn't bother those injured seniors. Landon also made sure that each truck had at least five soldiers on them, just in case of any accidents happened along the way. As the trucks started moving again, the seniors on the truck, kept shouting, pointing and commenting, 
as they observed their surroundings. Ah! Come look over there, what is the structure? Look at those beautiful flowers. Do you think that we will see wild animals on our way? As Landon heard their comments, he almost lost his balance. Do you guys think that you're on a safari trip in Africa? What wild animals? Dot. Sigh. Forget it. Chapter 72 Reorganization Once the group containing the Fantastic Seven left, Landon continued on with his duties. He assigned 20 more caretakers to look after the children, and 158 stable workers for the horses. Now, Landon had 5,600 people available for work. He decided to send 300 workers to the food industry, another 300 as caretakers for all the animals. 300 to the alchemy industry, as well as 700 to the construction industry. The remaining 4,000 would work in actual construction. The animals were placed in the stables of the food industry. One should know that before the industries existed, those estates were used for as residents for the barons. Each baron had at least 4,500 knights under their care and these knights in turn had their own horses. So there were a lot of indoor house stables at the back of every estate. Landon decided to have all the animals stay in those indoor stables for now. Since he was expecting these animals, he had previously requested for the department six of the construction company, to build metal bars, for each animal shed. He had also brought in a lot of hay and metal trays for the chickens. For the food industry. Landon gave them the task of creating butter and taking care of all the animals as per his instructions. For the entire month, this was their only task. The alchemy industry on the other hand, needed to focus on soap making for the entire month. The construction industry would also focus on furniture making and, porcelain and marble making. Although Landon wouldn't build a gigantic villa as a house. He still wanted the houses to capture the modern essence of beauty. That's why Landon had decided to make porcelain and marble. He needed porcelain floor tiles, as well as marble ones. These materials could also be used in making breakable plates, teacups, teapots and so on. Both marble and porcelain could also be added to furniture, house pillars and wallpapers to create beautiful designs. Marble in particular could also be used as aggregates for making cement blocks, so Landon thought it was the perfect time to make them. Since the raw materials were available, why not start now? He carefully explained the process, as he handed over an exercise book containing a detailed description on the manufacturing process to Tim Feldspar or Clay mineral ore and sand were used to create porcelain. The raw materials were to be crushed, mixed, and passed through a screen or filter to remove any oversized particle. From there, water would be added and a clay-like product formed. The clay should resemble all those clays in sculpting classes. The workers were to then mold different cups, plates and so on. The floor tiles were to be spread flatly, using only very thin layers of clay. Once molded, Everything would be sent to the fire. And at the end of the day, Landon expected them to also paint and create their own designs on the cups and plates. Who knows, they could make a teacup saying, Father of the Year on it. Landon wanted the workers to use their creative imaginations, so he set up a competition. At the end of the next month, the top three designs would win several prizes from him. He wanted to stimulate their minds and encourage their own personal growth within Baymard. As for those in charge of furniture making, they were to get the already cut planks and wooden boards, from the wood cutting department and start making bed frames, chairs, tables and so on. Dot. Finally, he was left with his 4000 construction workers. His thinking was simple. When building a house, it was essential to hook up the water, electricity and heating before construction. He could do it later, but that would result in more work. If Landon did it after building the houses, he would need to break down the house walls and floors later on, just to install underground pipes and sewage systems. That was just double work. Before constructing houses for the citizens, he had to make sure that these three industries existed, water and sewer treatment plant, thermal power plant electricity and central heating plant. Previously, 
Landon had 6,000 workers that created heavy machines like tractors. Now that Baymard had over 800 different types of heavy machines, Landon decided to withdraw 4,500 out of those 6,000, and add to them with the new recruits, leaving only 1,500 to continue making the machines. Now, he had a total of 8,500 workers ready for construction. The old workers were now considered as veterans. They knew how to use all the tools and machines, as well as perform quick calculations. They also understood the concept of inches, yards and so on. It would be easier for them to teach the new recruits while on the job. That's why Landon had put them together. Each old worker would guide and help at least one new worker since they were almost even in number. Previously, when Landon was teaching the construction workers how to use the machines, they had practiced, and already leveled and prepared all the construction sites for building. They used the excavators to dig up and clear all trees and leaves within the area. The construction site that was filled with trees and bushes, was now bald. They also made trenches for pipelines around the perimeter of the sites, as well as trenches, that would connect all industry pipelines together. The three meter wide gigantic pipes had been wheeled into the construction site, by the use of low boy machines. They were basically like those trailers you see in airports, that carry luggage to the plane. Except, this one was for construction purposes. It had no walls, no roofs just a floor on wheels. Of course it had several chains, to prevent the pipes from falling. They were also good for transporting giant trees from one place to another. Dot. With everything organized, it was finally time to start building actual structures. Chapter 73 Water and Sewage Treatment Plan Landon chose to begin with the water and sewage treatment plant. This plant would have two main functions purifying sea water and treating sewage. Landon was sick and tired of using buckets and pit toilets to do his business. As a modern man, how could it not bother him? It was really annoying to have the young butlers in his castle carry the buckets out every day. Honesty, Landon thought that this was human abuse. But the people didn't seem to mind, as if it was nothing at all. Once, he wanted to take out his own bucket of SH, and one of the young butlers started crying thinking that Landon wanted to fire him. What the f? Dude, I'm trying to help you, alright? He had already made up his mind that next month, he would definitely make pulp and paper. In this era, people washed their asses with either a communal sponge on a stick, reusable rags, corn cobs, old ropes, or their hands. It was so disgusting. Every household would share the same rags or sponges with each other after going to the toilet. As if a royalty, after using the sponge on a stick, the butler would clean it up and the next royal family member could use that same sponge. The same thought process went for reusable rags. In fact there were really few sponges around that Landon was sure that somebody else had used his sponge. He just chose not to think about because the last time he did, he kept puking all through the night. To make matters worse, the system was a scammer when it came to toilet paper. How could three squares of toilet paper cost 20 development points? Was he using gold to wipe his ass? Landon really thought that the system was intentionally making things difficult for him. This time, at this point he couldn't help but blame Drakan for seriously killing him back on earth. If the truck hadn't ran over the red light hurriedly, he would still be alive up till this day. Before dying, he had seen the shocked look on the driver's face so he knew that it was an accident. Since he didn't want to really blame Driver Kun, the truck was at fault. Sigh. Truck Kun. In this era, the people weren't too big on hygiene, so they didn't mind sharing the same toilet rag or sponge with each other. He had been painstakingly waiting for the time when he would succeed in toilet paper making. On that day, he would probably dance Gangnam style in his bedroom. Dot. Dot. For the water and sewage treatment plant, Landon needed several buildings and pipes in place. Since he decided to treat sea water, Landon needed three gigantic pipelines, to be placed underground from the sea in the coastline region, to the plant in the lower region. Two of those pipelines would be used daily, while the other one would be there as backup, 
should in case the other two needed maintenance or fixing. All the water would pass through the pipes and head toward a 300 square foot building, which should have different filtering equipments used for filtering out any sand particles or hard rocks from the water. After filtering, the water would still go through several buildings that would focus on filtration and chemical addition, until the water is entirely clean. All the tanks needed, would be the same size as a regular swimming pool, except for the chemical storage tanks. Landon planned to build these tanks like how one would build an aquarium seal show or a regular swimming pool. There would be safety bars and waist-high iron fences around each pool. That wouldn't allow people to come close or touch the tanks carelessly. For water and sewage treatment, it was industrially better for everything to be eye level. Several chemicals would also be added to the water treatment process. Chlorine for example would be used for disinfecting the water. And lime for raising the water's pH level, hence reducing corrosion in the pipes. As for the sewage treatment, Landon realized that he needed 11 more buildings within the plant. Waste water would be collected from toilets, drainage pipes, homes, schools, industries. In fact from everywhere. So of course they needed their own buildings and treatment tanks. Dot. Landon also realized that he needed more buildings that would host the workers' daily necessities. Landon decided to adopt the standard industry setup for a power plant back on Earth. Hence the industry would have two sectors. Before anyone could pass through the main gate, security would check if they were authorized or not. The first sector would immediately follow after the main gate. This sector would have, six buildings for staff and office personals, one infirmary building and one security building. These six buildings would have, staff and meeting rooms, large locker rooms for both male and females, a large kitchen, a large cafeteria, bathrooms and showers around the buildings and equipment rooms. Some of the buildings would be four stories high, while some would be less. There would also be a wall and a gate dividing the first and the second sectors. Only authorized personnel, workers or engineers will be able to go to the second sector. The second sector would have the fire department building, control tower, chemical laboratory building, engineering office building the production vessels, chemical storage building and another security building at the gate of the second sector. Landon wanted the plant to be professional. He couldn't allow people to just walk in and out as they liked. The security had to be tight. Only those with badges, access cards or passes could move in and out of the plant. Dot. And even those who worked in sector 1, couldn't pass through sector 2 as they liked. That's how it was done on earth. And that's how he was going to sew it here. No room for errors. One had to be like Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible, to get into the plant unauthorized. Heck, what if someone wanted to steal important documents in the offices, or blow up the plant from within? What if an enemy wanted to steal his technology, or poison the workers? Security was a must. He also needed a car park that would be the same size as that for Walmart or any large shopping center. The car park should also have reserved spaces for the company buses, assigned for picking and dropping workers to home or anywhere within the various bus routes. Dot. He wore his safety gear and headed out to the construction site. Chapter 74 Construction Begins It was 9A.M. Time to work. Since the workers came to work already wearing their new safety gears, he had them offload the trucks that contained sand, cement blocks cement bags, aggregates, steel rods, ladders and all other equipments and materials needed for construction. Before Landon could explain the first step to them, the old workers had already taken out their jotters, as well as their pens. Landon smiled while nodding agreeably. They learned so fast. Within this time, the old recruits had learned to write down important information in their jotters. Since Landon wasn't there to do everything for them anymore, they started writing down important information, so that they didn't have to go through several experiments again. The new recruits were confused about what those stick things pens were. And did they just see their colleagues take out tiny manuals? The new recruits started wondering if Baymard was actually super rich for normal workers to afford manuals. Mind you, 
people didn't have exercise books in this era since paper was seen as a national treasure. Paper was only used to make manuals, textbooks or important historical records or empire rules. Dot. But to allow someone to waste paper just like that, was really something else. How could ordinary workers afford paper, talk less of manuals? Landon amplified his voice using the system and also demonstrated several times on how the foundation of buildings were to be done. He spent one hour, repeatedly showing them what to do, and when they finally got it, he broke them up into groups and assigned them to each building and each large tank on the site. Since those tanks were the size of regular swimming pools, their base needed to be made out of concrete as well. The workers first made wooden boards to the sides of the trenches, and added crushed stones gravel into the trenches. The wooden boards acted as walls, surrounding the gravel and forming what construction workers call the foot. The gravel was also spread around the entire ground floor of the building with the help of wheelbarrows. As for the base, they placed long steel bars which were also held together by steel rods into the gravel. Once the steel rods were placed, the trenches were completely filling with concrete, as well as the building ground floor of the building. Finally. They used the screeds to smoothen the cement on the building floor, making it look even. With 8,500 workers doing this, after two and a half hours, they had completely laid down the foundation for the entire industry. With this many people, they should have been done in one hour. But since it was their first time, it was expected for them to be slow. Now they had to wait for two days for the cement to cure and harden, before removing those wooden walls and beams around the cement. TSK. Time was money. There was no way that he would let the workers do nothing within these two days. Might as well start constructing the other industries. Landon needed them to go to the other construction sites, to also place the foundation for their buildings and tanks. Just as he was about to leave, he spotted two loading trucks heading their way. It was probably 12.30. Lunch time. The men removed their gloves and aided in offloading the cooking pots from the trucks. There were 20 pots and 20 cooks waiting to serve the dishes to them. There were also 20 other cooks, who were tasked in handing out plastic plates and cups to the men. The cooks looked very professional. They had white elastic hair wraps on their heads, transparent gloves on their hands and wore clean white plastic aprons. They were also several drums filled with water that were offloaded as well. The drums had four outlet taps at their bottoms, so that the men could easily get themselves water if they were thirsty. Break time was one hour long, so the men had to manage their time wisely. It was better to eat fast, so as to relieve yourself if one needed to. The men formed twenty lines, as they hurriedly took their food as sat on the grass. Landon didn't want them to eat on the construction site. So the trucks gathered just by the side of the construction site markings. Of course as king, Landon didn't need to wait online as his food was automatically brought over to him. The privileges of power. He he he. Dot. Dot. 1.30 p.m. Lunch time was over. The men to loaded all the bags of cement, and other materials and equipment into different trucks. Once they were done, they headed out to the second construction site. By 2.15 p.m., they arrived, and only used 1 hour 15 minutes to completely lay the foundation for all buildings and tanks on the site. They packed up again and were on their way to the final construction site. By 5.10 p.m., they were done with layering the foundation for all buildings and tanks on site. All the workers were working in the day shift and had spent eight hours on the job, so by 5.30 p.m., they were required to call it quits for the day. With only 20 more minutes left before closing time, Landon had the men gather up all the tools and drive back to the construction company. Tomorrow, he would focus on installing the iron net-like fences around the sites, since they had to wait for two days before the cement completely hardened. For the fences, Landon wanted them to be like regular prison fences that had barbed wires at the top. In future, the barbed wires would definitely be able to electrocute those who try to sneak in. Landon wasn't taking any chances with anybody. In future, without your badge, 
access card or pass, don't even dream of seeing the inside of the industry. If someone lost their access cards or pass, someone would immediately come over and verify if they worked there or not. All spies would be electrocuted, period. Chapter 75 Preparations to set a royal palace, the capital of Arcadina. Dot. My king, right now the first prince and seven other city lords are the only ones to arrive the capital to take their assignments. The second and third princes should get back here in a week or two. And by the second week of August, all the other city lords from far away should arrive as well. Once everyone arrives, they will all move out together towards the different cities under attack. Minister Tawny said, Good. Has City Lord Shannon arrived yet? King Ban asked. My esteemed king, he should arrive in August. Ha ha ha. When he arrives, make sure that he sees me before going out on the mission. I need to give him a personal assignment on my behalf. Yes my king. King Ban looked at his trusted knight and signaled for him to come forward. Summon Princess Janet and Captain Anthony here. Dot. Elis Old Courtyard, the capital of Arcadina. Dot. My lord, I think those old ministers are trying to use this war to the advantage of your brothers. My lord, should we get secret guards to protect you? Zarius asked. Right now, Eli had made his way into the capital so as to receive his assignments. Eli stood in his old courtyard and smiled. Why worry about those tiny insects so such? But my lord, I think that they will try to assassinate you again if you don't go prepared Zarius replied. Who says that we wouldn't be prepared? Dot. Do I need to use my brain to deal with these buffoons? Dot. The biggest setback is that we can't besiege Baymard. Zarius' eyes lit up. Because of this border war, Eli might not be able to get that Baymard under his control until next year. The official date to head out to the border is on the 15th of August. It will take two months to go down south to the border. And once he completed his mission, his father would probably request that he stay there for at least four months, so as to make sure that those pesky Deiferous Knights don't bring more reinforcements to take back the land. After four months he would have to take another two months to head back to the capital, so as to receive his rewards and have a parade as the Crown Prince of Arcadine. After the whole ordeal, he would need another three weeks to go back to his territory, before attempting to attack Baymard again. And one should not forget that Baymard is four months away from his territory. That's almost eleven months by horse travel, before he could successfully attack Baymard. At most, he could only start his operations by July next year. Apart from Baymard, that damn ghostly prince keeps giving me sleepless nights. The fact that I don't really know his next moves really irks me. Eli exclaimed while squeezing the life out of the orange in his hand. My lord, do you think that while we are away, he would finally make his move? Zarius asked inquisitively. Just before he was about to answer, someone knocked on his door. After two minutes, a thick, curvy beautiful woman walked in and sat on a chair beside Eli. This woman was his mother, little Eli. Once you head out, make sure nothing fails. The sooner you get back, the earlier we can officially start with our plans, said Queen Sarah. Mom, everything is ready. Don't worry. Although this trip was a little unexpected, it won't stop our plans. Good. The sooner we kill that bastard, the sooner I will be at peace, Queen Sarah said with an evil glint in her eyes. At this point, she too hated King Barn. Hell has no fury like a woman's scorn. When she was still young, she was officially engaged to him and was deeply infatuated with him. He said that he would love her till they grew old together. Granted, she would always kill and torture those women that claimed to love him too. But did that really make her a bad person? She loved him like crazy and would sometimes ask her father, who was a minister within the court, to find out his schedule so she could accidentally bump into him her and there. If he ever showed interest to any girl other than her, for sure that girl wouldn't last a week. And if the girl came from a wealthy family, she would hire gangs to rape the girl and destroy her public image. Didn't she do it all for love? Wasn't that what love was? Not even three months after his marital vow of evaluating love for her, 
He cheated on her and married another woman. He said that she seduced him and was the one who did all the work in the bedroom. Of course she believed him. How could her love be interested in that slut? But a few months before she was to go into labor, that slut had the nerve become pregnant as well. And two days before her labor date, another slut had married into the royal family. And another year after that, a cheap common maid had taken advantage of her drunk husband and gotten pregnant with a bastard child. Why were all these women coming for her man? But she quickly realized that the first two harlots were much wiser than the last one. So she decided to first eliminate the last slut. But who would have thought that Chief Commander Lucius would always protect the BCH? All these damn BS made her sick. To make matters worse. It had been six whole years since he last touched her. She tried everything, from the latest plum makeup, to hiring street harlots to teach her the game of seduction, to acting like a pampered princess. What else was she to do? And to top it all off, she has a woman that needed and craved for satisfaction as well. She wasn't asking for too much. Even once a year was a good deal to her at this point. Her husband could have many women, but she couldn't. If she ever found pleasure from any other man, she was sure that she would be locked up in a prison-like courtyard for all eternity. Over the years, the bastard had gotten ordinary street harlots to please him in bed, yet he refused to even look at her. Sometimes, she could hear their screams of pleasures all the way from her courtyard. It felt like torture. Nine whole years of loneliness. She just wanted to be touched. She had been dying inside for ages now. Every time she tried to talk to him about it, he would make up an excuse and run away from her. There were times that he would ask her if she was a dog. Because according to him, only dogs went in heat. Out of those nine lonely years, she had spent three years begging for his attention daily. But on the fourth year, her love for him had completely died. She had overheard him talk to a young maid promising her love and riches if she could sleep with him. He even said that he couldn't stand her because she was fat. Her fat. Dot. Ha ha ha. It was on that day that she finally realized how stupid she had been. To think that this was the man that she killed countless women for. Since then, all her love for him instantly turned to hate. And as years went by, her murderous side began to take over her mind. He had to die. Chapter 76 The Annoying White Lotus Royal Palace, Capital of Arcadine. Dot. Jeanette Barn walked around the royal garden with her maids, while waiting for her father to summon her. She had been waiting for the past one hour now, and her father was still in a meeting with the ministers. As she walked further into the garden, she immediately spotted her dear little sister. Carrie Barn was walking towards a large fish pond, a few feet away from her. There were also several knights, and even some barons in the gardens. People usually stayed in the royal garden when they were waiting for their turn to see King Barn. Little sister, you're here too? Dot. Let's walk along together okay? Speak of the devil. Carrie Barn turned around and saw Jeanette running towards her. Her face immediately scrunched up, and she looked like someone who just ate dog poop. Jeanette sneered, as she hurriedly made her way towards Carrie. This little sister of hers already had a bad reputation in the capital, thanks to her. Her white lotus act had always made everyone side with her while they in turn despised Carrie. What do you want? Carrie asked with a frown on her face. Jeanette stopped in her tracks and immediately started acting as if she was sobbing, while choking on her fake tears. She really looked pitiful. What man wouldn't feel touched while seeing a gentle angel crying? All the knights around the area, immediately felt pain seeing her like this. Little sister, how? How can you talk to me like that? Dot. If I did something to anger you please forgive me. I dot 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 I dot 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 I just want wanted to spend more time with you little sis. The scene was really heartbreaking. The moronic knights who had seen this, immediately looked at Carrie with disapproving gazes, while rushing over to Jeanette's side. Princess Carrie, must you be so heartless? Yeah, why must you make her cry? Underscore. The knights spoke out as they saw their goddess, Princess Jeanette in tears. They even forgot that they were reprimanding another princess who could order for their deaths. Come on little sister, you're almost making it too easy for me now. 
He who eh, Jeanette thought, as the men comforted her, Jeanette continued to sob even more loudly. Please. Please everyone. Don't misunderstand my little sister. She was just having a bad day, that's why she talked to me in that manner. She. She's really a good person and not arrogant and rude like what you all think. All the men looked at Princess Jeanette as if she were some divine being. Dot 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 dot. They all thought that the princess had a heart of gold. To them Princess Jeanette was pure, saintly, kind and innocent. She looked like someone whom anyone could easily bully. Little sister please. Don't punish or kill the knights for talking back at you. If, if you want to hurt someone, hurt me instead. I will willingly offer up my life for any of them, Jeanette said, as she fell to her knees. The knights felt touched, and started defending the princess even more. Carrie was almost at her boiling point. When did she say that she would kill them? What bullsh- dot dot Jeanette? Offer her life for them. Dot. What a joke. She knew that if she made a move against these knights, the entire empire would go in an uproar, she would become the most vicious woman of all time. It's not like she cared or anything, but before her and Delis plans went through, she couldn't afford to affect his position as the crown prince. For now, most of the citizens wanted Eli to step down from his position as the crown prince, but they were scared to take action. If a large-scale revolt really happened, the citizens would carry fire torches and march up to the palace demanding for realis removal. The capital alone had 37 million people living in it. Sure, there were knights, gangs and assassins mixed in the group, but the peasants were still quite large in number. No matter what, all the nobles and knights under her and Eli, couldn't possibly protect themselves if a large-scale revolt actually happened. Imagine millions of people standing outside the palace walls with torches and other weapons. Even if their father assisted, it still wouldn't count as much. Fortunately for Carrie and Eli, the citizens had not realized the power that they held. What would happen if they decided to team up against them? No one would stand a chance then. For now, they only did small protests in the market areas. But who could really predict the future? These people still feared the nobles, especially King Barn. Their king had killed people when he was displeased, as well as when anyone wanted to go against him. Their king ruled like a tyrant. He was a dictator. The reason why they even had the courage to protest in the marketplaces was because, Prince Connor and James promised that they would protect them from King Barn's wrath. King Barn could easily send out his men to make things difficult for them or murder their families. Most of them were just ordinary peasants who had never fought a day in their lives. But since Connor and James were their king's sons, the gullible citizens easily believed them. They wholeheartedly entrusted their safeties to them, and started protesting against Elis position. Because of Connor and James' heroic acts, the people were even more convinced with their choice and actions. Previously they liked Eli as he always seemed sweet and kind. And he also looked somewhat innocent. But lately, they had been hearing all sorts of rumors about him. It was said that he enjoyed killing and raping women during his free time. Apparently, Eli had murdered multiple women after he was done sleeping with them. It was also said that he had always been jealous of his brothers, and had tried to assassinate them several times. Obviously, these rumors were spread by Connor and James but the people were like sheep. They just followed a shepherd. Once something had circulated for a while, it would become a fact in their hearts. They truly believed these rumors because Eli had never bothered to prove his innocence. So it must definitely be true. And to top it all off, Carrie as the most vicious woman in the empire, was Eli's sister. The people now believed that the apple didn't fall far from the tree. How could such a cruel man be their king? Carrie looked at her white lotus sister coldly. What a bch. And just before she was about to defend herself, a guard came over informing Jeanette that their father wanted to see her. Jeanette hurriedly left, giving Carrie no time to make an explanation. As Carrie watched her white lotus sister leave, she knew that what had happened here would definitely spread throughout the entire capital. I'll get you back for this slut. Dot. Just you wait. Dot. Jeanette walked into the large throne room and immediately spotted Captain Anthony Martinez, standing in front of her father. As she looked at him, 
Her heart couldn't help but shiver. Eight months ago, she had come across Anthonus' stunning sword skills in the annual nightly tournament. He was so handsome, strong and had a heroic charm about him. What a dangerous man. Just looking at him, she was sure that he had successfully impregnated her eyes. Wasn't it a crime for someone to look that good? Antony was the son of Minister Glam Martinez, so she knew that marrying him wouldn't be a problem. Since he was a noble, hence she schemed her way into his life and into his heart. Four months ago, they had officially started dating. And today, her father had called them over to announce that they would be officially engaged and their wedding would take place before the end of the year. Although she hadn't known him for a long time, Jeanette was sure that he was the one. That's why she had begged and pleaded with her father to rush along the marriage. She was 19 years old, and in this era, people married about this age. They would get engaged at 10 or 11 and get married at 17 or maximum 23. Above 23, you were considered as a problematic woman who no one wanted. Men would be very wary of you, and might use you as a side chick. Most women above 23 became desperate and ended up marrying as second wives to elderly rich men. For some reason, her mother had been against all the suitors that previously wanted to be engaged with her. Her mother had said that she would only accept the best of the best for Jeanette. That's why Anthony was the only one that got an approval. He was a noble, young, had outstanding achievements in the army and was sorted after by almost all girls in the capital. After their father had dismissed both of them, she decided to see him off, as they walked hand in hand with each other. Are you happy? Chapter 77 Construction Continues Note from Authorson. He he he. Thank you all for you love and corrections you have all made so far. Thanks to you all, my English had really been picking up. There are so many people who commented. And most of it is love. From now on, Every chapter will have a mini shout out to the first commenter and the best correction commenter. Dot thanks guys. Especially Tony Robeski for his comment. I have edited the population of the empire to be 250,000 people. Thanks. Also a big shout out to Potato Keeper for being the first person to comment and like the chapter. Now, let's get the show on the road. Dot. Dot. Two days had already passed and the concrete had successfully hardened. Within these two days, the men had been installing those ironit prison fences around the site. So far, they had only succeeded in completely fencing the back, and the sides of the water and sewage treatment plant. Landon kept the front open, so that the trucks could move in and out of the site freely. 9A.M. Landon had the men remove all the wooden boards, molds and rails that were previously placed around each would-be building on the construction site. Today, they had to focus on constructing the first floors of every building on the construction site. Landon again, demonstrated what they were supposed to do. And once they had grasped the concept, he decided to have them start on their own. He also tasked 500 workers with mixing the cement to form concrete and wheeling them over towards each building on the site. The rest of the 8,000 workers crowded around all the building's sites, ready for work. The concrete had hardened and had successfully glued the steel rods firmly to the building floors. And although these steel rods already indicated all corners and rooms on the first floor, it was still important to make sure that the walls were straight and not bent. That's why Landon had the men tie ropes between each rod, so as to accurately form straight lines within the buildings. Landon listened to the workers, as they went about trying the outline the buildings. The rope is slanted, I think we should connect these two rods. I don't think that we need to tie the rope between these two rods, it should be between the other two inches. Ah! Dot 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 you're right. Dot 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 the floor plan given by his highness shows that this space between the rods is a door. We need to tie the ropes only between the rods that would be turned into walls. What about the parts where his highness wrote hallway? I remember that his highness said that the hallway is also like a passageway or corridor. That's true, I remember that I wrote it down on my notes. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah. Thanks. To think that I actually forgot about it. I need to go home and revise more on it. Thank you for explaining these things to me, I just got here four days ago. 
so I have no idea what most of this stuff means. But now, I believe that I have a little more understanding towards this. Don't worry, once you keep working and attending your school lectures, you too will get it. It's actually not that hard. Underscore. The men continued to chat and learn from each other, as the work progressed on. When they were done, it was finally time to start creating the interior and exterior walls. The men used those ropes as their rulers, and started stacking up the cement blocks. The men laid out the concrete on the floors along the ropes, and placed the cement blocks on the concrete. Just like that, they kept stacking up the blocks on one another, with the use of concrete. Landon thought that the men looked extremely funny. Imagine a long line of people waiting to have access into a club. That's how they looked as they worked around and inside each building. Dot. They were packed like tiny sardines, as they went about their work. Each person just had one foot of working space in front of them. Most plants back on earth, for example power plants provided energy for an entire province or at least three or four cities at once. Hence their sizes were bigger. For example, the Palo Verde plant in Arizona USA, provided energy to Los Angeles, San Diego, Tuscon and many more Californian metropolitan areas. The same could be said for 80% of industrial plants back on Earth. For Landon's case, he was just providing for Baymard alone. That's why Baymard's industrial plants didn't need to be so massive. Hence, although he made 500 men mix the concrete, he still felt like 8,000 workers were really a lot for a normal size plant. Dot. Once the men had stacked up to one meter high, the men used the iron bridge ladders to continue on. The first floor was going to be a high ceiling floor. So Landon needed it to reach at least 3 meters tall. The iron bridge ladders could hold up to 3 people at once, and resembled those ladders that window cleaners used back on earth. Landon then divided the men into groups of 6. 3 people would stand on the ladders, while the other 3 would be on the ground. 2 out of the 3 men on the ground, would aid in giving those on the ladders cement blocks and buckets filled with concrete, while the third person, would keep an eye on the ladder footing so as to ensure the safety of those on top. Again, two out of three workers on the ladders would continue stacking the walls, while the other one be in charge of collecting the buckets of cement and blocks from those on the ground. The work went steady, and by closing time, the first floor of 75% of the buildings, had been successfully done. Now, they had to wait for two days again for the concrete to completely harden before they could successfully form the second floors. Of course for the next two days, once the men completed the first floor of the buildings left, Landon had them start constructing the first floor walls for the other two sites. Honestly, Landon was getting ticked off with this damn cement hardening stuff. Like why couldn't it just dry down after several hours? Why wait for days? Dot. He needed this industries built fast. Chop, chop. Time was money. But since he was doing all the plant sites at once, his irritation about the matter lessened. And just like that, Landon spent most of his days with the construction team. Dot. Empire of Arcadina, secret hideout. Dot. William wore his boots, tied his hair, and placed his sword in his sheath. Mona rushed up to him and gently held his checks with her palms, as she fought back the urge to cry. Her son was a man now, so it was really inappropriate for her to always cry or hold him back. He had responsibilities, and a duty to fulfill. Little William, make sure to stay safe, and if you are ever trapped or discovered, make a run for it and don't try to be heroic. Heroes usually die faster. Adam walked up behind Mona, and placed his right hand on William's shoulder. It's been almost two months now, and that slither and bastard should be making his way over to Sangria City, and in another three weeks, he should be arriving. You need to make sure that you get to Sangria before he does. Once you successfully get through the city undetected, Captain Remaluk would be waiting for you at the Quincy Inn. And like your mother said, if anything goes wrong, Run. Your mother and I can live our lives without having to fulfill our desire for revenge. But without you, there would be no point living for us to live on. Be safe, Dad. Mom, aren't I the ghostly prince? Since when did I ever lose to anyone?
Dot. Rest assured, I will return back to you all safe, and besides, I'm no hero. Chapter 78 Military Routines Sorry guys, the reasso for the late posts is because of exams. Once this week passes, we we have early posts again. Anyway, I want to give a big shout out to Merifu who was the first to comment yesterday, and dot 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 he who eh? Ding. 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 Dot. We have a tie. Josh can woof from for their comments. Thanks for all the love guys. Hope you enjoy. Now as always, let's get the show on the road. The soldiers were sleeping and snoring peacefully within their sleeping units. Every military dormitory had four long vertical stacks of straw, two on the left side of the room and two on the right side of the room. There were also several iron lockers that were placed all around the each wall in the room. The lockers resembled the gym lockers back on earth dot 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 but each locker was two meters tall and one meter wide. All of the lockers had locks on them, and also had number tags placed on them. The center of the rooms were kept straw free creating a large corridor space for morning roll call. The stacks of straw on the each side were separated by a two meter gap, leaving the center space to four meters wide. Some rooms had less stacks, while others had more. It basically depended on the dimensions of the rooms. In this era, most peasants slept on straws, grass, leaves, and other plants that were deemed comfortable. Previously, Landon had wanted to place the straws in fabrics to make mattresses, but the men complained that loose heaps were more comfortable to sleep on, compared to compact ones. When straws were forced and pressed into clothes, they ended up poking people when they slept. Some of the straws might even poke out of the fabric, giving the straw mattresses a spike-like feeling to them. Hence Landon placed long vertical stacks of straw in every room. The straw was changed every three weeks by all the soldiers in each room, as per the room roster. In future, there would be bunk beds for them. But for now, the straw was their best alternative. After all, that was what they were used to anyway. And as for the blankets, each soldier had a two-meter piece of cloth, to cover themselves up at night. For now, there were no pillows, since the men preferred so sleep without stone pillows. And Landon didn't blame them, who would want to sleep on rocks or pebbles. In this era, if peasants were really keen on pillows, they would place several pebbles and dry seaweeds into a piece of fabric and call it a pillow. More like a torturing device. Would that give you serious neck injuries? Anyway, each room had a minimum of 30 soldiers residing in them. Since no one was in the rank of drill sergeant, Landon had the warrant officers look after the new recruits. Drill sergeants were those ranked in the enlisted ranks between sergeants and master sergeants. Everyone in the military fort was either overqualified warrant soldiers and above or underqualified new recruits. That's why the warrant soldiers were the best options for now. Each room had a warrant officer that would be in charge of waking up the new recruits and supervising their morning training. It was 6 a.m. in Kirsten's room. There were 40 soldiers sound asleep as they waited for a new day to begin. Each vertical stack had 10 soldiers on them. Fiep, the whistleblower. Get up, get up, get up, get up. You all have five minutes to be fully dressed and assembled at the center of the rooms. Warrant officer Justin yelled out. Kirsten immediately jumped up and rushed towards his locker. Kirsten had just arrived this July and was still not used to all the new routines that were done in Baymard. He had always wanted to be a knight growing up. And when he was seven, he started training as a page in his hometown. By the age of thirteen, his town was attacked by a fierce blood gang and his grandparents died while protecting him and his sister. His grandparents and all the other adults, tried to stall the gang while him, his sister and all the other children and some adults fled for their lives. His mother died during childbirth, and his father died while he was out hunting in the forest. All he had were his sister and his grandparents. But when he fled with his six-year-old sister at the time, he knew that he would never see his grandparents again. He had lived the next three years of his life begging doing petty thievery to feed his little sister and working as a loader in a shipping dock in Fringer City, within the Empire of Tariq. It was there that fate finally decided to smile on him. While he was loading items onto a ship, he had overheard a man, 
presumably the owner of the ship, ask about where he could get refugees and buy slaves within the city. Several days later, the man brought a lot of people by the dock and started reassuring them that where they were going would be a happy place with equal pay and good times. Although he was intrigued, he still felt that it was a scam. Ever since he had fled with his sister, people had bullied him and treated him like a piece of horse sh. He would get beaten up by the sailors on board most of the ships while he was loading items, or even have dirty moped water thrown on his face when his colleagues were having a bad day. He had preserved through all the torture because of his sister. She was all he had, and he would at least try to make her life as comfortable as possible. But now, he had heard that there was such a place that would treat him with respect, and apparently even catered to the poor. Bulsh, wasn't this just a typical slavery scam? But then again, something in his heart kept saying what if, what if, what the man said was true. Dot what if he could really become a knight and earn enough money for his sister and him? Dot and even if it was a scam, was he not already treated like shit where he was? Although it was risky, he finally gathered enough courage and begged the man to add him and his little sister to the list. And the rest was history. Once he arrived he immediately noticed that this city in particular, had soldiers and not knights. As he was already sixteen, he immediately volunteered for the army since that had always been a lifelong dream of his. Within these two weeks, he had also realized that everything that His Highness Landon promised them, was true. He made new friends, attended lectures, had enough food to eat and passed his days in peace. His sister was also happy with her life, and lived in the estate with all the other slaves and refugees. Since he was in the army and couldn't live in the refugee slave estate, his nine-year-old sister had to live with one other child and one caretaker in single large room. So she was fine and well taken care of daily. Plus, during his free time, he would make stops to her estate to check up on her regularly. He loved his time here in Baymard, especially the army experience. TSK. To think that he actually hesitated on giving up this golden opportunity. He also made up his mind that he would never betray Baymard because they had given back his dignity as a man back, taken care of his only sister, and fulfilled his dream to be a knight. Or should he say soldier? Plus he had already made an oath and signed documents of confidentiality and loyalty towards Baymard. Time's up. Chapter 79 Military Routines 2 Everybody lined up in straight vertical lines at the center of the room. Some of the men had only one leg of boots on, while others didn't even have their shirts on just their pants. Over the past two weeks, the new recruits had learned that if anyone was even a second late to line up, the entire group would face punishment. For example if someone from the left corner of the room lined up late, all those who slept in that corner would have to do push-ups and frog jumps as punishment. Landon did this to encourage teamwork. If you get up and see the person next to you sleeping, wake their ass up. No one could win a fight or a battle alone. After all, the slogan of the fort is all for one, one for all. What did I tell you all about looking forward? Dot. Keep your heads straight. Carsten's heart started beating faster. He knew that he had effed up today. Warrant Officer Justin came so close to him, that if someone accidentally pushed him forward, they would definitely kiss each other. But he couldn't be fooled. He had been here long enough to know that when their warrant officers got close to anyone like this, it was nothing good to write about. S.H. He thought, Private. Where's your shirt? Dot. Do you think that you look sexy? Dot. Do you want us to admire you? Is that it? Exclamation mark. No sir. Then why is your shirt not on your body? Kirsten felt like crying. Why did he lock his lock last night? Dot. He usually kept it open, so as not to slow down his pace in the mornings. Luckily, Warrant Officer Justin quickly left him and picked on the guy who had only his left boot on. Two minutes of Warrant Officer Justin's yells passed, and it was now 6.10 a.m. Everone, it's time to head on out. By 6.20, you should all be in the fields. Those who are rent fully dressed, should get dressed, and meet us on the field. From there you will receive your punishments. Now, everybody else, move out. 
Dot. Kirsten's heart sank even further. Damn his forgetfulness. He had been doing good since he got here. And now, this one sleep up caused him punishment. Dot dot he truly felt like crying, but he also knew that there was nothing he could do about it. It was indeed his sleep up, and he had to take full responsibility for his actions. As everyone else left. Kirsten wore his shirt and dashed out like lightning towards the field. He quickly arrived a few seconds before go time, and stood in line. Safe, he thought. All the recruits trained together, hence all their warrant officers in charge of them were on the field too. Everybody drop down and give me twenty. Kirsten immediately dropped down and started doing his push-ups. As he continued on, Another warrant officer came over and inspected his form. Arms apart private, you will not get results by doing it that way. He immediately adjusted his stance and persisted on. Dot. Listen up. Dot. It's time to begin the jog. Dot 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 you will all follow the person in front of you. Dot. You will all keep up and not slack off. Dot 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 now everyone, begin the jog. Kirsten followed the recruit in front of him and jogged around the field six times. As they jogged, they also sang number songs, that surprisingly keep them motivated. Plus it was kinda like they were doing math at the same time. Although they didn't know intense math, they had all dealt with money before so it wasn't that hard to count. Three silver coins plus ten silver coins. Gave thirteen silver coins. Duh. 1, 2, 3. 10. 1, 2, 3. 11. 1, 2, 3. 12. That kept them moving forward, and they finally ended up jogging back to their original positions. From there they did pull-ups, sit-ups, leg lounges, high kicks, squats, frog walks and finally frog jumps. By 7.30a.m, they were done. Of course those who previously didn't completely dress up, or came late to the general assembly on the fields or in their dormitories, stayed back to receive their punishments. Kirsten ran another two runs rounds around the field, and did ten more push-ups. No slacking off private. Keep up. He was worn out as hell. The pain he felt throughout his body was really exhausting. He swore to never do the same mistake he did again. Never. By 7.50a.m, he was done and quickly dashed away to get his bath. Bath time was from 748 20a.m, so he was already 10 minutes late. He quickly freshened up and still came 5 minutes late for breakfast. Breakfast was also from 8 to 309 to 10a.m, while classes started at 9.30am. He first attended his military lectures on strategies, cannon operations and safety measures, as well as a device called a gun. And after his 12.30 lunch. He made his way at 120p.m to the Baymard Public School. Today he just had Math 1 and Pina 1 in his schedule, while tomorrow he had only Math 2. At 3.50, he was back to the military fort, and had 1 hour and 10 minutes to rest before going for his gun firing session. In May, Landon had asked Tim to create the semi-automatic pistols for the military. And in June, only the Warren officers, the captains, Major generals and of course Lucius practiced with them. Now that the older soldiers understood how to use them, this July, Landon had the officers train and teach these new recruits how to fire the weapons. Of course Landon labeled the guns as well. This first gun was called a Baymard M.A1. In Kirsten's schedule, he had gun firing practice on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, as well as his obstacle courses. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, he also had classes, sword fighting sessions and close combat sessions. On Saturdays, he only had rock climbing lessons in the lower region. While on Sundays, he had nothing at all, and was basically free as a bird. Of course every day, he would have morning training routines with the warrant officers, just as he did today. He rested, chatted with his friends and when it was 5 pm, he got to the field and held his gun like he had been doing for the past few days. So far, no one was allowed to keep the guns. After training, all the guns were counted, collected, and stored back in the fort. Aim for the eyes. Go. Kirsten looked at the large pieces of paper 50 feet away and fired his shots. 
the paper had an outline of a man drawn on it. There were also several marked lines within the image. Their task was to aim for the inner outline on the man drawn on the paper. Pow, pow, pow. When all the recruits had finished shooting, they unarmed themselves by placing the guns on the ground. Only then, did the warrant officers on duty reach forward towards their shot papers? Kirsten looked at his large sheet of paper and was disappointed in himself. Although he got the man's nipples, he was still far away from the man's head. They did several other shots and by 620p.m, they were done. Wah! Dot. You're so lucky. Dot, 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 dot. At least you got the nipples. I got the man's belly. Damn. I got his right arm. Would that really do any damage? Sigh. I got his junk. I think the man must be in serious pain. Ha 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 ha. They all laughed out as they made their way to their 630 class. Next up obstacle courses. Kirsten and his friends ran and jumped on thin logs of wood, that were surrounded by mud. The logs were inclined upwards and attached to an even larger logs of wood. Kirsten jumped on the log and nearly slipped. Crap. He steadied himself and continued forward on the inclined logs and finally arrived on several larger logs of wood suspended two meters in the air by iron bars. As he was about to move, the person in front of him slipped and fell into the mud. Plop. A warrant officer quickly told the recruit who fell to go back at the end of the line and start all over again. Kirsten focused, passed through several log bridges and arrived back at ground level. He quickly crawled through several large pipes and made his way to another set of inclined logs suspended three meters high, which led to a tall wooden post. Once at the top, he quickly used the ropes on the sides to slide down. Once on ground level. He quickly ran towards another three meter tall iron bar wall, which looked like the doors of a giant medieval prison cell. He put his legs and hands in the holes on the wall and climbed over the wall making his way over the fall wall. As he progressed, he became more fatigued and stressed. He crawled in sand, under several wooden logs jumped through tires and almost fell into mud several times. He was now at the final stage of the obstacle course. He crawled on ropes trying to get from one wooden post to another. And when he reached the end, he let go of the rope, and lost his footing. Plop. Get to the back of the line and start over again. Kirsten wanted to cry. Why did I suddenly lose my footing? Dot. I'm now covered in mud. Dot. My hands and shoes are all slippery. There's no way that I wouldn't fall back again. He really cursed his luck. By 720p.m, the session was over and he quickly headed with his friends to take his bath. He he he, I saw your fall man. Truly tragic. Don't mock me all right. By 8.30 everyone had dinner. And by 9.30p.m, he went around the fort with his friends while talking about their day. And by 11 p.m., it was lights out. Time to sleep. He was really exhausted, but at the same time happy. He only hoped that tomorrow would be just as exciting as today was. This was his experience. Chapter 80 Weekly Industry Meeting The shoutouts are below guys. Dot. It had been two weeks now, and Landon had been aiding the construction workers at the sites. Today. Landon left the workers early, because he had a meeting to attend. At 3 p.m., Landon headed over to the alchemy industry, to have his weekly meetings with all the supervisors and overseers. Every week, Landon would use any room in any of the industries, for the meetings. He would rotate between all industries, so as to be fair. Last week, the meeting took place at the food industry. The week before that, it was held at the construction industry. And now, it was at the alchemy industry. All the overseers and supervisors were supposed to bring in their weekly reports, indicating their progress compared to the prior week, and a pie chart which showed their results, as well as how many products were currently in stock. They were also supposed to present all the problems and difficulties the workers faced, within each industry. So far, Baymard had several sections within each industry, Food Industry, Department F1 Actual Farming, TBF2 Storage and Distribution, TBF3 Seasoning and Spice Making, TBF4 Cooking Oil, TBF5 Vinegar, TBF6 Butter, TBF7 Taking Care of Goats, Chickens, etc. 
alchemy chemistry industry, to pay one gunpowder, to pay two paint, to pay three chalk making, to pay four chemical products like chlorine, etc., to pay five storage and distribution of goods, to pay six oil production, to pay seven ink making, to pay eight soap making. Dot. Construction industry. C1 mining, C2 glass making, C3 warfare weapons. Dot dot guns, cannons, C4 storage and distribution of goods, C5 everything rubber, C6 in charge of building and fixing all construction equipment, creating electrical gadgets and heavy industrial machines, as well as other building fixtures, C7 cement making, C8 wood cutting, C9 everything plastic. C10 pipe making, C11 paper making, C12 everything porcelain and marble, C13 furniture making like bed frames, C14 construction workers. Dot. The room was set up like a lecture hall, with all the supervisors and overseers facing a podium at the front. Everyone quieted down, and the meeting began. Chief Wiggins, since we are at your industry this time, we will start with you. The floor is yours. Chief Wiggins and the 16 supervisors within his industry came forward with samples of all the products created within the week. Dot 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 excluding chemicals, guns and gunpowder of course. For today, everything else basically looks and has the same texture and results as last week's products. All except the soap. Landon and everyone else nodded as they listened to Chief Wiggins last week. The soap was still effective dot dot but it really didn't lather up as much as Landon expected. Apparently, they didn't add enough sodium lauryl sulfate into their products. But this week, it looked like they had successfully done the corrections and came prepared. As Wiggins spoke, the supervisors placed several bowls of water on three large tables. I would like everyone to come up and wash their hands in these separate bowls of water using the soaps, those seated rushed to the tables, and started washing their hands. There were different colored bars of soap, placed by the side of each basin. Wow, this is what His Highness meant by lathering up. Dot. I have to agree, it makes me feel like my hands are really dirt free. Each bar even has a name and number carved on it. Ah, comma it smells like lavender. My wife would surely like this one. Mine smells very manly. Can it be used for doing laundry and bathing? Of course. Dot. That's what Chief Wiggins said in his last week report. I think the B3 soap is the one used for doing laundry. It really is an improvement, compared to last week's soaps. Underscore. Once everyone sat down, Chief Wiggins continued his presentation. As he spoke. The supervisors got all the bowls of water and threw them outside the windows. They also gathered up all the soap bars and cleaned the tables with rags. Chief Wiggins spoke about the overall success rate within his industry, as well as the few issues and problems encountered within the manufacturing processes. Later on, the supervisors spoke about the issues all the workers faced at work. At the end of their presentation, everyone rose up and clapped for them. Brilliant. Dot. They had really tried their best compared to last week. Those from the alchemy industry all blushed and smiled, as they saw the positive response from everyone. And to top it off, His Highness rose up too. Last week, His Highness didn't rise up but still clapped for them. This week, they saw him standing, smiling, clapping and even nodding several times to them. All their hard work had paid off. Now it was time for the construction industry to take over the presentation. Everything all the products were same compared to last week, except the new, tables, porcelain plates, marble cups, pens, pencils, plastic rulers, and paper. Wow! I didn't know that paper could be colored blue. Overseer Tim really outdid himself this time. Check out this pen. The ones before had clear casings, but this one has a grayish casing and looks very cool. Look, when I press on the top, the pen head shoots out at the bottom. This is the best invention so far. Poo yi. Dot. What do you know? Can't you see that slick glass table over the dot? The table legs are made out of wood. Dot dot, but the top part is made of glass glass. Dot. 
Do you think that a pen can compare to that? I agree. The table is the best. I can't wait for these products to be sold in the stores. They won't be sold now. His Highness said that once house construction start, then they would be sold. So for now, they can only be stored in big warehouses. But did you see that porcelain plate? It's so artistic and funny. It says, go away, opening hours are closed, ha ha ha, I need that plate in my life, that should be my new slogan, every time someone wants to talk to me when a meeting, he'll just tell them, go away, opening hours are closed, underscore. The construction industry rounded up and it was finally time for the food industry to shine.